Hi, my name's Uncompetitive, and this video is called Uncompetitive Reacts to Eric Weinstein's 2013 Geometric Unity Lecture and 2021 Draft Paper. And this is a continuation of the earlier stream that I was doing today that got interrupted when my computer overheated. So I'm hoping it doesn't happen again. And if it does, I will try and get back in to continue the stream as soon as I can. But as it was before, I took the opportunity to go and have a nap. And so um, I should be fresh now to do a longer stream than I did before and hopefully cover the whole of the material and not need to have any further videos, assuming all the technology holds up. So um, it's taking a long time to get to um, the meat of the lecture because the um, beginning part of the lecture is kind of deals with this thing where he is talking about Ed Witten's summary of physics. And it has a three point summary of physics. And then he says, um, you know, he, he puts it in his own uh, terminology. So um, Ed Witten uses the same notation as Albert Einstein. And it describes the pseudo Riemannian manifold as M. And that's what Einstein used. So M for a manifold. And um, Eric uses X. So, uh, hello, Johnny Reddy. I'm going to try and uh, um, pay a bit more attention to the chat. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to uh, share the screen and get on with this rather than get into a long um, introduction because I should have had that introduction at the beginning of the stream. So, um, so we put that there. Take that down there. Keep an eye on the time. And then we're into this. So we need to have the, uh, right, this is, we want to have the lecture um, Interesting. We need to have the lecture from the point of where we were with the lecture. Um, so he had a this, right? That was the the thing from physics and geometry. This link leads to the paper, which I found very helpful. And somewhere in here is the same section. Unfortunately, when the uh, pages that uh, restart uh, it does remember where, where the, what windows you had open but it doesn't remember where you were in each document it doesn't remember the scroll position so um, if I'm to find the same thing again um, the summary I think it was after a page where, where the photocopy scan had been um kind of warped if I recall correctly um so let's see where is it so this is where this whole paragraph comes from that is referred to in the lecture and in his paper so he seems quite taken with it I can't do a text search to find it because this is a image. So it's just down to scrolling through this and looking. Uh, There, page 20. I need to know that. I should have made a note of that. So page 20 of Witten, Physics and Geometry 
It's the same thing. Um, if one wants to summarize our knowledge of physics in the briefest possible terms, there are three really fundamental observations. So we put that over there, and then we go to this, and we're going to go to... Uh, so we're going to scroll up. We're going to scroll up from here to this. So um, that's quite big there. So we're going to make that bigger and have that on the right hand side. Have this over on the uh, left hand side. Then I'm going to be able to have that be bigger. So earlier in this, he does say what he means by this. And I found that was a help. So, um, so we go. Um, don't quite know what it says 280 there because it's not 280 here. Um, so we could make that smaller. We could make that smaller. So that's roughly the same thing there, yeah. Can make this bigger, make that scroll that big, no, too big. Right, so you can do that and then you can do that. So so his lecture starts off by talking about Witten synopsis and he starts changing all of the notation. So he um, um, Witten uses M for the pseudo Romanian manifold. And that's a geometry that underlies general relativity. The geometry of Bernhard Riemann, which underlies general relativity. And Eric talks about this as being the arena. That is where things take place, is a um, pseudo Romanian manifold. And he says in the summary it is space time so that means it's a bit more to it than that that means it's going to have a lorentzian um, metric a lorentzian one comma three um, metric tensor for space time so there's quite a lot there uh, um, and it is okay and then in contrast Eric uses X okay although he writes it in a kind of script form so he might actually be using the um, Greek letter chai uh, it's unclear because he doesn't actually refer to it well, it doesn't look like it might be chai. Um, it's unclear. Um, later, he uses X. So um, it's his preferred um, notation. Then um, over M is a vector bundle. Um, X with a non abelian gauge group G. So if I draw a picture of that in chat, then it would be X um, to have that at the G, X over M. Right, so that would be, um, so you've got X above um, M there and there would be a, a g that would be characterizing the x 
and that would be point number two and he doesn't call his vector bundle x um he calls his vector bundle p um so um So he calls his principal fiber bundle um, P. Um, and and that also has a group and in his writings um eric calls the group h but says that there is a problem with this as it is also uh, as um he is also using H to refer to a horizontal uh, vector space. So, inside of the fiber bundle, um, there is a, it, inside of his um, fiber bundle um, P, there is a, structure uh, which is called the chimeric fiber bundle now strictly how does this work out well the the, the principal fiber bundle p um, is the double cover of the frame bundle of the chimeric fiber bundle which comprises a vertical vector space V and a horizontal vector space H hinged up to meld with it. And um, H um, connects through a uh, levy civita uh, connection in an unconventional reverse downward direction uh, into um, his surface X um, to recover space time by imposing a Lorentzian um, one three metric on it, and by and 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 therefore uh, starting time, right? So is so in summary, um, Eric has a has a group. H, uh, which I have renamed G uh, to avoid confusion. Okay, and that is part of a chimeric fiber bundle C. 
which is um, further elaborated inside of a principal fiber bundle P which describes topological uh, can't like that which describes topological um, Dirac spinners um, and we're going to say Dirac we're going to have U128 double strut C Dirac spinners so let's see we're going to have to get the that symbol from here the set of direct spinners and that which describes um, topological direct spinners um, um, which are then decomposed into U 64 64 while spinners in the final model and uh, so there's like all of this so uh, this can be thought of as mathematics which is rarefied into physics uh, when it uh, goes through the Levy Civita connection to provide um, X, we'll say it's X4 uh, because he starts to talk about X4 before too long. Um, Divide the abstract mathematical um, pseudo Riemannian manifold uh, X4, which um, um, with a metric making it into x one three space time which can describe through um, its to form through the deformations of its geometry, uh, non-Euclidean geometry, um, in which um, angles are not all at 90 degrees um, that's not very good is it what's in there um, so uh, making it into uh, space time and then um, we want to have an idea of what that space time looks like um, We want to have click on this click on uh, that so we have that space time so that is what we end up with and we end up with not only um, this angle here sort of being 90 degrees in the cube 
but then as it gets towards the mass, it ends up being more warped. So you can see here, that's um, more splayed there. And that other, other ones are more, uh, that angle there uh, is more squished. So uh, I would regard this as being squished space time. Uh, uh, where the presence of mass or, uh, or energy um, makes this into squished space time. Okay. And that also means uh, where the time in deep uh, space um, is slowed uh, by the proximity to uh, celestial masses. So out here at the outside here, you see that that clock's going around fairly quickly. And then if you go right into the um, center, we look at this one here, there's a clock there and it's going around quite slow. That one's going around quite slow. So the closer you are to a massive object, the slower time goes. And that means that time on the Earth, on the surface of the Earth, will be going slower than it is, at, say, in the International Space Station. So they are aging as quickly as us. Um, but it is exaggerated in this diagram. So um, this um, is a negligible effect that you wouldn't really even notice. Okay? So there's that. So what page is that on? Um, don't on a different page, probably. Um, oh, I can't put it. Uh, put it. There. Okay. And we'll, what else is on that page? Something must be on that page. Why would it let me? It's so bad at letting me pick things. Um, the number of things that you have that are, um, that's completely inappropriate for that page. I so it's been. Um, we want to have something to do with general relativity locked up. So let's see, what do we have? Um, We'll have um, uh, um, I think we'll have pseudo Romanian manifold. Um, Right, in differential geometry, a pseudo Romanian manifold, also called a semi Romanian manifold, and we'll notice that he does use the term semi because he, I think semi is used by mathematicians and pseudo is used by um, physicists. 
Well, I could have that around the wrong one, but they'll happen a fair amount where he'll use um, terminology from mathematics, which is unfamiliar to a physicist. Um, is a differential manifold uh, with a metric tensor that is everywhere non-degenerate. And um, special case used in general relativity, here we go, is a Lorentzian manifold from modeling space-time, where tangent vectors can be classified as time-like, null, and space-like. So um, if we look at that, um, can we find a Lorentzian manifold? It hasn't got a link for it. Um, file, new tab. Um, it only goes back to that. It's on here though. Um, they've got a PDF on this. They've got um, Stack Exchange. Um, I don't find the stuff, the resources on Wolf and Math well, all that useful. Um, so semi manual manifold said to be Lorentzian if the dimensions of it are greater than or equal to two. Well, this would be four, so that's okay. And the index uh, associated with the metric tensor satisfies uh, one. I don't know what the index is. What is the index? Alternatively, a smooth manifold or dimension uh, is the Lorentzian if it's equipped with the tensor G of metric uh, signature, one comma N minus one. Yeah, okay. So what it says there, the second part of that is what what we're interested in so a lorentzian um uh manifold um is a special case of a pseudo Riemannian manifold because Ryman was just talking about all sorts of things in mathematics that could be curved geometries, right? So if you're going to say, well, I'm looking at one which has got a split signature, uh, I need that split signature to be um, greater than or equal to two, and um, it can be the form. Um, it's, it's of... It says M of N. So that would be the, what Einstein's formulation would be. And we'll go with on desktop 12. I actually have to keep track of what desktop things are on, otherwise I forget. And we need to have the subscripts. And we need to go and pull up N, um, which is here. Look at there, and then we go um, go back to this twelve walls, isn't it? And then we'll put that in the chat here. So put that there, and then M of N um, is Lorentzian if it comes equipped. So M of N. Um, if it comes with tensor G. Um, one comma N minus one. And you can have it be the other way around, in which case you would have space time described by three comma one which is a bit nicer because it's around the right way isn't it um so uh where n is uh ugh, greater than or equal to two so that's the mathematical definition of a lorentzian manifold 
So um, in our situation, uh, we have uh, n is equal to four, and that means means one comma um, four minus one, which is equal one comma three. So that's how we end up with our uh, metric signature. And then we go to this metric signature. That's long complicated um, uh, thing, but because it's a tensor, uh, tensor G, then the tensor G is going to be um, a table. And it's, you know, because it's four dimensions, it's going to be four by four. So um, alternatively, one can view the signature of a metric in terms of matrix signatures. For an n-dimensional differential manifold M, um, the tensor G i j induces an n by n matrix whose uh, entries are given by this formula uh, because of the signatures of the matrices are the same for all. Uh, presumably that's points in M. Um, I think that's points in M. Points in M. Uh, P, 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 P. Yeah, M for points in M, right? So uh, we have that. Oh, I can't even highlight things. That's a bit bad, Wolfram. Where we have, um, he's talking about most commonly one identifies the signature of the metric tensor with the signature of the quadratic form induced by G on any of the tangent spaces, T, P, M for points P element of M. Now, what's that all mean? Well, if you think about a simplified scenario of a universe where it only has one dimension and we're going to not have time, we're just going to have space. We reduce it down to space. Uh, this ring that goes around here where the water meets the inside of the glass will have this be a tangent to that at any given point. And so we only have that to worry about and that will create tangent space. So that will be our tangent space and that will be something that comes up in the, um, mm, comes up in our uh, videos that we've done so far in the series. So I did one here and this is, um, that's actually round, well, that's actually upside down. But if I flip it, you'll see that this is quite a nice um, graphic here of everything. And this is um, uh, over here, you start off with a circle, and this is like a, a line around the equator um, would be like a, an equivalent si situation where you have um, S is algebraic topology and it refers to um, the surface of a sphere, right? So um, S uh, is the, um, I'd have to say S2 is the surface of a sphere. So I'm gonna have to find a two and a one. Oh, give me a moment to find those characters. So where are we? We're on desktop seven. We need to go back to desktop one. We need to have the superscripts. We need to have two and one. Copy those. And then we need to go back to desktop. What was it? Seven? Seven. Can't remember. Um, I think it was this one. Yeah. And then we need to go back to here. And then we are zoomed back in on this. And we have um, just, we're dealing with the case where it is uh, looking at the chat. Um, consider the earth um, as, consider the surface of the earth. as an 
idealized um, uh, smooth um, smooth skin, I suppose, um, which is kind of like the, the, the like the surface of a beach ball, right? So ignore um, Mount Everest, etc. Right? So it, 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 think about Earth and, and the whole thing, um, and the whole thing's smooth, and then you have that and then you go off and that would be uh could then be described in algebraic topology by s It hasn't copied it over for some reason. I'm going to have to copy it again. Desktop 7, desktop 1. Why did it not work? Copy. Desktop 7. Right. That's better. S2. Now, um, if you are on the land uh, at the equator um, and walk um, um, along the equator, um, and here I'm allowing for the sake of this example, for there to be time, uh, which we don't have here, uh, then you are, um, you would be restricting yourself to a uh, line land um, within the context of a kind of flatland so the surface of the earth would be um i mean you obviously you've got height right but let's say we pretend that we don't have the height and we just an ant or something that's walking along the equator then that ant um, is um on a line and the um, surface that it's in. I, I think the whole thing with the equator uh, aspect might be overcomplicating things because it's got a whole lot of baggage attached to it. But the thing is, is that the talking about this stuff um, in the abstract, in, in terms of algebraic topology, gets very kind of detached from reality and hard to kind of care and wrap your head about, right? And so essentially what I'm trying to say is that you're on the equator and you're walking around the equator line and that's equivalent to being um, um, the um, equator would be S1. And the equator is a section of um, the sphere, which is a higher dimensional uh, set of um, lines of um, latitude right so the longitude ones go 
like that from the North Pole to the South Pole and the lines of uh, longitude. Now, lines, that's what I'm talking about. The lines of longitude are the ones that go long from the, from the North Pole to the South Pole and the lines of latitude are the ones that go around like this and then they get to the equator and they start getting smaller and smaller. So, um, and I did write it down correctly there. The equator is a line of latitude. So, um, now that's in the context of the Earth in order to try and kind of make it so you can picture it. Uh, we'll now um, take that intuition and we'll put it into this more formal context. So in a more formal context, uh, we have S1 um, as being a one dimensional um, sphere. Um, and we might say sphere, well, just be qualify that surface of a sphere. Okay, just to make sure we're not confusing it with something that's filled in like a ball, okay? So S1 is a one-dimensional uh, sphere and S2 um, is a two-dimensional uh, sphere and um, you know, in our Earth example, that would have two dimensions. The two dimensionals would be the latitude of S1 and the longitude of S2. Now, you can have more than that. So you can have S of some number, and that's where you end up with things like uh, the hot vibration. So S of N gets you the hot vibration and um, I'm not quite sure how many um, dimensions are in the hot vibration, but um, we'll, we'll get to the hot vibration in a minute. Um, there isn't actually the thing that Eric ends up using in his theory, and he has used it and referred to it, and it's ended up on thumbnails in people's videos like the Let's Friedman video and Dr. Brian Keating's video. It's kind of like geometric unity, and this is kind of like the mascot, and it's not quite correct to do that because um, Heinz Hopf came up with this in like the 1950s or something, and it is just a straightforward um, extension to a higher dimension of this um, thing. So it's a hypersphere. Right, so um, I think we could probably write it down. Uh, if we, what we could do is we could go uh, hot vibration into Wikipedia and we can go hot vibration, and there so we've got this sort of thing here as being the thing that you might have noticed from um, um, geometric unity and. You know, other, other other things like that. It's all these kind of lots of circles together. They're all kind of they're all separate from each other, and they're all kind of trying to pack themselves into this certain space. And um, we go to um, hot vibration in this, and. Um, in mathematical field differential topology, the Hopf vibration, also known as the Hopf bundle, right? Don't bear in mind the word bundle, um, describes a three sphere, a hypersphere in four dimensional space. Um, okay, it's a three sphere at S3, C.
I think so. Um, um, it oh, it was discovered by Heinz Hopf in 1931. Okay. Um, so, uh, hypersphere in four dimensional space, it, in terms of circles and an ordinary sphere. Discovered by Heinz Hopf in 1931, it is an influential and early example of a fiber bundle. <clears throat> Technically, Hopp found a many-to-one continuous function or map from the three-sphere onto the two-sphere, where the two-sphere is just a regular sphere, like what we've been discussing, like the Earth, uh, such that each distinct point of the two-sphere is mapped from a distinct great circle of the three-sphere. Hmm. I can't work it out in my head. I'm trying to imagine it in a lower dimensional form, and I'm not sure that there is a, an analogy. I was thinking, what would it be for it to be on our uh, one sphere to go with the great circle from the two, two sphere? Because you're going to have great circle on the Earth, and um, maybe the great circle on the Earth could be... Um, it is the circular intersection of a sphere and a plane passing through the sphere's center point. So what you see there, it's, um, I could open that up. So we've got that. Um, great circle routes are kind of like, you know, you're flying in a plane and it's like, well, it would be actually easier if we just, you know, we want to go from here to here. If you're going, you know, from, I don't know, Las Vegas to Moscow, we're going to fly over the North Pole or something. And um, it's going to be shorter um, because uh, America uh, almost touches, um, Alaska almost touches Kamchatka. And so if you're in the middle of America and you want to get to the middle of Russia on the opposite side of the globe, rather than flying that way around you could fly that way around over the pole i don't know that anyone does that though because if you have a mechanical fault with your plane you're going to end up um crashing uh, in the arctic and it's going to be really bad for everyone so i think although you could do it i think people don't do it for that reason and there isn't sort of Oh, well, they don't do it because that's where the edge of the Earth is because the Earth's flat, right? The Earth isn't flat. So um, this is um, the Great Circle G, which is going through here. And I th think the other dotted line is, um, is that the equator? Well, it's not talking about the equator. It's not talking about Earth, is it? Um perpendicular line is through the, called the axis uh, the poles of G 
lies in the plane through the sphere centered O, yes, a perpendicular line A in purple. Right, there's a perpendicular line to the great circle. So the great circle could go any way around the sphere. You'd have the sphere and it wouldn't be like the great circle could be a great circle around the equator, or it could be from pole to pole, or it could be going around this way as it seems to be in that diagram. Um, any great circle S blue through the poles uh, is secondary to G. Um, okay. I'm not sure that I fully understand all that. Uh, let's see what they're saying with the text. Um, in mathematics, a great circle is a circular intersection of a, of a sphere and a plane passing through the sphere's center point. Okay. Any arc of a great circle is a geodesic. Now, interesting that we get to the word geodesic at this point. So geometry is the study of things to do with the Earth, geo, and so, um, yeah. So that's interesting with come across geodesic this early because it was going to happen and here we are talking about the Riemannian manifold in this in this text right so there are things happening with this um the term also has a meaning in any differential manifold with a connection well, so we'll get to that later and we'll go back to the great circle and see what this has to say. Um, any arc of the great circle is a geodesic of that sphere so that any arc, okay, an arc is a circular, arc of the circle between a pair of distinct points is the two points are not directly opposite each other. One of these arcs, the minor arc, right, Subtends an angle at the center of the circle is less than pi radians. Hmm. And the other, the major arc, subtends an angle that's greater. That's right there. Okay, so it's like pieces of a pie that you're cutting up for, you know, to serve a family dinner or something. So that great circles in spherical geometry are the natural analog of straight lines in Euclidean space. Oh, right. I see. So Euclidean space is this thing where you have um, a point in three-dimensional coordinate space, which is probably people are used to from like playing video games and stuff. Uh, all the things in most video games will be in this kind of coordinate system where you'll have characters running around in Call of Duty and the space will be uh, similar to the space that we deal with um, in ordinary life where you could sort of say here's a situation we can imagine this you know uh, city as take it out of the world which is of course spherical take it out of the world and all we're interested in is a a box and we put it into a box world of box coordinates where we don't think about the fact it's actually on a sphere okay and one of the things that I'm going to be doing with my video game is I'm going to be making it so that it's actually um, on a globe, right? So that's going to complicate the geometry because it's actually going to be uh, uh, spherical geometry and you're going to be able to head off in a given direction and actually go east and end up coming in back from the west because you're going to be able to go wrap around the globe and that's because it's a, a, in a sense, part of it is a war game where you can go on planets and you can conquer planets and you go, um, I want to be able to be able to land anywhere um, when I'm starting my conquest and then work my way towards, you know, where the um, colonized pe colony is and then attack them from an unexpected direction and for that to work you have to have um, spherical geometry 
Um, so it's a bit like the Phantom Menace in Star Wars, where the uh, Nemoidians uh, at, at the beginning of the Trade Federation, they decide to attack Naboo, where Natalie Portman is uh, hanging out, and they land um, off in, off in the um, kind of, I suppose it's sort of um, jungle or something, and they, uh, well, for it's forest, isn't it? And they, they end up kind of landing there, and they're on their way to uh, the city of Feed, and then uh, Liam Neeson and Ewan McGregor decide it'd be quicker to cut through the um, top surface of the um, um, mantle of the planet, which has got lots of uh, water in it. I don't think they go through the centre of the planet. I think they just cut through the um, the top surface. So it's like it's like here. Um, as if they were, as if the, um, as if they, the Nemoidians landed here uh, and then they uh, stowaways and they get out of their ship undetected by the other droids and then they think feed is, uh, you know, the other side here and they think, right, we're going to have to try and cut them off by taking a boat and then go through here to here and along the way they meet the is that right along the way they meet the guy from the king of the gungans or something and um try and get support from him and say look you know it might not matter to you what happens on the surface um but you should think about you know the planet surface about to be occupied by uh these uh, robots and we could really do with your support to kick them off, off the planet and so by the end of the film the amphibians that live under the surface of the planet in the in the watery caverns come out and they have a battle uh on on the plain um uh, somewhere uh, distant from the city of feed which has been captured by the droids right so that's what happens in a um spherical geometry sense of um um you know what's happening with that star wars film episode one so i'm going to read the comments now um meso cosmos better answers related to the technical details of geometric unity since it's not resting only on the basic knowledge base that instead can is this a second question? No? Okay. Better answers related to the technical details of geometric unity, since it's not resting on the basic knowledge basis, but instead can search details from the given material. I have a question. Uh -huh. Please do stream about geometric unity topic in future too. There's been helpful on studying the theory along slow research pace. Refreshing exception from the information for quick videos available. Well, some of those are quite good. Um, um, there's one that's okay, but the guy has no pictures. It's completely black, and you can hear the battery in his smoke detector warning him that it needs replacing. So it's going meh like that all the way through the recording. And you think, you'd think that you'd notice that, and you'd just say, have a do-over and have a crack at um, doing it again. The other one that I think is quite good is, um, let's see, Geometric Unity. Right? Is that right? Okay. This one, probably get in trouble for playing it, but anyway, whatever. Uh, this, um, I think, is really good, and the lyrics are like, how does this guy know to make these lyrics? Because it's like this person knows something about physics. So it's a bit of a shame they're not making a video like, you know, explaining a video, but they're just making um, a rap song. So we're going to go to this, and we're going to go... So we might have some captions on this and we'll have this bigger 
have it full screen, cinema mode, um, full screen. And so. There has not been any substantive discussion about uh, geometric unity. I think that's because no one has any idea what you're talking about in the first place. But if you don't understand what people find hard uh, to grasp about your uh, ideas, maybe you should get a little bit more feedback about uh, just exactly why it's incomprehensible. Um, reflections from Escher's hand with connections for metrics to sketch Escher's hand. Explore. Symmetric tensors that wire like hexachords buckle up, set the course. Six angles to rotate, four rulers to locate. Yeah, that's okay. X4, 14 equals gold chase away. Got metrics like a ton of bricks. Fix GPS to black chimeric mothership. Hi, man. Fill the sections on Y. Sections. Yes. Yeah. Choose another metric, let gravity decide. Project, watch the galaxies collide. There we are. Yep. So that's a hot vibration on Joe Rogan. Nice, nice cuts from the paper. Yeah, Patty Salam, yeah. Yang Mills, uh, killing, killing, uh, uh, there's William killing, and perfect algebra, yeah. But it didn't come out of the blue, let's walk a mile on the other shoe. Other shoe is kind of like chimerality, yeah, chimerality of the left, of the left foot and the right foot. He says that in the lecture, Magic Bean Deal. Okay, well, I mean, it's, it's educational. Right, so um, I have already liked that video. Um, uh, finally, something that makes sense. Uh, uh, finally, something that makes sense. Esoteric rap is my new favorite genre. Uh, your lyrics would suggest that you actually have some understanding of the math. That's the hope. Glad you enjoyed. Tell your friends. Um, this person did not think it helped uh, as a cute presentation of some complicated issue. Oh, Killjoy. I find it a cute way of pointing out that one sign is stop whining about he's not being taken seriously and instead actually start producing something himself. Uh, yeah, he has. It's uh, called a, a 69 page paper. Um, right, so this is um, going to end up in the chat and this is Geometric Unity Unity, uh, a, a field guide uh, for uh, rappers and physicists by the terminalia. So you can 
listen to that at your leisure and see uh, what you can pick out from it from from that and there's a bit in it where he has this so that is the um this diagram where it's like saying okay what's going on with this you've got patty salon um and it's, he's basically saying it's a, it cuts off um spin seven seven off the edge here but um this is the um observers and he has that in terms of spin groups and the has a horizontal and vertical vector space that are characterized by the spin groups and they are put together and you get spin seven seven and you would add that up and you basically have um one three plus six four you add up the things uh, and to get seven seven, right? So that would mean, um, i.e., um, one plus um, six, comma three plus four. Like that's how you get to the seven seven, okay? And um, it, that thing there is the include symbol right so that means that all of this here is included within this so you can see how spin one three is included within that and that means that this breaks apart into spin six and spin four which is inside of this and then that has again turned on its side it's actually turned that way but we have the symbol for the um what's that is saying is that has the same form as the thing above and that's his assertion at least and this is what is called the symbol for the isomorphism so that's an isomorphism and um, which is means same form and that's a, also um, this is a term from algebraic topology so still on algebraic topology and uh, then under that, he's saying that we have this group here um, that is SU4 cross SU2 cross SU2, and it says that's Patti Salam. Now, strictly speaking, that Patti Salam is um, a bit more complicated than that um, because it is... Um, it actually it looks like this and we go and hold on we go there so it's su4 cross su2 l cross su2 r right and so when i write about it in my comments and stuff i say i say that okay so i think if i'm on page seven go back to this and I go back to this, and I go back to the diagram here, and I bring this out. Um, this would be where we have um, that Patis alarm. So this here is Patis alarm with the left and the right annotating the uh, things, and then you'll see that symbol there um that joining those two things and that is the same one we were looking at so i that symbol a bit hard to see really but that is the uh symbol for an isomorphism and that's what he's saying is going on there he's saying that um i mean i skipped over the steps but um i mean strictly speaking spin six four um is not isomorphic with that it's actually spin six cross spin four is is isomorphic with that so i suppose i should change that i should say uh spin there and now everything's no longer aligned so um we'll try and reconstruct this i hadn't noticed that that was actually wrong uh, so that's that's not too bad though 
So we'll do that. And we'll do that. We'll put that there like that. So that is um so yeah um so that is that's more correct now because that's actually he's making a isomorphism between spin six cross spin four not between spin six comma four which he says is something that includes spin six spin four and so I don't want to speak out of turn and make out that it um, includes that. And we'll go to where this is in the paper. And um, I'm not sure where it is in the paper, actually. Let's have a look. I might not have got the tab. I don't think I've got the tab. So it's going to be a question of finding it. So, right, we're going to have to add a new tab. And that's going to be geometric unity. And then we're going to go, where is it in the document? It'll be around about um, here. That's how many times I've read this. I can click in the scroll bar and go straight to it. No fucking way. Yes, fucking way. So that is um, the same thing that was in the rap video. And uh, we can turn it on its side to see the relationships a bit better. So uh, what we do is because the isomorphism is that way around, we'll change that. So I will do a screen grab of that and annotate it. And we will, um, can I annotate it? I will have to do a um, crop of this image and then I'll have to um, take that and probably put this um, like that. I don't know whether to include this section. I think I'm not going to. Um, and we won't have the top part either. And We won't have this part. We'll crop that in a bit more. So we can then treat this as like a kind of, almost like a poster. And then we do that, we'll do that, save it. And then when we bring it in, we're gonna be annotating it. So the easiest thing to do is to do this where we go into the documents and we bring it out of the documents we've got as the most recent thing and then we take that and we'll have that on screen and we'll make that big and then we'll zoom in on it well first we'll flip it like that and that's now the right way around because if you notice that has the um isomorphism um, like that, which is the correct way up for the symbol. So um, we need to have the whole thing on screen. We're going to make our image. We probably don't need the observer stuff that's over here because I think that the important part of the diagrams on that side. So what I'll do is I will um, do the screen grab from that part what i could do is i can do a selection here of this and then i could do crop and then that's like that which is okay and then we can zoom in on that a bit uh, that's a bit too much 
um because i want to have a bit of a border and so we're gonna now do a screen grab on that and hopefully the ipad's gonna like that and it does and so where we need to make a change is we need black and we need to annotate something we need that to be not that thick uh, Right, first of all, we need this to be white. Okay. Okay. We'll get rid of that bucket completely. That's all right. Now, we want this to say that to say, and then we have We've got a better bracket than that, hold on. That's too angular. I could probably go thinner. We go thinner for the bracket. That seems to be a bit close. And then this will need to shape up at the end here, like this. And then we'll get the white again. And then it's easier to just change this end a bit make it look a bit similar and made it a bit of a shorter brace there there's a visual clutter of everything that's in the area so that's sort of okay so we're going to work with that and so if i was to rotate that now uh well it won't let me but if i was to crop that i should be able to crop that and have a border And so I'm going to have it be this way around, and I'm going to have it be, uh, well, if I wanted this to be a thumbnail, actually, it would be better off if it was thumbnail proportions. So we will have kind of thumbnail, thumbnail y size image. Uh, what would it be a thumbnail size? It would be, ooh, it would be further out this way, wouldn't it? It would be, I'm not sure. Um, when you make a thumbnail, it's probably better to go broader than, than it is. And then it will fit it within the image. I felt as if that might be okay. Um, so, so that's the isomorphism there. And that's now... Um, how things are and the set uh, things you can have it be both ways so interestingly if you invert uh, an image that contains a um, subset relationship um, then if this standard model is over on the left and the things inverted then the thing will be shaped sort of like that and it will be saying everything over here is uh, it is um 
that that stuff is um it is a subset of that stuff and so um it's a bit like the element sign the yeah, element sign that looks like an e um it's a sort of similar shape to that but it's missing the bar of the e so that's how you remember that's the subset off sign this is facing the other direction so that means that the stuff that's on the right of the um, picture is going to be um, the uh, subset of the stuff that is on the left of the picture or when it was in the document above it and so um, the standard model is a chiral theory, which has a, um, within the SU2 group, there are um, a difference in terms of the um, emissions from, um, if you can have a radioactive decay, then there'll be 60% of the particles will come out of the experiment at a different direction to the uh, other uh, particles uh, and you'd expect it to be 50 50 you know because things usually are symmetrical and this um, breaks p symmetry which is parity symmetry and that is uh, the ex expectation that things would operate the same even if you're in a mirror universe so if you were to have um if you were to have, say, uh, six of something here um, and four of something here, then in a mirror universe where that's now that way around, then you'd expect it to be... Um, now, hold on a minute, that's wrong, isn't it? You'd, you'd expect something to be that if something is... Um, you'd expect something to be the same both ways. And so it would be um, that way round. I can't do it. I, I, it's it's it, it, you're expecting it to be 50-50, whether it's that way round or the mirror image, and um, it's not 50-50 when it's reflected. If you take the apparatus of the experiment and you turn it upside down, um, stuff that is coming out of it isn't coming out the same both ways. You're collecting as many, you're detecting as many particles. You're not detecting as many particles both ways around that you do it. So if you flip things to their mirror image, um, it's like it, it, it's like there is a, a, a trait that a start again. Why is this so hard to describe? Quantum field theory is based on the work of Everest Galois. And Everest Galois is um, this character. Uh, just crop that, we move back to Everest Galois. Everest Galois is Is he even here? I don't think I've got him open. Maybe he's on a different page. Um, nope. This one, there. Everest Galois here is, why is that up like that, on top of that? Can't I close it? Right, okay. Um, Everest Galois, there we go. So Everest Galois, um, he um, um, thought of the idea of groups which are sets with operations. And he thought of it the night before he uh, had caught himself into a stupid situation where he had to fight a duel. And um, he stayed up all night, um, the night before the duel, writing it down because he thought, well, I might die. So this idea will be lost if I don't write it down. And he did die in the duel and um, he died at the age of 20. So um, this um, mathematics was extraordinarily advanced at the time and 
barely anyone could make sense of it. And eventually, uh, people did make sense of what he was doing. And this led to quantum field theory. So this is the most important person in mathematics in regards to quantum field theory. And then I suppose Bernard Riemann would be the most important person in mathematics in terms of um, the um, general relativity. You can't really do general relativity without that. So if we try and find a picture of Bernard Riemann, I think I've got him somewhere. Um, Bernard Riemann, where are you? I know he's around here somewhere. There, okay. So Bernard Riemann from 1863. So he gets a little bit longer. And he did all of this work with <clears throat> curved surfaces, okay? And without this, you know, Riemannian manifolds and stuff, we'd be a bit stuffed, right? So you'll see here, it says differential geometry, and then you'll see that it has, like, hover over that, and you'll get kind of a saddle-shaped space with a um, non-Euclidean um, um, triangle in it where the angles don't add up to um, 180 degrees uh, because the space is um, distorted. And so it, the mathematics of this can cope with um, smooth uh, surfaces and uh, these are called um, smooth manifolds. And it uses calculus, which is, of course was um, invented by Sir Isaac Newton. But, I mean, you can credit everything to Isaac Newton and say he's the person who kind of like really, you know, set the groundwork for modern physics. Uh, but if you're going to say more than just him and say he's credits for mathematics in Principia Mathematica, uh, he makes telescopes work better by making it so they use reflecting mirrors. He does... Uh, the unification of all colours, that would be red, orange, yellow, green, uh, you know, all of that, into uh, white using prisms. He uh, looks at the moon and he thinks, well, that's going to be governed by the same uh, laws of physics as an apple that's falling to the earth. And then he comes up with simple um, mathematical law that describes that which is so good, it was used by NASA to put man on the moon. Um, and he does all this in a year where he is in quarantine from the pandemic uh, that was happening at the time. So he was a student, I think, at Cambridge. He might have been a student at Cambridge, and I'm not sure, but they said that they sent him home um, uh, because of the plague, the bubonic plague which was really very, very serious indeed. And um, over the course of it being a thing, it killed off 30% uh, of the population of Europe. Okay, so COVID hasn't even killed 1%. So just kind of give a, kind of bear you in mind what it must have been like to live back then when one in three people were dying from the bubonic plague. It must have been so frightening. Um, but you see, we live in a media world, and so they make everyone super scared of everything. Um, so, and now they're talking about having a war with Russia in this country and conscription, and it's just like we just got out of a plague, you know, we just got out of a pandemic. Maybe it wasn't an epidemic, but it was. It was like you pretended like it was the end of the world. And now you try to end the world and it could be nuclear weapons. And I'm just thinking, oh, did, blah. so um, that guy is uh, important in the role of the um, general relativity, yeah, general relativity. And um, you've got um, the other guy on this page who is Hitmonkey. 
Charles Esman, who has um, is on the right hand side of this picture here, and that is him. Um, um, again, algebraic topologist, and then they go off, and that he's the one who works on fiber bundles again. So that word's coming up again, and um, again, this is differential topology, and um, also category theory. And we see a bit of this in the lecture. Um, Eric will do a bit of category theory, I think, at one point. I think I recall him doing that. He certainly does it in the... Um, he has category theory in his uh, paper. Let's see if we can find some, because I think there is some in this paper. Um, let's have a look. So we have a look at that. We'll go to the beginning. We'll scroll through it. Uh, where's the category theory? Is there any? Well, I'm, I'm misremembering things. Uh, these are all arrows, all kind of maps. Uh, that's not the same. I don't think these are categories. Um, I mean, they might be. This could be a, a, a category with the arrows and everything, but I'm not sure that it is, because I think a category would have an annotation on the arrow that would be saying what's happening in terms of the function spaces of, of it. So that would be different. So has he got anything that's, um, so this isn't a category, because these, unless these are just, I mean, this is a Clifford algebra, so I don't think that's a category. Um, That's where we were, keep going. Um, I'm looking for something that's got annotations on the arrows. Um, ah, well, there's this. Um, but I think that's just a projection. So I don't know that that would be, it says it's a projection map. Is this a category? Uh, I don't know that it is really. Equation 6.12. Um, I'm not, because I'm thinking about Haskell, uh, the programming language, and that is all uh, keen on categories. Now, what's this say? Uh, definition 6.6. .6. The map um, will be called the biconnection map in what follows if we use the natural action of H of uh, what's that? Script T A naught uh, to form an associated bundle of affine spaces with the total space T. Is this T the same T that he uses? within the sort of thing that he has where he says it's displaced torsion. It's the uh, the swerveture equals the displacement. So let's have a look. Where's he to find this? Where's he to find that T-shaped thing? He has T and then he has, it looks similar orthography wise. Um, Nitral right action. Tilted transformations rule. The H vibration, um, I don't think that's a hot vibration. You might think it is, but he doesn't say explicitly that it is. And I think the fact that it's all defined to be in terms of the chimeric fiber bundle and that's got much more um you know to it that that would mean it's not the same thing um so 
So I'm looking to see whether he defines what he means by T. Um, T naught is that. If we act on the space of connections using the natural right action of the inner homogeneous gauge group G, which he refers to in the lecture as the Iggy, we may ask what the stabilizer subgroup is for the levy civitas sit spin connection a a naught. Okay, so he's trying to define spinners presumably on X uh, through a naught, um, and that's the connection back from the geometry of the fiber bundle. To this end, solving for G as an element of the uh, sort of the gauge group. Uh, stabilizing angle. I don't know what he means by stabilizing. Um, we get that. And implying that. Well, he's using a archaic form of omega there. And this is actually a shear operator. Um, in terms of the notation, because he'll do that and he'll do epsilon of something and then he'll do the um, uh, reverse of the epsilon in order to get it back out. So is he saying that that's the unified field is equal to the, what, the differential of the... Is he saying it's a slope at the point of the connection as it's been taken through the... Um, that is he saying that the content of what's inside of the bottle of the space of connections rather than what had been under Einstein's space of metrics is um, the stuff where he takes... I mean, it's kind of like what happens with Yang Mills, where the Yang Mills is kind of looks a bit like this uh, in terms of, um, I think Yang Mills is kind of D of A or something. In the lecture, uh, let's see the lecture, lecture, lecture. We go D of A there, which is when you're dealing with this, is that similar? I don't know. Um, this thing with J here, I was looking at that and I found a video that I was trying to find the other time I was doing the stream and I, I went through three videos and not, none of them got anywhere. And, um, the one I was looking for was actually episode 10. So I found that between here and the last time I was up. So I was looking at... Uh, what is it? Uh, this, right? And this was the video. So I had looked through all of these, and none of them were the right ones, right? While I was streaming, and it was actually episode 10. So this is a really long set of videos, and some of them like 40 minutes, and scrubbing through them all when they're not the right one is not very helpful for a stream. This is our, and so this one is the one that's of importance because um, it talks about um, how to construct things and there is another notation for things and then you can go, um, this will be the Lorentz group um, and then um, he's talking about this and it's all kind of like, I don't know what the significance of any of this is and you're watching it and you're kind of tuning out and then it hits you at the end what's happening and so he goes and does this stuff about Clifford algebras so watch that tiny bit at the end there and uh, hopefully this all this spin with it's being split is kind of like spin six four okay and um because if these two if it was spin pp you couldn't have them couldn't have six four because it would need to be two different numbers algebraically. So P and Q allow it to have two natural number valued things for your spin group that split. 
and in the book um, Spinners and Calibrations, uh, there's stuff on the Clifford Algebra, um, and it's like hardly any pages at all, and it will be for the complex Clifford Algebras here, and it will be say what happens when you're dealing with uh, complex Clifford Algebras that are then divided up into um, uh, uh, two um, two parts. So there's um, it might have been the previous part of the book. Hold on, the previous part of the book around 191. There is that as well. Yes, it's here. It's on page 191. So if we look at that page there, um, that bit there is saying complex uh, Clifford algebra CL and subscript C of N is equal to CL R comma S a vector product with the reals of the complex numbers. So that there, next to the black square, is um, the, the kind of thing that's saying that this uh, thing that Eric's doing um, with splitting things, like this is legitimate um, um, mathematical physics because it's in the book that he refers to. So um, it's all, you know, if, if, it, if it was like bullshit, then it would be bullshit. And I, I mean, I've spent three years looking at this because uh, I have nothing better to do. And I thought, I'm going to stay sceptical that what he's doing mathematically might not be correct. If it, it's quite likely that I'm not in a position to know, okay, because it's so over my head that how am I in a position to criticise? Along comes a certain critic and he goes on off and writes a paper and says, this, this is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong, that wrong. And I read his paper, and it dawns on me that the critic doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. And I'm thinking, wait, wait, wait. I thought that I was the one that was ignorant and hadn't done mathematical physics at university and shouldn't have an opinion on any of this. But I can tell that this guy doesn't understand what the fuck he's talking about. And so I made a video which was my reaction to him and his paper, uh, was 12 hours long, and it exhaustively tears it apart. Okay? And I thought, that's the best thing I can do. I can't make a video on the full video of Eric Weinstein's 2013 talk, because I don't understand what he's doing enough to be able to talk about geometric unity um, beyond the kind of superficial kind of like what a layman would understand. So what a layman would understand would be this, right? This this thing here, where I go off and say, you can get 14 dimensions by saying, take uh, four coordinate axes, then um, they would call them like W, X, Y, and Z, then take the six angles between pairs of those axes. So the angle between X and Y, the angle between Y and Z, the angle between Z and X, and then because you're dealing with a fourth, space, a fourth spatial dimension, you've got to do W as well. So W and X, W and Y, and W and Z. Then you do the four components of a vector within that coordinate space, and that's going to be W, X, Y, and Z. Now, I'm of the inclination, but I could be wrong, that my intuition, as of this week, having only looked into G uh, general relativity this week is to say that um, Einstein was um, making his mathematics around that. So he has 10 dimensions in Einstein field equations and the context of him doing relativity is to have a frame of reference which is implicit to that, which is where things are happening. So he might have a frame of reference here they might have a frame of reference over here and say, like, these are our frames of references. But in a sense of calculating anything to do with curved space time, he's only really considering one and he's going incrementally over a surface 
that's a kind of uh, it's a uh, a squished space time and he's got his um manifold here and he has said right i'm going to need to have uh, some kind of ruler on that to be able to measure that curve so he goes to lorentz and he uses lorentz's uh, 1,3 um, metric and that is imposed on top of this space so the pseudo Riemannian manifold gains the Lorentzian uh, metric which is a tensor which is the metric tensor and that is the basis of him being able to kind of wrangle with the um, the curved I don't really like saying curved but the curved uh, geometry of um, space time because you can sort of see that this is a curve right this is all um, you know that's obviously a curve and you can have it go that way as well so that's fine um, and it's better to have a kind of analogy to um, this where it's a kind of this is like a tape measure of even you know stripes along it to measure from how many stripes along it from one point to another rather than say what eric calls it which is saying you need a ruler for that space because the ruler will not cope very well when it's a space that has got like a you know like that you're going to put your ruler on it like that and it's like well that's hopeless because it's like at a tangent almost when it's flat which is the case of special relativity then you're all right but when it starts to be like that, you're in trouble. So that's where you end up needing to have calculus because you need to have the ruler become shorter and shorter and shorter in order for it to be able to do uh, an approximate um, slope over the surface you're dealing with. And you build up all of these like short rulers that then end up giving you your results. Um, I think in Einstein's theory, it's based around Pythagoras, but it's been generalized. And the generalization of Pythagoras in, ends up giving you this work that's to do with Christoffel. And that is a kind of, got a, a kind of lambda symbol. And I could watch a video on that to cover that for the purpose of this, but essentially we can get to that if we need to about the um general relativity so rather than get bogged down um it's my opinion not really based on full knowledge because i've only been studying it a week that um general relativity is uh 10 dimensional measures that were selected by einstein and he said that's enough for me to be able to describe um, gravity, where gravity isn't a force, but it is um, the shape of space-time that is changing the way that um, the, the um, objects that have momentum are moving through that space, okay? They're all, uh, things are going in a straight line, but the lines aren't really straight anymore, if that, if that makes sense. So, um, um, there's something more to it than that. There might be something to do with frame dragging, um, but if you have a light ray which has no mass, you, you you think, well, okay, that should not be affected by gravity, right? Uh, that would be your intuition. You could think, well, the moon, you know, that's going to be affected by um, gravity of the Earth. You'd be thinking that oh i i didn't realize yes the moon uh, is pulling on the earth as well and the moon is responsible for making the ocean bulge towards it and those that bulging that's caused by the moon and the fact that everything's turning and everything uh causes the tides so that's interesting so you get high tide and low tide as a result of the fact we have a moon I think that's interesting. When I found that out, I thought, I didn't know. No one's ever told me that before. And, um, you know, you go to the seaside and it's like low tide, high tide. You don't think the moon's responsible. Um, you're thinking, that's so far away. That's having an effect on the ocean. Like, oh, my God, really? Okay. So 
um, you have that and you, you're saying, well, he, Einstein, selected this, uh, uh, a set of 10 dimensional measures for his uh, space time. And in a sense, he locked himself out of being able to pursue a hopeful candidate for a theory of everything um, such as a intermediate um, uh, unified field theory, which I, I regard as, as a, a better goal than a theory of everything. I think a theory of everything is too ill-defined and too broad and too big. And I think it's better to say, you know, with geometric unity, what Eric was saying to begin with, that he was had a speculative work in progress that aspired to be a unified field theory that sought to, what did I say in the comment, in the description, I said that it was, um, geometric unity is an incomplete work in progress program, which explores multiple speculative ideas as it, as it aspires to become a unified field theory that seeks to replace general relativity with something less restrictive. So this part here is restrictive. And if you include the frame of reference as well, that's everything you could have, right? That's the unrestricted set of dimensional measures uh, for any uh, manifold um, X4, all right? And um, so I say, um, replace general relativity with something less restrictive, which allows for a more elaborate and symmetric quantum field theory. So it's because you have um, an, an additional uh, four dimensions that you can use those four dimensions in the regular way for uh, handling your um, spin one comma three description that becomes your space time, right? Because we've had that image in the, uh, we've had that image in here where we had this here. That there is our, that then that then becomes space time. So it's on the left hand side of the diagram, and then it becomes the Lorentz group here. And the Lorentz group is inside of this. <clears throat> so that is isomorphic to Patti Salam with the Lorentz group. And then the Lorentz group is uh, what describes general relativity. So that says GR. And so that gets you to the um, Lorentzian manifold, which is the signature um, 1, 3 with the uh, matrix from the uh, um, the matrix from, where is it? I don't think I'll have it here. Is it here? The, the matrix is here, which is the metric signature um, that when you're saying that you create a tangent space of this, so as I had it before, you you can go off and you would have to create a tangent to this where you create a tangent to the manifold itself. And so you take tangents all over it and then that somehow catches it. And I was talking about that as well when it came to me talking about fiber bundles. So there is a kind of relationship between fiber bundles and um, general relativity as well, because it's all dealing with curved surfaces. There's curved surfaces involved in this, and there's curved surfaces involved in the work of Erisman and his geometry, which is also differential topology, which also has fiber bundles. So the two things are not like complete strangers to each other. And um, what gets interesting, and when you start thinking like, there's something to this is when you realize that there is, if you go back to Galois, uh, wherever he is um, here, Galois, he came up with this the idea of this uh, set that was a group um, with operations, okay? And I'll probably show um, algebraic structures known as groups um, and um, we have um, this guy here came along 
Uh, he looks a bit like Bernard Riemann, but it's a different person. And this is because people were into beards back then, so they all end up looking the same. They all have the same small glasses. Very similar time frame as Riemann, actually. And uh, he takes the uh, idea of a differential manifold and he says this would be quite a good thing to add into a, um, um, a group. So he creates a Lie group, okay? And so the Lie group is um, to do with Sophus Lie, um, the as um, differential differential manifolds that is um, a surface uh, where um, slope uh, can be calculated with calculus uh, from Newton, right? And he um, um, what happened to the beginning of the sentence? What happened to the beginning of my sentence? I can't scroll up. I have to put it on another line. Surface lead adds differential manifold. A surface where slope can be calculated with calculus from a Newton to um, Everest Galois um, idea of a set with operations um, that is called a group and it's uh, usually it's called G um, in honor um, of uh, Galois. This one called the G for Galois. And then um, the Lie group, um, not a Lie group, is um, this thing where he's like adding in this thing to add in some geometry. In doing this, um, he benefits from the things that the Galois has, where uh, his groups are um, leading to um, groups, and the groups then <clears throat> lead to um, um, what's the list of things named after him? So these are the things he's had as a um, influence on mathematics. Um, And uh, I suppose we'll go to this, shall we? Um, and so he was working on equations and he used a group to solve, solve his equations that were polynomials. But um, this is, this is, I mean, so many things in mathematics are, are related to each other. And so, um, um, we talk about Abelian groups. I think the best thing to do is, is talk about group theory. I would skip this and go to group theory. So it's going to mention him here. Um, now there's groups, and it'll say a group. Um, there we are, Galwa. Okay, so, okay, so. This is a better way into the topic of groups and it's a not a bad jumping off point as a point of research to get any kind of purchase on what's happening with um, uh, Eric Weinstein's work because it's, 
it's basically everything goes back to groups. Um, I mean, technically, everything in mathematics is based on sets. But everything, okay? You know, addition of two, and two plus two, you can work out that from set theory, okay? So if you had no other toolkit and you had to start over again, if you had to start off with sets, that would be not terrible, right? That's before you even have numbers. Set theory is more primitive than like one, two, and three, okay? The notion of counting is, is below the level of counting. It's that simple. So, um, um, and he also says, well-known uh, algebra stru structures such as fields, which will, um, uh, it is a mathematical field, and then uh, vector spaces, which will um, look like that. And so we have vector spaces in terms of the, uh, the groups that we have in our diagram. Where was it? Well, we'll get, we'll get back to it. The diagram looks as spin one, three, cross, spin six, four. Those are both vector spaces, although they are the, what should I say? They are the spin groups that are for the, the vector spaces that are in the, um, here we go, in this thing where we have the theory. So the theory is this, and we'll have that, the geometric unity diagram, and that's sort of like, it. I'm jumping to the end where it's kind of completed, and he's done the math, and this is like, would be a long way into the lecture, where he comes up with having derived all this, because he starts off just doing mathematical tools and a long introduction and other thing, and he takes a long time to get to the point, and this is essentially where he is in his paper in 2021, where he's talking in terms of um, this here being the um, U6464 as being the, um, you know, so that's right there, that is geometric unity, right? And you have these three spaces, you have X13, which is space time, um, you have Y77, which is the auxiliary um, Erismanian um, manifold, which is uh, grown uh, where 14, um, that 7 plus 7, 14, is the unrestricted set of dimensional measures needed to chart the surface that has four dimensions, which is what you get with 1, 3, that's four dimensional surface. And um, this is the um, breaking out of the Einsteinian prism. So the Einsteinian prism would just have like a, um, what's called a metric, where the metric is um, 10 um, dimensional measures. And he's like saying, no, I want to be able to use the uh, frame of reference as well. And that those axes you know, W, X, Y, and Z, I'm going to include them. So by adding that to the angles between those axes and the component parts of an arrow within that coordinate space, he ends up with 14 things. And that's where the 14 comes from in geometric unity. And then um, he complexifies it and that does a load of math. And then he ends up decomposing uh, U128 double strut C into uh, U6464 because he needs something to be real numbers for it to be able to be quantized. And then he then has um, everything else split. He picks a symmetric um, split for how he has Y. And he talks about in the paper that he could have had it be 5,9 or 9,5. They're also viable alternatives. And I'm pleased that he picked 7,7 because um, if you have 7,7, you don't have to parameterize it and say it has to be this way around. So if you're thinking about like, you know, how much choice does 
you know God had in the design of the universe or an intelligent designer or whatever brought all this into being right if they are in a sense hypothetically restricted in what they can do and you say well let's say we talk about this in terms of like say it's a simulation I'm not saying he's saying it's a simulation but for hypothetically let's imagine for a thought experiment that the universe or a kind of model of the universe let's say it's probably better to say a model of the universe is a simulation so you create a computer program that creates a model universe and you say how much does this model universe look like the one we're in okay so this is basically what physics is right and this is basically what the Stephen Wolfram's doing with the Wolfram's physics project where he's creating these hypothetical synthetic universes on computers and then saying oh look that looks a bit like this part of physics or mathematics and so forth and having fun with it now you could go off and say right i'm going to create a model on my computer that's going to be a description of uh, the universe and it might not be a model that includes um particles right it might just be a geometric model of um certain things you might not get into the weeds of like you know matter and energy and, and dynamic uh thermodynamics and you know navier stokes equations and things like that and chaos and all of that you might just say no no we're not getting into like making it so that it can simulate um uh, things to the point of granularity of being able to have you know base pairs replicating themselves into humans right we're not we're not trying to do that. We're just trying to just say, you know, what's this look like? And how does it broadly compare to what we have? You know, can we recover space time from a fiber bundle that it is immersed in? So that would mean this, uh, you know, one dimensional, uh, you know, thing is within a bigger thing here. And we might say, a point within this space you can only be at one point any one time you are here and you have a tangent to that space that would be running up the glass like that you can imagine lots of these going around the glass and you are happen to be here so it's there that you're sampling from and if you were over here then you'd sample a different part of the whole thing and he talks about this on Joe Rogan he says you know if you're in the stands at a sporting event uh, and then you're looking at the pitch, um, the pitch is where the, the game is taking place and uh, you're in a stadium looking around at the, and you could be on the opposite side of the stadium and you could see things uh, from there that you would not have seen from the other side because uh, you had a better vantage point um, from a different angle in on the action. and certain things that you miss from you know uh, a scrum or something in a medical football will be something you picked or you know it could be a, a basketball he kind of mixes a metaphor and he's talking about the pitch and then, then he's talking about basketball and a free throw and i'm thinking like just stop mixing your metaphors because it isn't a pitch in basketball it's a court right and so in this i've changed the terminology and i've made it be that uh, it is this and i simplified it right the fuck down and i said that um it is um what you have is us in what's equivalent to this right we're at this point and we are the observer but it isn't that we are ourselves like you know we are the observer and we are the eye in the geometric unity diagram that you sometimes see in like in the paper we'll get to what the observer is but the um x13 creates the observer okay we'll, we'll get to what the observer is in a moment and that has the um observation is then taking place 
observation then implies that there will have to be a context for that observation, which is called the observerse, right? As opposed to the universe. The universe sits inside of the observerse. So X13 is different samplings of the observerse from different points in space time, right? In this example, we've only got space and it's one dimensions, and this is going and it's sampling and it's probing the whole of the observers along that white pencil, which is um, a fiber. So if you include everywhere that you could be in this one dimensional uh, S1 space, then this would end up being inside of this two dimensional cylinder where you've got that way around that you can move and you can also move at right angles to it like this. And you construct this by saying, I wanna be at any given point on here, I'll have a tangent. And then I'm gonna say, I want to be at a tangent to that tangent. So you end up turning it like that. And then you can build all of these things around like this. And then these things are then at right angles to reality as far as reality is semantically uh, meaningful to the people that are inhabiting that part of the observerse. And this part can be thought of as a section of the whole thing. So uh, if I wanted to be from some other location within the observerse, Here I am, and I'm now at a different, different level, right? So this is a different set of metrics from where this is, was where well was before, because I've, I've now moved the level down through this space. And so the point on here where this makes contact here is now different, and it's going to be a, a different observation of the whole of this thing along the length of this fiber. And you can't see all fibers at once. That's going to be a different observation. And you can't see a different, you're going to see a different observation at different positions along the fiber. So you've got two ways around you can be that way and around like that, right? Now, what is the observer? Well, the thing is, is the, it is what's doing the observation of the observed. And you say, right, what is the observed? It is the unrestricted set of dimensional measures, which is then created over this. So this will create an unrestricted set of dimensional measures, which will be um, D squared plus 3D divided by two. So let's do the math. That's gonna be a one dimensional space. So that's going to be d squared. So that's going to be 1 squared, which is 1, plus 3 times 1, which is going to be 1. It's going to be 3. We're going to have uh, 1 plus 3 is 4. Divide by 2, it's going to be 2. Yes? So that's going to be this way around and this way up as the two dimensions that you get from that mathematics that he describes in his paper. And you have his description on how you form that using this. And um, I've added to the supplementary slide explainer these terms here uh, because he failed to complexify it in 2020. And that makes it the correct spin group. And I'm using the Instead of just putting in the mathematics, I put in an intermediate step where I'd say that the uh, unrestricted set of dimensional measures for a uh, space of D dimensions is M. And I define um, the formula uh, for that as being the floor function, which is what this funny symbol is here and here, uh, that makes sure that you get a, uh, a natural number. It's a floor function for d squared plus 3d divided by 2. So that's exactly the same math as he's providing. And you add one other rule, which is that 
provided that 4k plus 2 equals m. So that is uh, something I found in books on uh, gauge theory, which is that you can only complexify something where the space m can be made by the formula 4k plus 2, where k is a natural number. So k in this instance would be 3, and it would be 4 times 3 equals 12, plus 2 equals 14. So that all checks out. And so mathematically, um, geometric unity is sound, right? Because it gets you to spin group, um, spin 14, uh, double strut C from X4. Okay, so this is a general formula for, for you to be able to do it with any uh, choice of dimensions D, where D is a natural number. I think it might have like a, a value where it can't be lower than a certain amount, like it can be two or more. Um, but yeah, I don't think it makes sense for it to be too low, because the thing is, it if eventually you're going to have it have a Lorentzian metric and be this thing of um, x13 it can't be like uh, x1 because x1 which is what I have effectively got with this isn't a sensible example it's just a way to kind of talk about it and that you won't be able to um, have it split. You have to have two dimensions uh, in your uh, manifold for there to be a time dimension and a space dimension, obviously, right? So it's like, oh, I get it now. That's why the Lorentzian dimension has that rule about it has to be greater than or equal to um, two. It's because it's going to get split into two things, right? So you can't have one of them be zero. So um, uh, where are we? We back to this and we go and work up to the next layer level. So we've worked out our spin group and then we're going to say, yeah, this here, the top level is Z and this is also complexified. And you say, right, well, how do you get to that then from M where I say M is 14, all right? So we go off and say, right, what's the math there? And it says, that will be, you um, will be, um, actually will be you of uh, the unitary group, you, um, where you is equal to 64, um, no, it's not it's gonna be 64, it's gonna be 128. How do I know it's gonna be 128? It's gonna be, where U is a structure group given by the formula, um, where U is uh, equal to two to the power of N and um, N is equal to the floor function of M divided by two. Now, does that make sense? I need to edit that. Given by the formula. Oh, I need to change this around so that I thought there's something fishy with that. Uh, so, um, so this is um, that superscript is um, u of u comma c, c. Where this u is not the same as this. This is the unitary group, and this is just a parameter that describes and characterizes that unitary group. And then I say that the parameter is the um, is the size of the structure group. There. Okay. Um, that's better. Um, now that is the real um, size of the complexified structure group. So what I mean by real 
here is I mean that it has a real part there and a complex part there. I think that's better. So yeah, where U is the real size of the complexified uh, structure group that. So that could be different in different theories. And um, in his theory, um, in the expressed in the lecture, he has the size of this group be um, 128. So he just writes it as um, U128, and that's it. That's all you see in the lecture, right? So uh, that has led the, the critic of it to get confused, and he didn't pay enough attention to the lecture to notice uh, other things that were clues that re revealed what was really going on, okay? And I myself was um, um, thinking that he had said it was 128 in the lecture, and when he got to write the paper, he changed it into being um, 128 um, C, right? And I thought, okay, well, that's better, right? And then um, Brandon Van Dyke, who has made an interview with this um, critic, um, suggested that um, Eric should have credited the critic for pointing out that it needed to be complexified. And because in the paper, it's now different than it was a year before when he presented his um, video of the lecture. And it's now gone from 128 to 128 double strut C. And this is the thing that the critic who wrote the response paper was banging on about. And that's not actually um, a, a firm point that Brandon Van Dyke has made, because the thing is, um, Eric Weinstein doesn't need to give credit to the critic because he already had it as U128 double strut C. And you might say, bullshit, because in the lecture it is U128. So what am I talking about? How can it be actually this? When we see in the lecture, and we will see it all the way through the lecture, it will look like that. How is it possible that it's that? Well, it's pretty simple, really. Uh, what we'd do is we'd go um, Oxford Lecture, then we go to the um, beginning of the lecture conclusion, and then we have this. So at this point in the lecture, um, he's talking about stuff, and he says, um, we then choose to add some stuff that we can't see at all that's dark. And this matter will be governed by forces that were dark too. There might be a dark electromagnetism and dark strong and dark weak. It might be that things break in that sector completely differently and it doesn't break down to uh, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 because there are different SU3s, SU2s and U1s. And it may be there would be a high energy SU5 or some Patti Salam model. Imagine then that chirality was not fundamental, but it was emergent. That you had some complex, and as long as there were cross terms, these two halves would talk to each other. But if the cross terms went away, these two terms would become decoupled. So what he's doing is he's talking about dark matter, right? And there is a problem with the observations of galaxies where you look at them and say, well, I don't think, you know, galaxies are, um, galaxies appear to uh, break the laws of physics because they are, um, you know, if you count, you estimate the mass of them, by looking at their luminous content in terms of their stars, uh, they're rotating all along. They are not rotating consistent with uh, um, Newton. They're not rotating 
that would be Newton's law of um, gravitation. So that it breaks Newton and it breaks a more accurate model of um, cosmology as described by um, the Einstein field equation. So you're thinking, hmm, so you're actually saying what? And seriously saying that um, that uh, galaxies break the laws of physics. They literally do. And that's because the laws of physics are inadequate to describe gravity, uh, to describe observations of galaxies. And that seems like an incredibly controversial statement, but this has been around for a while. And this is what you find when you look into the topic of dark matter. They did this research, they found out that the galaxies um, did, were not behaving correctly according to their uh, observations of them and their computer simulations of what they should be doing. And they're like, okay, um, this is a fucking problem. This is a fucking problem. Because the thing is, is this Einstein field equation has been around like 100 years and it's been tested seven ways till Sunday. And it's like, it's got to be right, right? I mean, it's got to be like, maybe it needs a tweak somewhere, but it's like, it's, it has so many tests. You know, they've used it to calculate the orbit of Mercury around the sun, perfect answer. Whereas the answer produced by Einstein, uh, by Newton's equation isn't correct. Uh, they used it to work out what happens when a, a ray of light from a distant star is bent by the sun and they waited until an eclipse to be able to do the uh, experiment. And Einstein had actually got his predictions wrong. And the people who went off to do the expedition um, couldn't get to the location they needed to be in in order to take the photographic slides of the sun in an eclipse. So they had to kind of wait for another eclipse a bit later. And thankfully, because of that, he didn't lose all credibility as a scientist because he didn't have his theory tested by, you know, the heavens. And he had a bit of grace in which to um, make a better prediction. And he predicted where the star would be, uh, which would be affected by the presence of the sun and gravitational lensing. What, what, the, what the phenomenon is called, and the distortion of space time was making the star appear as if it's in a different place uh, than where it normally would be in terms of the backdrop of a constellation of distant stars. And that was perfectly bang on the money for where he said it should be. It wasn't just saying, oh, it will be shifted. It was like exactly how much it should be shifted and where you'd expect to find it. And it's like, okay, I'm addressed now, okay? Because you're, like, talking about we live in a distorted squish space-time where the sun is squishing the space-time and it's kind of like it's, like, it's like everything's like jello and it's like squishing it and it's making it so that things that pass through the jello that is kind of like a dense prism is causing the denser part of the prism to be, um, it's causing the denser part of the prism to be um, refracted, right? So if you look at these lines and you say, well, if you were a light ray and you're going along this line here, it's going to be bending as it goes past the planet. If you are here, it's going to be bending as it goes past the, not the planet, as the star, right? But the same would happen with the planet, but it'd be less obvious. It's because the, the star is so massive that it would be something that you can measure. But if you tried looking at it during ordinary, you know, um, situations, then you would have it a problem because the, the the light from the sun would be too bright. And so he has an experiment where he wasn't looking at a star that was that separate from where the sun was, it was like right going cl close to where the, 
the, the ray was going right close to where it was. And I think it might have been that it was coming up this way and then being bent in this way, right? So it's kind of going, it would have gone past it if there was no gravity, right? No distortion of space, which just go like that because it has no mass. So it's not like a force uh, equals m times m, m1 times m1 divided by r squared. Newton's law would just say, well, if you've got something that has no mass, it won't be affected by gravity. So if you just go like that, and then light would have no problem, right? But Einstein's saying, no, it's nothing to do with the, 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 the mass. You know, it plays a role, but actually it will affect things that have no mass because it's, there's a geometric factor as well. So the geometric factor is affecting light uh, that is going through this and traveling, and it won't travel in a straight line if the space itself that's traveling through is warped. And so it goes through and it comes up warped and it's deflected by this. So this means that the Earth was seeing, I think if I'm right about the experiment, that the Earth, if the Earth is here, then the light ray would ordinarily be going off and miss it, and it would be going off here, and it would go off to here, right, to where it says upload. And then it went, and it went around the corner and was deflected to the Earth, and the Earth would be off, you know, somewhere this way, and it would see it um, when it would be like, that's the star that shouldn't be where it is in the constellation star field. And it says like, yeah, it, it should be like all the way across the sky over to the right sort of situation, right? So, um, and if we look up gravitational lensing, we'll see a picture of that. Um, Can we have an animation of this, maybe? Um, Eddington's photographs of the 1919 solar eclipse. Uh, so that's it's using, I think, inverted colors for that. So um, where's the star that was the one that proved the principle. Let's have a look. Oh, there it is. Okay. So that's that's the star from the thing that proved um, uh, Einstein's theory of um, general relativity. It's not much, is it, to go on? It's that. But um, I think that that's right. So... Um, Interesting. So it is pretty damn close to the corona. You can see how the corona's here, and it's just on the edge of the corona, even though it's covered up by the moon. There's lots of light coming out anyway, for, because the, the moon is like almost not quite covering the, the, you know, it's not quite in totality, I suppose. Um, so anyway, we've got that. Um, so, um, while we were on the subject of the metric, uh, it's a four dimensional metrics, and it's four dimensions of space, and the metric is, um, what's it say here on this? It's saying that it is a tangent space here um, for points P, which are elements of M. So you populate your surface M with points P uh, at every point in space uh, time. Well, it'll be space when it's like this, and then it hasn't been given a metric yet. And then you create the tangent space to that, and then um, do, 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 do. Um, the signature of G which is using G for the metric, is defined to be the signature of any of the forms. Um, um, 
right I don't know quite what they mean by non-degenerate um, matrix signature it says alternatively so you just keep reading and you get past that and it says matrix signatures I prefer that okay I'll read that for an n-dimensional differential manifold m we'll say it's four for the n whose tangent space t of p m with p is points within it has a basis i don't know what e, a basis means um the tensor uh that's a special kind of four by four matrix um uh, of g i j uh induces an n by n matrix we'll call it a d by d matrix so we're going to use um eric's diagram where he says you know we have um we have a manifold x d and einstein would say we have a manifold um m n uh so it induces an n by n matrix uh that's called a of p whose um uh, i comma j entry uh and it's using what looks like um einsteinian semantian convention um no 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 einsteinian is using these terms where this combination of terms i think is um you know covariant and contravariant um uh, things um for for that for that so I don't know too much about it, but it's not completely foreign to me. So again, just to restate it, I hadn't looked into any of this before a week ago. And I'm seeing how far I can get on limited knowledge. Because the way I, I have the attitude of like, I'm not going to wait until I've got a PhD in mathematical physics before I tackle any of this. Uh, I've waited two years for other people to make a video on this. No one has um if you don't like it okay fine you don't have to watch it if my attitude is that my um if i understand more than i do now great but i still under need to understand more this is such a deep topic that there will still be more to know there'll still be more to know and then i learn that and there'll still be more to know so I've left it two years um, and I've been thinking about this every day, nearly every day for three years and learning stuff along the way and only really been focusing on the quantum field theory stuff until very recently. Because when I started to dip a toe into the general relative stuff, I found it incredibly complicated compared to quantum field theory. Quantum field theory isn't that bad General relativity is mind-bogglingly complicated. And I'm just like, oh, I think I'm feeling kind of brain fag, even just dealing with any of this. Because it's four-dimensional partial differential equations on algebraic topology. And I'm like, yeah, I think we're just, you know, maybe take the fact I half understand um, geometric unity and the math for that. To do with the way he's constructing a gauge group seems completely fine i say that as being like having confidence of that having been able to make a 12-hour video refuting the claims of the critic and saying that everything he had was raising concerns all of those concerns were invalid um absolutely tear him apart in that video um for me to be in a position where i could confidently do that because he was that wrong in his paper with the things he was saying. And it was that obvious that even I, stupid me, could figure out that, hold on a minute, that doesn't make sense. Do a little bit of reading, find out, yeah, it's completely wrong. Right? So there was a sort of kind of bullshit uh, sense that was kind of going off as I looked at his paper. And I thought, what? And I then... I didn't even have to wait. For, what it was is that Joe Rogan asks Eric, has there been any feedback 
to his um you know thing and he said well not much you know in a year there's been um uh, one paper and um joe is like saying well uh, have you looked for any others and well i can play the clip i can play the clip because it will be on here um if we go to the joe rogan thing um so the joe rogan thing will be here and so he brings up his stuff and he makes a mistake because he calls it a theory of everything and i wish he hadn't done that up to this point he has not been calling it a theory of everything and um i think he made a huge mistake calling it a theory of everything but what has to be borne in mind is that new scientist magazine um right after he had his lecture where he did not claim it was a, a theory of everything um they go off and say this and they have an article and they say how to test weinstein's provocative theory of everything and you're like really i mean he never said it was that so why are you characterizing it as that and so this is a nasty article because they are basically building him up and inflating what he's doing whilst not letting you make your own mind up about well what is it about they're telling you in the title of the article that it's provocative and it's kind of like well how about you just tell me what he said and then let me make my own mind up whether or not it's provocative so that's like the typical way there's three things wrong with that headline they're calling it a theory of the thing where it was never asserted to be that is part of a Simone speculative lecture. So the Simone speculative lecture was, um, if we go to the filing system, we go to physics, the actual advert for the lecture is here. And we'll say that is the, um, how it describes itself, right? So in 2013, it says special Simone lecture. Marcus Sotoy introduces it in the beginning of the lecture, which we've already covered in previous videos. And he says that uh, it is a speculative lecture. And he says that Charles Simone is all for having um, speculation presented in science, so long as it's clearly signaled that what's being presented is speculative. So if you were to put on a presentation of a lecture, of a speculative idea and not let on that it was a speculative idea. That's no good. That's no good. But so long as you go off and preface everything you do and say, I have these ideas, they're speculative, they might not be any good, you're free to leave if you're not happy with the lecture. And then you go off and start off exploring, well, what could be the case and how could you do a unification theory um, in that frame? I think that's perfectly okay. And that's all he did, right? He did not present a theory. This is what people need to appreciate. So I say in my description, and I don't think Eric will mind me saying this, um, I say I react to the 23rd of May, Oxford University, uh, 23rd of May, 2013, Oxford University lecture on geometric unity that was given by Eric Weinstein at the invitation of Professor Marcus de Sotoy. So he didn't even force himself into Oxford to give himself that platform and be a kind of, well, you're not even a physicist anymore or a mathematician. What are you doing here? You're a hedge fund manager. Why are we even supposed to listen to you, right? That ac accusation could be floated by certain people, but the point is, is that he was invited by the chair for the public, un for, for the public understanding of science funded by Charles Simone, all right? Now, if you have a problem with Eric Weinstein speaking at Oxford, take it up with Marcus de Sotoy, because it's his idea that Eric Weinstein gets to present his speculative ideas at a speculative lecture, right? It's not Eric Weinstein's fault. Um, geometric unity isn't a theory of everything, or a theory, or a hypothesis, or a model, or a specific instantiation of a well-defined idea. 
Geometric Unity is an incomplete work in progress program, right? Which explores multiple speculative ideas as it aspires to become a unified field theory. that seeks to replace general relativity with something less restrictive, which allows for a much more elaborate and symmetric quantum field theory. And so we have the standard model there would be representative of that. Okay, so this thing I'll read now which is how it was advertised to people attending the lecture, most of whom would have been theoretical physicists and people who have a background in geometrical um, physics. Um, it's not for the consumption of ordinary mortals, put it that way. That's why people are like making out in the comments under the video, this is incomprehensible word salad. It's like, well, no, it's not to the people who are actually in the lecture, right? Um, a program for geometric unity is presented to argue that the seemingly baroque features of the standard model um, of particle physics are in fact inexorable. That means you kind of in, um, inescapably uh, kind of predestined to come out of the pattern generated by um, a, a gauge group which is itself determined in its structure by a uh, spin group whose size is the unrestricted set of dimensional measures of a abstract mathematical surface uh, x4. So you just start off with 4 and that gets you to 14 and that gets you to 128, double struct C, and then that then gets you to your U6464, which is in the lecture and I'm about to get to, and that 6464, some of it goes left, some of it goes right, and that it gets you your um, parity that you ordinarily don't see in the standard model because uh, it seems to not have parity uh, in, say, SU2. Uh, and it recovers that, and it's got it because it's more like the patty salam Grand Unified Theory, which uh, subsumes the standard model of SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, which isn't a completely unified picture. They've done... An electroweak unification on it, but they haven't done the unification of the whole thing. And we know that galaxies, top right, um, break the laws of physics as they currently stand, and we have a choice. Is it Einstein's um, field equations that are wrong, or is it that the standard model is broken? And it is that the standard model is broken. Okay. The standard model does not include dark matter in SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. There's no room for it. It's too small. You'd need to have it be a bigger group. So if you go off and make a grand unified theory and say, well, it can all fit inside a spin 10, no, still not big enough. It needs to be spin 14. And then if you want it to have the parity, you need to complexify that. That gets you to have the ability to then break that down into two halves, where when it's in the group U128 double struct C, that lets you go and halve it and have 64 and 64, and that gives you the left and the right, because the U128 double struct C is uh, topological direct spinners. And then when you talking about wanting to observe that uh, from the uh, the observer X13, you are looking at um, a group that will be implementing your um, 
quantum field theory that's effective to your reality as being um, the decomposition of U128 double strut C direct spinners into um, U6464 wild spinners. And these wild spinners will have the ones that describe stuff that is going spinning to the left and stuff that's spinning to the right. And then that gets you, in the case of fermions, which are the particles which make up matter, a, a fermion complex where there is um, the stuff we, we're used to that, that spins to the left, uh, the stuff that we have detected that spins to the right in terms of SU2, where there's you know things like right-handed neutrino, and it's like okay, there's it's obviously you know some symmetry there, but it's not a complete symmetry, and you're missing a symmetry, right? So like it's kind of like this that was to be symmetrical, and then you're saying the way that things seem to be is that the stuff that would be in my right hand is kind of seems to be apparently missing from the standard model. It's kind of like that. And there's certain particles that are like missing. They're like, it would be nicer if they were there and it would be like, like that, but they're not there. And it's like, well, could it be that they are there, but we're not able to observe them, right? Because they sit somewhere else on the fiber. We're on the fiber here and they're somewhere else on the fiber. This is a 14 dimensional sample of the total space. And so at the point at which we're doing our experiments in a large hadron collider, we're colliding things, we're saying, what are we finding? And we're not finding the dark matter because what we pull back will be dimensionally restricted because we're in four dimensions and the whole thing is 14 dimensional. Now it could be that we will be able to do experiments and be able to wring out of um, the underlying substrate that there will be this um dark matter stuff and it could would already be have a name it would be called rarita springer matter and it will have the characteristics of being spin three over two okay and he talks about this in his paper and he talks about what to expect in terms of their characteristics and he has to stop short of saying and here are all their energy scales that you would find them at in an experiment because he's not a quantum field theorist and he had talked to Lex Friedman about it in his podcast and he says I am a mathematician I am not a quantum field theorist and you would need a quantum field theorist to do that calculation right so I think the reason he has put out this paper where he has um, this thing on the front page where it's like, here are the email addresses that you can send constructive feedback to general and technical feedback. Is he's hoping at an early stage when the idea is largely speculative to um, elicit some help uh, as soon as possible from someone who can help him with the calculations to get some energy scales or any other alternative way in which uh, his theory could be experimentally tested, right? Not that it's a theory yet, but I'm, I will slip and I will say it's a theory from time to time, but it, it's like, it can't be a theory until it makes precise predictions, right? So if he gets it quantized, if he gets it so that it has energy scales, which would probably not be the next version of the paper it will probably be the one after that so like version three it might be on the time scale i'm thinking of i'm thinking he might have another paper in april of 2025 and then he might have one that's got maybe he gets a bit more momentum behind it and has some help because it's a bit more finished right this paper and um then he might end up uh having something in the way of not the final version of the paper but something closer to something that has got you know quantization in it and stuff and that might be the third version of the paper and that might be let's say 
2027. And then we might look at the final version of the paper where everything's sort of tidied up and properly presented that could go in an academic journal. Probably you don't, you won't want to put it in an academic journal, but it will be fit for being put in an academic journal. It will be of equal standard to, to that. And that will be maybe, I don't know, 2030. So it might be seven years between where it is now and where it needs to be in order for it to be a hypothesis, yeah, not even a theory. And the hypothesis will be saying, I expect to find this, that, and the other, and whatever, you know, in terms of the um, things that are being predicted by it, that are in a quantized uh, theory with traits of the particles that are new uh, to the theory and their yeah, energy scales, all done through collaboration with other scientists. And at that point in 2030, um, they probably won't be in a position to test it. Um, so the question like, is it a theory? It's kind of like, well, I don't know at what point something goes from hypothesis to theory. I'll leave that for other people to thrash out. But um, I don't know whether Einstein's special theory of relativity was a theory when he wrote it or whether it was a hypothesis. It might have been a theory um, and then it was later proven. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't, I don't know enough about science to know what qualifies something to be a theory. Um, there's a conversation in the... Uh, back garden between um, Eric Weinstein and his brother um, and they they have this conversation and they, they talk about the, the spirit the theory of um, I want to try to say something a little bit they, they're talking about you know he shouldn't call he says he shouldn't be calling geometric unity a theory he pushes back on that because he's an evolutionary biologist and he's like thinking, well, the origin of species um, book by Darwin, um, uh, evolution is a theory. It's not likely to be wrong, right? But we still, as scientists, can't say it's true, right? We can't say it's true. And I think there's actually a bit of, um, I doubt I can find it. There's a bit of Friends where Phoebe um, corners um, Ross about this. Um, evolution, yeah. Uh oh, it's scary scientist man. <laughs> Okay, Phoebe, this is it. In this briefcase, I carry actual scientific facts, a briefcase of facts, if you will. <laughs> Some of these fossils are over 200 million years old. Okay, look, before you even start, I'm not denying evolution, okay? I'm just saying that it's one of the possibilities. It's the only possibility, Phoebe. Okay, Ross, could you just open your mind like this much? Okay. Now, wasn't there a time when the brightest minds in the world believed that the Earth was flat? And up until, like, what, 50 years ago, you all thought the atom was the smallest thing until you split it open and this, like, whole mess of crap came out. <laughs> now, are you telling me that you are so unbelievably arrogant that you can't admit that there's a teeny tiny possibility that you could be wrong about this? <laughs> <laughs> there might be a teeny <laughs> tiny possibility. Can't believe you came. <laughs> so, um, do they fact theory hypothesis? What does it say? Um, is it even in here? 
14 dimensions. There. It could be here. And I might be roughly at the right position. So we're going to say, assume that this is when they were talking about it. I think this is his back garden. His, um, I don't think it's Eric Einstein's back garden. Because I think he lives in an apartment block in New York. And this is probably, where would it be? Would it be... Um, I can't remember where he lives. He lives somewhere like Seattle or something, doesn't he? Because he worked at Evergreen College. I don't know if he still lives near there or whether he's moved away. Um, if So here's the point. Over in biology space, we swear that evolution, when we say it's just a theory, we don't mean anything less. It's as close to saying it's a fact as we ever get. Right? It has been so thoroughly demonstrated to be accurate that we are treating it as a fact until we discover something that dislodges it like this is all a simulation and evolution was put in it to see what we would think yeah yeah something like that that's a policy so the evolution is as close to a fact as we get and we call it a theory my point would be at the point that your work predicts things in the world that lead us to understand that it is at least highly accurate and maybe the final step in our quest to figure out how the universe works yeah then it becomes a theory and there's only ever one theory at a time yeah right but the problem is over in physics because physics people are sloppy about this uh -huh. you've got people string theorists engaged in string theory and the thing is their work doesn't even rise to the level of hypothesis well, but they'll say things like it's not a theory it's a program but this I'll is my point it's actually yeah philosoph philosophy of science wise String theory is an interpretation. Okay. I want to try to say something a little bit more horrible. Okay. Why are we spending our time in philosophy of science? When we as science scientists spend too much time in philosophy of science, we have failed. And one of my concerns is, is that with all of the ink spilled on what is science, what is a science, what is a theory, what is a hope, what is a a prediction that's what happens when people aren't able to do good science for a long period of time no no i believe you are making a mistake and by the way you make an excellent point about what you call desperation physics so i believe you are conflating i think that may have been Pauli's turn well you and Pauli have done very well that was wolf kind of power in any case desperation physics is real i'm well familiar with it Philosophy can become another version of desperation physics or desperation, whatever science you want to talk about. It is not inherently that. And so my point would be, you actually don't need to spend a lot of time in philosophy of science space, but you need to spend enough time. And that in effect, what you've got in physics is you have the string, the so-called string theory community, which is effectively like uh, all of the suitors and other lowlifes uh, in the in the in the the manor, right? And Odysseus is coming home to liberate the manor and save Penelope, right? The point is the the coming home, the stringing the bow, the saving Penelope is actually done with the philosophy that says these people are not legitimate here. How do we know? Because they have dressed up a notion that maybe if we're generous is an interpretation. They have dressed it up as if it has the power of a theory. It doesn't even rise to the level of hypothesis, but they're claiming it's a theory. These people are illegitimate. And so anyway, I think that the amount, I mean, you know, that took three sentences, four sentences, and the amount of power that comes from recognizing, why are we taking this as seriously as a hypothesis or a theory when it doesn't rise to that level? So let me just sort of say this. Somebody set up a 24-7 um, chat room facility on, on the Discord platform for the portal community. And when I pop in by, you know, some, some means by which I'm quiet and I listen to what people are talking about, a huge amount of the time they're talking about is there free will? Are there many worlds? 
is something a scientific hypothesis. What I'm actually interested in is to tell them these are very expensive conversations yeah. that are going to take a tremendous amount of your life. I've so spent lots of time in this more to this series. Quite honestly, you and that. I can be in different places. My feeling about this is science is the totality of things that have worked to produce fairly reliable knowledge. And at yeah. the end mm -hmm. of the day, I believe that this is about taste and about not wanting to be thwacked. You know, in general, most musicians have a pretty clear idea about the hierarchy of musicianship. M music is a very large space. It's not linearly ordered. I'm not going to pretend that we all, you know, have the same favorite guitarists. But most of the time, you can say, you know, Hilary Hahn is one of the greatest violinists in the world, and everybody knows it. And when science is working, we don't spend a lot of time saying, is this science? We spend uh, a lot of time talking about, is this science? Is this settled when we're in politics space, when the field is stagnated, when there's a dispute in which people refuse to say that logic or data adjudicated. And this may be different for evolutionary theory and physics, but from my perspective, um, I don't enjoy being dragged into the demarcation problem by people who want to say, oh, you're a consequentialist, or actually I'm coming you're from a, a I, 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 I'm from a neo-paparian perspective. It's like, oh, is that, are you telling me that you don't do work? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm telling you what you think I'm telling you. Okay. Because the other part of this riff is this is not supposed to be scientists having this discussion. Yeah, but the scientists, in my, like, we've okay. been so dead for so long in what I care about. It's it's all dead. I mean, you've got an entire academy. Full when did, when did evolutionary people. theory stop? Nineteen seventy six. Pretty yeah. much, not entirely, but pretty much. Yeah, and pretty much, in some sense, the kind of theoretical physics yep. that I weep over and gives me jitters <laughs> stopped around nineteen seventy three. Okay. Now, my point would be somehow we civilization subsidizes a certain number of philosophers, including a certain number of philosophers of science, who are confused, for the most part, into thinking that their job is to talk to each other, right, rather than to adjudicate what constitutes science on the basis of rules that are actually pretty well understood. And so I, I am not arguing that we should be spending our time on this, but I'm arguing that their failure means that a small amount of investment in just getting our terminology even straight, so that when we make a claim, we are, you know, when, when physicists use the word theory right. for a hypothesis, they upend biologists who are saying, actually, when we say that yeah. Darwinism is a theory, right. we mean right. something. Okay, right. he's making a point, and it's taking a long time, but uh, Brett is making the point that there is no firm semantic context for the term theory as it applies to physics. And uh, when you're talking about biology, Everyone in biology agrees what they mean by theory. And it's like, okay, it could be that we were in a simulation and the dinosaurs were put in there and the simulation got started and there was no Jurassic era. They just put the bones in, right? We don't need to bother with the Jurassic era in the simulation. We just skip that and start in like, um, well, I mean, you could start, if you were going to do a simulation of the Earth, and you need to have some history. You kind of need to go slightly before, I suppose, the scenarians and, and get it rolling from there and put in, you know, the bones and stuff and the gold deposits and the coal deposits and the oil deposits that are from all the squished up um, um, era of the, you know, uh, what what was the era of the um it was three dinosaurs that was uh led to the sea creatures from that era being squished and turned into oil right so we're talking about such a long period of time that you'd have to run the simulator for to do all of that and say we've got a trilobite and then it gets gets ends up into you know subducted um you know terrain and it ends up being put under huge pressure and then it ends up being turned into oil 
that you can then drill for. It's like, do we really need to do that in the simulator and run it for millions of years, but on a very fast computer, so it only takes five minutes? Or do we say, well, eh, hand wave it away and just start with the Sumerians, right? I personally, if I was doing that, I'd start the Sumerians and like, I mean, unless you want to be clever and so start with the Atlanteans, right? And have it so that the Atlanteans were a prior civilization to the Sumerians and they had themselves completely erased, right? And maybe they had, you know, maybe they were, uh, had an underwater city under a dome because they were technologically advanced and they had all of that in place and then they got hit by the asteroid that also wiped out the dinosaurs and the reason why they were living underwater in the dome was because the land was occupied by these massive tyrannosaurus rexes and diplodocus and brontosauruses so they just thought keep out of their way we'll be underwater we'll be fine underwater and um then you know just off the coast of Meridia, they had their city, um, and then the uh, Chicoutlup, um asteroid hit uh, the Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs, and it hit um, and made the Chicoutlup, um probably pronouncing that wrong, crater um, roundabout in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, and so you're not going to go there and swim around, you know just off the um, coast of Mexico and say, well, we found some of Atlantis because it won't be there because it's got pulverized by the asteroid that wiped out the uh, dinosaurs. Um, and then you can say, well, were the uh, Atlanteans humans? Like, no, because the humans hadn't evolved until after the dinosaurs were out of the picture, because the only things that were around at the same time as the um, dinosaurs in terms of mammals were things like shrews, right? So you're looking at a, a Silurian hypothesis whereby um, dinosaurs across the era of, you know, the, the last era in which they were in before they got wiped out uh, were um, they evolved because um, they had plenty of time to evolve and they evolved into something sentient that decided to move itself away from the um, um, you know large um, you know dinosaur type things and they thought well you know, we, were, we started off in the ocean, we could go back to the ocean and we could build ourselves a dome city. So that's what they do. And they have computers, because that's an inevitability of technology. You have fire, and you have the wheel, and you have computers. And then they end up having artificial general intelligence. And they have major artificial general intelligence, which is slightly different, where um, a magi is an AGI which is built to be like a consciousness where it has a illusion of self which comes about as a result of it having a subconscious that can suggest ideas to it that seem to have sprung out of nowhere but what's actually happened is that the awareness through the senses is coming in and it's being picked up consciously and it's also being picked up subconsciously and that gets stored in the memory and then the subconscious is able to work in parallel with the memory and form associations with things that are in your distant memory and in your current, you know, there'll, there'll be like a Proustian moment where you'll uh, dip a madeleine into a cup of tea and you'll eat the madeleine and it'll give you a Proustian rush, right? And that will be uh, your memories, um, and that will come through your subconscious and then they'll bring all this information up into your uh, uh, conscious imagination and you need to have an imaginative space you'll have to have a theater of mind with abstract reasoning and there's a whole bunch of stuff that you need to be able to do to kind of picture a, a, a space in which you can 
move abstract objects around in your imagination rather than having to do it in practice, right? So if I have this and this, a black and white mouse, I can, in my mind, swap them so that they're in different hands and they're now the other way around, right? But I've done that in my mind and I can picture it and now I'm going to swap them back again and, oh, that is actually how it is. That's, that's actually turned out as I expected, right? So being able to do things and try things out in your mind and say, say, for example, here, right? I've got this and I do that. I know that if I put my finger in there and I let it drop, I'll hurt my finger, right? So not much, but it will hurt my finger. So I can have in my mind, because my experience of the world, my memories, it will be telling me that that's going to pinch my finger because it's going to fall on the hinge or whatever. And I've had instances where this has gone really wrong and I had a train and I had a train door, an old fashioned swing train door, and I didn't hurt my finger in the train door closing this way. I had my finger caught in this part and the drain door was closing fuck me that hurt um full weight at the door swinging against my finger and i don't know why my hand was there but it it was in that space and it was this and it wasn't that long before the train was going to pull out so that would be good get trapped going along like this being dragged along by the train um probably would have lost my finger but um you have these things in life and you have these accidents you have touched something too hot and you burn yourself or something you're thinking be more careful next time right so to be more careful next time you have to have a model of the world that you are looking at around all your sense stimuli and you're being um you're anticipating things fucking up right you're thinking you know i'm getting in the car i better make it so i can see out the windscreen it's all a bit frosty i better clean the windscreen otherwise i won't see where i'm going and i'll have an accident right basic stuff like that that you shouldn't even need to say but you know, i'm just I'm, I'm saying that the mind is doing this all the time i mean you don't need to lock your front door when you leave the house you could leave it on the latch but you do deadlock it because what if there is a burglar you want to try and frustrate them getting into the house even though that wouldn't really stop them but you you do it just because you think well i i think i will make a bit more of an effort about locking the house and you do that right so and then you get into the thing of like what happens if you lose the key and um that's why you have your key with a neighbor, right? You have a copy of your key with the neighbor who is usually in, and then you can knock on their door and say, I'm sorry, can I have, you know, a bar of the key and uh, let myself back into my house? I've locked myself out, sort of thing. And that has happened, right, where I've, I've needed that. So, um, but that's also weakening the security of your house where, like, well, I walk up and I go to the cinema and I've got it deadlocked. Next door neighbor's got a key. They could come in while I'm away and go through all my stuff, right? It could be happening every time I go to the cinema and I wouldn't even know about it because they then leave the house and they deadlock it and I would be none the wiser, right? So there's a expectation of the person like you. Know, I'm having to look at the person who I'm leaving the key with and I'm thinking, well, you know, weigh it up and like saying, how bad is it for me to be locked out of the house versus how bad is it for them to be in my stuff? And I'm thinking, frankly, don't care about them being in my stuff that much compared to being locked out of the house because I'm the only one living here. If I'm locked out of the house properly, I'd have to have a phone with me. I'd have to be able to make a call. I'd have to be able to get a locksmith to come in and break through the door and then replace the lock. And it's going to cost a lot of money. And if I can't do that 
I'm going to be having to go to a hotel and stay in a hotel, which I don't want to have to do because it's expensive. I mean, you're not going to be homeless, but it's like it's bordering on you look, you lock yourself out of the house and you can't stay with a friend because you haven't got any friends. You can't stay with family because you're away from where the family is. So it's like you're pretty fucked if you lock yourself out when you're on your own. So it's something I do worry about more than most things. And I'm like walking out the house to just put the, the garbage outside. I'm like, I have to have my keys on my person just in case the door swings shut and goes click and then it goes onto the latch, right? Because you take it and you push in the lock and you put it down the latch and it should be fine. The door should be able to close, but it's not reliable enough to stay that way. And it's happened that I've been and then the wind's blown it and it's like that and it's vacuum sucked it shut and the, the door's gone clink and it's now locked. And I'm like, what? And I happened to have my key on me, so it wasn't a problem. So I was thinking, like, absolutely never let that ever happen again. Always have your key on you, right? So um, I've been lucky. And hopefully it never is the case, touch wood, that I end up locked out of this house. Because it would be bloody annoying if I was. Um, And you might say, well, wouldn't it be sensible to have, like, a key under a flower pot or something that's... It's not a safe enough area to have the key under this flower pot and, and just do that. And I then need to have access to the garden if I wanted to get a flower pot. And the to make the back of the house secure from burglars, I've made it so the back gate is always locked uh, with a padlock, which you can only get to unlock from the from being in the garden. And you can only get to the garden from inside the house, which you can't get to unless you get through the front door. And there's no way into the garden from the back because of the way the fence is constructed and the houses behind. So I don't think there's a way of burgling the house from the back of the house. And if they, if anyone wants to break in the back of the house, they'd have to smash through where I do my recycling, um, that rear part of the house, that window, um, climb in through that little tiny window over the secondary backup toilet, which I don't use, and they'd have to clamber over my recycling um, caddy uh, for my food. They'd probably sprain their ankle. They'd have to get out of there, go through the kitchen, and then they'd be coming through here, right? And that's how much it takes them to get into this room. And it's like not fucking worth it, right? And um, and they're not going to pick up a brick and throw it through the window here and break in this way because that's viable if you're like really like a crackhead because it's right under a street light and it's on a T-junction and it has loads of houses viewing it at all times and it's well illuminated. So it's kind of like, do you want to pick this house when you could pick another one that's not, you know, by a street light with lots of traffic? And it's like there were better places to burgle than this, right? So they're going to go there rather than here. There are lots of uh, police cars, sirens going off all the time, they're like two a night. And so I hear them right in the vicinity. I'm thinking like at some point I will get burgled, but I'm also insured. So... My thirty thousand um, pound, my thirty thousand dollar Mac Pro, with its six uh, K display, which has got a monitor stand, which itself the monitor stand alone cost a thousand dollars, which is basically like the most expensive computer I could reasonably afford, which I um, intend to use next month to uh, create planets from scratch in a simulator. Okay, so this whole thing is talking about, you know, it could be the evolution is a theory, but it could be we live in a simulation and whatever. Well, I'm making a game and it's going to have um, a simulator. And that's why I'm talking about the whole thing about the the um, Silurian hypothesis where you have 
um, the Atlanteans are, um, you know, they are lizards that um, came out of, you know, the dinosaur era and they evolved and then they, you know, had their technology and they went un underwater again in cities. They made Atlantis and they had um, not just artificial general intelligence, but they did major artificial intelligence. Um, uh, and that major artificial general intelligence, or magi, um, thinks like a person would think, and I'm, I'm affording them the respect of thinking of those persons, and it has all the same weaknesses, actually, of uh, a psychology. So you could have a magi, and it would then have problems with being uh, paranoid, um, being lonely, being um, narcissistic, uh, obsessive. You, know, it, you might need a psychologist for one of these things, right? So they're going to encounter that when they start getting into doing serious AI, which I don't think they're doing at the moment. Like this Sam Altman guy, he thinks he's a bee's knees because he's got this large language model. It's just a chat bot. I mean, it's not actually doing anything that significant. Real AI is, is years away. It's like five, ten years away. And, uh, and I have not heard any sign of anyone much making it. There, there's something that's called neuromorphic computing, uh, where they make a computer more like a brain, and that way it has thoughts that might be like a, a mind would have. And um, but the the amount of complexity you need in a neuromorphic computer um, to compare to the complexity of the brain and its neuro neuro neuron you know web of neurons it's like so much smaller in its complexity um, than what we have in our heads that um, it's it's going to take years to make a neuromorphic computer that is um, scaled up in order to um, think the way that, well, you know, we might think and train it and all of the rest. So that's very early days at the moment. And the chat GPT model thing, um, it can be very quick. I mean, you can ask it all sorts of things like write a story and give it a kind of outline for the story and it goes and spits it out in like under three seconds. And you're looking at it and thinking, that story is good enough to publish as being a children's story about a boy with an owl and the you know, boy gets lost in the woods and the owl befriends him and, you know, leads him out of the woods back to the village sort of thing. And that is like the prompt and the story it generates without any kind of like write it in the manner of Hemingway, write it in the manner of J.K. Rowling. You don't sit any style information in there. I just wanted to see what it would do with no style information in the way of a cue. And it did it incredibly well. And the tone of the thing was in the tone of a children's story. And it was really nice, really nicely written. And I thought, better than I could do. Right now, I've given it the plot, but I described it in like three sentences, and then it goes whoop, like that in three seconds, and it's got like the whole thing. It might have been been quicker than that. It might have been a second, and it goes off and spits it out, and it's got the the uh, short story, and it's like, wow, you just need to have some illustrations for this, and you could publish it. And they're thinking, but they do illustrations too. You could take the sentences of the illustration of like the tangled wood and everything. You could go throw that to, you know, um, um, Dali or whatever else would be doing the artwork, right? And so, and you kind of pick maybe a, an artist like Arthur Rackham or you could do woodcuts or, you know, do something. And the whole thing would just like, wow, you know. And now you have another idea for another book, right? Like, like the 
three sentences for that, automate the process with a Python script, have it go off and then say, right, what's the style I need for this, uh, what would be appropriate for the theme of this uh, book? That's going to be more like Moist Sendak. You go like, okay, you're going to have a Moist Sendak look. And it's going to, you know, you go like that. You just keep pumping out books and then have them all be like Kindles that you can download off uh, Amazon. And so there's no publication overhead or having to find a publisher. You just go churn, churn, churn like that and set up a little uh, business like that um, where all these things are in the children's book section of Amazon and they're all very short books um, that are, you know, that you could theoretically end up printed on those kind of cardboard things where you turn the pages and it's got, you know, a picture and a sentence and you turn the next page and it's a picture and a sentence sort of thing. That's the level of the writing I'm talking about. And it's, it, it matters to have the sentences be good. And it matters to keep the, the reader engaged or the person doing the reading, reading engaged. And it matters to have the image to be at every point in every sentence. It needs to be something that's going to keep the child uh, wanting to know about the owl. And it's got to be a cute owl. And it's got to be a scary forest and all of this. And it's got to, you know, it matches, right? So there's things to get right about how you parameterize the whole prompt and then how you convey and implement things. So there's still artistry in the process, but the thing is, is that the fact that you can automate it to the abstraction, where you can then say, we can now do this with like loads of things in the way of the field of children's literature, and we could go off and have idea after idea after idea. And you could just go, you know, do a book a day or a book in the morning, a book in the afternoon and pump them out. And, you know, by the end of the year, you'd have 600 books on Amazon that you'd written. That's nuts, right? You could have 600 children's books that you'd written, all illustrated. Now, are any of them going to sell? How many of them do you need to sell if you start making money off them? Maybe some of them get traction. Maybe a lot of them don't get traction, but you, how many do you have to have out there before you increase your chance of having a viral hit and word of mouth it ends up being picked up by Reese Witherspoon or Oprah? And you just keep quiet about the fact it's done by AI, right? Because then you get people protesting about the fact that artists aren't getting paid for their work and stuff. So... We'll see stuff like that within the year, you know? We will see an eruption of, like, books appear on Amazon from out of the ether, and it'll be like, actual writers will have to kind of think, how am I going to write a novel um, and actually be new? Because everything you might do in a novel can be done possibly go through the synthesis of a corpus of existing texts that have already been read by ChatGPT. So that means that that universe of discourse, which isn't the whole universe of discourse, that not that, that corpus of discourse that is the the um, that is supplied to the um, large language model, that they, they make out they stopped at 2021. They had Reddit and they had Wikipedia, and I think that was roughly all that they drew their sources from. And my story for episode nine of Star Wars, which came out before they released episode nine, and it has Ray be Luke Skywalker's daughter, that is um and palpatine's not in it and the main villain is the character called darth plagueis the wise who gets referenced in the prequels as being uh, palpatine's uh, master all right so he he um That, that's the main threat. And 
uh, it solves all the problems I identified with the Force Awakens and the Last Jedi. Because there's like 65 problems with the Force Awakens and like 284 problems with the Last Jedi. As so I had to break down what they all were in videos, and then I was like, is it theoretically possible that you could make an episode nine that fixed all of these? And I came to the conclusion it wasn't in one movie, unless that movie's four hours long. And I thought there's no reason to make a Star Wars film four hours long. So what you do is you split it into two halves and you have part one and part two. And part one comes out in Christmas 2019 and part two comes out on May the 4th, 2020. And Twilight got two parts at the end of its franchise and Harry Potter got two parts at the end of its franchise. So I don't really understand why Bob Iger was against letting J.J. Abrams have two parts for episode nine because J.J. Abrams apparently made out he needed two parts. And what the film he came out was terrible, but it would have been less terrible if it had been less breakneck because it it gave me a headache. It was it was so breakneck um, that there was one point in the movie that I thought, hey, on a minute, if I had blinked, literally if I had blinked, I would not now know what is going on. That's terrible filmmaking. To have something go that fast, that is like, if the audience is like, blinks at the wrong time, a plot point flies by. And I thought, you can't make it that quick. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to present important critical information three ways. And you're supposed to have people talk about it in dialogue, show it, and then um, like refer to it again, uh, you know, a bit later on. So like if you, you know, drop something on the floor or you, or you you know, you're eating some popcorn, you can't hear the dialogue because you're munching your popcorn or your date goes and says something to you and you turn to your date and it's something shown on the screen. It's like you have to cover your bases so you show it again, right, a bit later. And then it might be that you, you don't miss the thing, right? Um, I mean, you have to think about disabled people. You know, if you start off a film and you have, like, text on the screen that's saying, you know, about, like, uh, the X-Men and all that, about mutants or something. And you're talking about mutants and then, well, have it read out, right? Have it be that Patrick Stewart's talking about, you know, mutants and um, um, go from there. I think they have text at the beginning of the X-Men, do they? Can't really remember. But um, anyway, so with this Siloan hypothesis, which is an idea I found out other people had had, which has pleased me actually, because I thought, oh, I thought I'd come up with that. And uh, it amused me to see that other people had thought of the Siloans. And I thought, of course, it was in Doctor Who, because the sea devils walk out of the sea because they're upset with nuclear testing. And they're saying, what are you doing, making all of this noise sort of thing? So my hypothesis is a, is, a, is a modification of that, whereby there are no Silurians anymore. The Silurians were lizards that lived under the sea, and they were the Atlanteans. And they were very, very long time ago. And they got wiped out by the asteroids that wiped out the, the uh, um, dinosaurs. And, but they created major artificial general intelligence and they created custodians. And the custodians are like Tic Tacs that go flying around and they can go underwater and they come out of the water. So they're what's called transmedian. And these um, things that go around and they check up on what's happening on the surface because they were aware that they lived in an in environment where they wanted to know what was happening on the surface and uh, in terms of, you know, situation with the dinosaurs and, um, you know, they have the technology with the 
um, you know, custodians for them to um, um, uh, intervene in certain circumstances, right? In order to preserve biodiversity. So that would be their programming, would be to preserve biodiversity because they would um, be wanting that stuff that's happening on the surface to um, be healthy because it's all part of an ecosystem that involves what then ends up happening to this, the oceans and they need the fish to stay in the oceans and um, it won't work if like, if there's some kind of situation where there's a lot of pollution on the surface and then it starts poisoning the fish, um, that's no good, right? So we've seen more evidence of Tic Tacs since there's been a nuclear um, development. And so you go from, um, you know, Trinity, um, the Oppenheimer thing, where they test the bomb out. And then not long after that, um, you get Lewis Whitten and the uh, people meeting to talk about anti-gravity. And Eric has been speaking about this um, to Jesse Michaels. And I think he now knows um, David Grush, is it? The uh, UAP whistleblower has been saying he's called Eric Weinstein a, a good friend. And I think it's kind of wild because, like, Eric Weinstein's phoned me up to talk about geometric unity. And then he's also on a program with Jesse Michaels saying that one possible thing would be that if, you know, it's a long shot, but if his geometric unity theory is a description of the universe we live in, which is immersed inside of a uh, observerse, then it could be that these uh, un unidentified aerial phenomena are from that observerse. And they have presumably to be able to travel the way they are, they might have the ability to manipulate seven dimensions of time and seven dimensions of space and what would that mean and he um is saying well you know um they don't seem to have regular propulsion um are they not breaking the laws of physics as as people were bought they are just doing physics that are is not known to uh physics as it is that we have it defined at the moment so um, once we get the right laws of physics, then the behavior of UAPs will be like, oh, well, they're just doing that, right? They're just using a kind of, I don't know, a repulsor drive that allows them to kind of surf off the Earth's gravi gravitational field. They don't actually have propulsion as such. They're more like a magnet that's kind of got like a, a North Pole that works against the um, gravitational pull of the Earth, and then they're able to somehow dimensionally um, push themselves away with kind of anti-gravity, right? And so they're like, they can vector the anti-gravity so they can, if they want to fly close to the Earth, they make it attract. And if they want to, um, it's that the regular gravity is turned on, and then they go off and then, and it can be increased and for this to work the vehicles would have to be uh presumably they'd be inertialess and then there would be um or if they were under gravitational stress because they would have enormous g factors for the uh as they go from like static to going like that going straight up at you know really high speed that would make you break every bone in your body if you're a pilot. So um, they're not aliens. Uh, they're, they're not, you know, humans from the future. They're not dinosaur Silurians that are piloting these things. They're not lizards. They are what were created by the lizards uh, millions of years ago as custodians of biodiversity on Earth. And they emerged from the oceans, which is where the Silurians were in their underground city of Atlantis and they pop up and check on, on us every now and again 
and they've gotten more interested in us recently because of our messing around with nuclear weapons. And so that's what the concentration of interest was in. And then Lewis Whitten was, um, and Feynman and various other people met to uh, discuss all this. And there's anti-gravity research in the 1950s. And then that uh, was then tied up and made secret because uh, Martin got hold of a uh, crashed vehicle. And um, this was a tic-tac of sorts. And then they, Martin got subsumed into Lockheed Martin. So they aren't subject to Congress oversight. And they keep it that way because they don't want the government who they don't trust were corrupt and blab to talk about what they've got, uh, which is kind of like ontological dynamite. And it isn't aliens because aliens can't get to Earth, unfortunately, in my view. I don't think there's a way of manipulating rulers and protractors in order to travel through space fast. They are just using highly advanced um, computing to have their vehicles using a kind of form of gravity propulsion. Uh, it's a bit more, I mean, it's advanced, but it's not as advanced as being able to do time travel and uh, portal travel, Einstein roads and bridges, any of that stuff. They're not doing any of that at all. They've not, you know, they're not from another galaxy. Um, we're not going to be able to use the technology from them if we understand them to go and colonize other exoplanets. So him thinking that that's viable, uh, I'm afraid I'm completely, I'm not on that page at all. And I think it's wishful thinking. I think we're basically stuck here. I don't think Elon going to Mars is going to work. I think there's a viability for a moon base. And what are you going to do on the moon? Not a whole lot. So it's like you can go and waste your money building a moon base, Elon, but it's like as to going anywhere else, it's kind of like, well, you might build maybe a nice space station at the Lagrange point between the Earth and the moon. Okay, you can do that if you really want to, you know, knock yourself out. Um, there might be some stuff that you can build uh, bases in the asteroid rings because um, there'll be resources there, presumably. Um, in the asteroid belt, um, you, you build, build things out there and then you go to Jupiter and then you have the gases of Jupiter that you could use as fuel and you've got some uh, moons there that are quite big. You might be able to do stuff there. You've got um, other moons. I can't remember which one it is. I think there's some moons of Saturn or something that have got methane lakes on them. So again, that's another form of fuel. So there's natural resources out there in our solar system um, where methane, which is a gas on Earth because of the temperature, is a liquid on one of these outer planets. And so there's sort of things where you could say, okay, you could do something with that. But as to colonizing exoplanets, it's a stretch. The best bet would kind of be to build robots that were intelligent enough to look after themselves and set up self-replicate and repair themselves and then sell, send them off on a journey to, you know, Botsman Centauri. And then um, they would then terraform any planet that they came upon that wasn't already populated. And then they would uh, build cities and then they would make it all human dimensions. So you wouldn't be, if, if humans ever got there, um, it wouldn't all be like the wrong size for everyone. Um, and it will be ready and uh, environmentally regulated and stable, and it might all take ages. It might take thousands of years. And it might take thousands of years for us to find a quicker way of getting there. But um, when we did get there, it would all be ready. It will be set up. There'd be a nice city and everything will all be sorted.
because a generational ship, well, not a generational ship, a ship full of the immortal robots who have gone there and done it. The thing with that is that you might say, well, would it not just be easier to port up our consciousness into um, a kind of neuromorphic um, positronic brain of a robot? Right. Mm. So that means you're now living within an android, right? And you are, presumably you want to have your body look more like a person than you want to be like data from Star Trek, where you've got skin and you can touch and you can feel things and you're making yourself as much like a human being as possible. Um, but because you would have a major artificial intelligence that would be inside a neuromorphic, you know, whatever was running your brain, then um, you would have uh, a mind that would be subject to the same problems as any other mind, and it could have psychiatric problems, right? So on a long mission where you're sending out a basically a multiple self-replicating uh, Android versions of humans that will be real people that had like, that would be based on a certain person that might be, it wouldn't be there and they wouldn't be uploaded. It would be like a copy of their consciousness where they put them in a superconducting um, thing where you, it's like, a, I think it's called a squid where you have a late, late, uh, an interlacing on your brain and it images what's happening in your brain with maybe a uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging or something. And you go and do that at high resolution and you map everything and you put in stimuli, you make yourself watch different things and then have different parts of the brain like light up for the stimuli and then through a um, neural network that's modeling lots and lots of brains, it works out a fingerprint that is your brain that characterizes your brain differently from a default, right? So it's already worked out how to make a mind that's like a human, but the one to make it like yours, and it won't be like 100% like yours, it will be like 70% like yours, but it'll be enough damn like it that you could fool someone, where the, the um, Android version of you that looks like you, that doesn't look like data, doesn't have pale skin, walks in and people think it is you, right? Because the externalities and your characteristics and your idiosyncrasies will all have been captured because of the way the process is in the feedback loop where it captures you. And this is similar in a sense to the concept of a driver tar that's in Forza Motorsport 5, where you're driving the, the, you have a race and it says the first five races in the game will be captured by the game and use the spaces of your AI mimic that will be there for other players to race against, even when you're not there. So uh, you have accelerator and brake, and you can have this do the steering, you go steer left, steer right, and so you go off and say, right, we're ready to race, and you're thinking, I'd better try and win, and I'd better try and have a clean race, which is difficult because a lot of cars, and you're going around the streets of Prague, and then you're kind of thinking, I better make it so that I, you know, you know, do something that I'm going to make myself seem like a, how I'd like to be in the game as a, as a racer. Because this is now going to be my proxy from now on. And if I just fool around because I've just got the game, I'm going to end up with um, uh, conferring that this is who I am. Um, I'm a shithead right i'm a jerk so i can't be a jerk on the road at least in the first three races and what i find is i think i was lucky or i might have restarted the race in the like, because i had the first race and it was going that well i stopped it and i started over having learned a bit about what was needed and needing to know that the a button was the handbrake and it really helps you get around corners by drifting and if you master drifting, that makes a huge difference. And so you're doing the drifting with handbrake stuff and J-turns and all of that, 
as you go around Prague and you come like second or something and then in the next race you come first and then you know you improve your time and you start you know it, it, you start doing really well so you you do that and then you have those three races and then in other games that other people have i'm there racing against them even though i'm not even online and they'll say my name uncompetitive over my car and my car might beat them in the race and i'm not there driving it'll be my ai mimic my driver tar that will be doing that job and it will be racing the way i told it i race in the first three races that i did with the game now after that it does pick up on how you play and it does sort of try to modify that profile a little bit over time so you kind of are expected to keep racing a certain way i think i'm pretty sure it does you kind of adjust over time a little bit but essentially that's what it does and what i found was interesting is you go to the game and you might not have been playing it for a while and you have a kind of a kind of email thing in the game and it will say we have mail and you go to the thing where it says you have messages and it'll say you have won this much money and it'll be money that is like pretend money in the game that you can spend on car parts and things and you've won it but you haven't it was your ai mimic that won it while you were away and the months that you've been away it's been racing and it's been winning race after race and so um it, it took it means that you it's like it's great like it's like i don't even have to play this game and it's like plays itself so that's something that interests me and i want to do in my game but in the question of talking about this um having androids uh, are on a ship that are going to a distant star and that's how you could in in practice possibly colonize it um i think the problem will be that even if you don't actually have people's real consciousnesses inside of these robots because all you can do is make an analog of an ai mimic of how they are and then what you're doing is you're saying okay we can't leave earth but what we can do is you can spread our culture far and wide and if um an asteroid was to hit earth and wipe out humanity the works of shakespeare wouldn't be gone the works of um wilk wouldn't be gone uh the works of muddy waters wouldn't be gone right all of that stuff um whoever you're into uh would be uh preserved not just as recordings that would be unintelligible to an alien civilization that might encounter um our humanity but they would be um enshrined in things that would live on and be ambassadors of that culture and preserve that culture into the future and i think that's the only thing that we can think to do uh beyond ourselves i mean we're on the brink at the moment of having a war with russia that could turn nuclear and i'm thinking well you know have to go back just a couple of years and we were you know had had a problem with a bioweapon and it's just like either way we're either gonna release um weaponized ebola and that's going to be extraordinarily bad or we're going to have a nuclear accident because we've had them in the past in 1984 the americans nearly started a nuclear war by accident right so it's on the cards that one way or the other this is where he's right that there is a threat from uh, the twin nuclei problem you know the nucleus of the atom and the nuclei of, of the cell is brother right those are the twin nuclei and we have covid and we have um uh, the nukes from south uh, north korea and from uh, china and from uh, russia um and from um america because i'm not completely convinced that biden won't try uh, a first strike or try battlefield nuclear weapons um, they are talking about or they're planning on putting nuclear weapons inside of the uk 
uh, that are American is going to make them closer to um, farming on Russia. And I think that's a bad idea. People are upset about that at the moment. And so it's an escalation. It's kind of like there's a desperation over the Ukraine and we kind of really need to hurry up and get Trump re-elected because he's going to solve it in 24 hours. And he's going to solve it in 24 hours because he can go off and say to Putin, uh, you've got basically what you wanted, which was access to the Black Sea through the port, uh, submarine port in Sevastopol. It was your territory historically. It did have major, majorly, uh, mainly Russian speaking people in that area. They were being persecuted by a very fascist um, Ukrainian state. Um, so the suffering on the, that, the Ukrainians have um, the Azov Battalion who are effectively neo-Nazis, um, but the Ukrainians are seen by Biden as being heroes and the Russia as being the, in the wrong because they invaded even though America, without international support by the UN mandate, invaded Iraq and Baghdad, right? So it's like all right for America to do it, but if Russia does it to protect its own people in um, former Crimea, it's like absolutely unconscionable. So I'm totally okay with what Russia um, did in its sphere of influence um obviously it's unfortunate it's a war and it's unfortunate that people have died but a lot of that could have been avoided if there wasn't support to fund the ukrainian regime um, from the west and so the west sees it as an opportunity to drain the resources of russia by having an extended war that's going to be expensive for them and they get to profit from selling Ukraine weapons and they get to get loan they, they don't the money they get from Ukraine Ukraine hasn't got the money for the weapons so what they do is they get land from Ukraine so all that's happening is that there's a land grab going on from America where America's going to end up with prime agricultural land in Europe which is a place where most of the bread gets um created because they, they have all of this area where they they, they grow um, the wheat right and so it is a fantastic place for agriculture and they um, will own it all, uh, pretty much by the time they finish and they've also got plans when the, the war's over for for more money to be paid to America because they'll be paying for reconstruction and they'll have flat water and various other um, companies that will be coming in to rebuild roads and bridges and stuff, all the stuff that gets blown up. And um, you know, you always got money going for that, but you haven't got money for going for infrastructure repair in the United States. So billions of dollars have gone over to Ukraine. The accounting for it's all screwed up, and they don't know where it's all gone. And so there's probably been loads of kickbacks, and then some of that is being used and funneled back into the democratic national congress to pay for their war chests for their uh, election against trump and the amount of money they're about to spend in the next few months between now and november um on uh, litigating well not litigating but like advertising and saying you must vote for biden or whoever it is that they swap out uh biden for it could be Michael Obama. It's going to be like, like you've never seen in your life. If you think that they have media saturation about their politics and about how Trump is evil, now, the money that they're going to spend, not just on the news that's sponsored by Pfizer, but everywhere else between all the commercial breaks on all the main news channels, all the main, uh, you know, Peacock, ABC, MSNBC, CNN, um, uh, NBC, uh, all of the main channels uh, everywhere, um, 
they, they will make it so you can't go anywhere on, on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, absolutely everywhere between now and um because he's had his valley forge thing hasn't he biden to kick off his election campaign and they're going to start spending and it's going to ramp up because it has to be can't be like turning on force it at full thing because what would happen is it would be like you'd notice and you go what the fuck's this they don't want you to notice they have to be like boiling a frog so they make it so that it starts off relatively slow and then grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and then work out what is the mood of the people to see whether or not they are reacting to kind of go i don't like this oversaturation of your viewpoint right but it's going to be like that and it's going to be propaganda wall-to-wall propaganda from now pretty much to uh, november and um like you've never ever seen in your life and the republicans haven't got the money to compete with that and they haven't got the platform and the um they they kind of can only narrowly get their message through um whether places like i don't know the dark horse podcast whether whether it will be removed from youtube whether we'll see the daily wire removed from youtube whether everything's going to have to go to rumble whether Eric Weinstein is sensible in maybe deferring the return of the Bordel podcast to 2025, which I think is probably what he's thinking of doing. He said it would return, and I thought, but when? And knowing how smart he is, he's probably thinking, even if the Democrats win, it would be better to leave it until after the uh, there's been a constitutional election because there wasn't one in 2020 and if you defer it until after that um, has been there's been an actual election which there's no one can dispute was an election because it was a constitutional election then if in um, January 2025 there is some new person being sworn in whoever it might be could be AOC literally it could be AOC then um, if AOC is president, uh, when the sign comes back, not I'm saying only if AOC is president, I'm just saying whoever is president in 2025, then it's like, so long as it was a constitutional election, there could have been shenanigans, there could have been dead people voting, there could be trouble with signatures and USB drives and people not being allowed to observe the count. There could be all manner of things. If there's better voter ID, it's less spread out when they're doing the count because it's more like they get the result within a day or two days. Um, if they have it and there's not mass mail up ballots or there's a bigger turnout and feel people feel it is a uh, better representative, that might be okay. But really, crucially, it comes down to like, is it a constitutional election? And People on the right, if they lose, I think would accept losing a second time over if the second time it is constitutional. And my recommendation to anyone planning on stealing the election is to say, don't do it twice in a row. Steal it maybe sometime in the future, but don't do it twice in a row because they will have a civil war. They are that pissed off. They nearly did it last time. Um, James Lindsay was reported in a video. He was a guest of uh, Benjamin Boyce, and he said that he'd been talking to people online and they weren't happy. And he started kind of hinting at the fact that there was, like, people, like, seriously talking about, you know, maybe we need to take matters into our own hands because we're really not happy with the fact that Biden's got elected with like 81% share of the vote, which was more than Obama. Like, what the fuck happened? He didn't even campaign, right? So, you know, the account, the economy was good under Trump. Then there was COVID. Was COVID created by the Chinese in order to make it so that 
Trump's economy was ruined. Who knows? Because it's like, if he stays in power, he has two administrations, one after the other. How much more damage is that going to do to the Chinese economy because of his imposition of tariffs? Then if you try and say, well, I can refute that um, conspiracy theory by saying that Biden has kept the tariffs. So wouldn't you expect him, if he was a Manchurian candidate, to remove the tariffs? And I'd say, well, no, because I have another conspiracy for you, which is that um, the, the uh, no such agency uh, stole Hunter Biden's laptop. Hunter Biden did not take it into the computer shop, having poured liquid all over it, and then it ended up in the hands of Rudy Giuliani. What happened was the NSA stole it, and then they went off and they left it in the computer shop, and they picked a computer shop that they knew that the person who ran it couldn't see very well and wouldn't be able to make a positive ID of who was taking it in. And... I mean, if you got footage from inside the computer shop of Hunter Biden leaving the laptop, then that that conspiracy theory is refuted. But I've not seen him bringing it in on camera, and it's definitely Hunter Biden doing it. So I think there's a possibility that the NSA are trying to save America. And of all the um, parts of the state that have been corrupted by China. They are the last remaining part that hasn't been corrupted by China. The Department of Justice is cor corrupted, the FBI is corrupted, the CIA is corrupted. Congress is compromised. Eric Swalwell is uh, got a girlfriend who's a, who's a Chinese spy. Um, Hunter Biden was hanging around with a Chinese spy by the name of Li Yefei, right? And she was blackmailing him by having film of them doing stuff and crack and all of that. And that was the contents of the hard drive and everything. And she, the way that it's, the Chinese uh, spies work is they go after the guy they want, which is Biden, Joe Biden, through the family. And they say, we wouldn't want this to come out about your son, would you? And it's like, then he's got to do them some favors. And they get their control and they get their leverage over the president of the United States. That's the plan. It's very simple. He would then drop the tariffs, wouldn't he? But he doesn't. So it doesn't make sense. So there has to be something else going on. And what goes on is the laptop, which was their leverage, which was going to show up Hunter Biden and be like, we wouldn't want this going out, gets let out. So it's either the NSA took it and put it in the hands of uh, effectively the New York Post, ultimately, or um, Hunter Biden's an unsung hero. And he is actually saw that his father was corrupt, saw that the business deeds he was doing in Ukraine were all bad. And he thought it's one thing for us to be, you know, on the gravy train in this way we've been doing it for years but now it's getting serious because the deals that we're making are deals with um say the mayor of um moscow's wife i think it was and then there's someone in ukraine to do with burisma uh where um biden went there and his own film saying how he held it over them the um the aid that he, he was supposed to just be the bag man taking the aid from Obama to Ukraine. And he was like saying, I'm not going to give you the aid unless you fire the prosecutor of the boss of Burisma. Which is kind of a bit random, right? Because he's just an oil uh, guy. And he was corrupt. He's being investigated by a um, Ukrainian prosecutor. And he was in danger of going to prison. And so the people in Ukraine who want the money from America in aid are like, you've not got the authority to hold this money back. That was the decision of the president of the United States. You're just the vice president. And 
he says, well, you know, you can test me on this. And um, he says, you know, um, you know, it makes that he he can, um, you know, um, hold hold it back from them. And um, they, um, I mean, I might have the video on this somewhere, but like um, Biden talking about this, basically saying he's like the most corrupt person in the world. Um, It's going to be here we are. Oh, no, wait a minute. This is is it here? This is same thing. Um, well, I've seen it before, so it's probably in this. Um, Margaret Warner, I see you with the microphone. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Vice hey, Margaret, President. Good to see you. My question is, should we actually be going on offense in the information war, in the cyber war, in terms of delegitimizing, not just exposing the corruption, but really playing offense the way they're playing offense? The answer is yes, but not necessarily in the cyberspace where we go in and allies around the world and expose got here. The last vestige of that Cold War was Radio Free Europe and Radio Europe coordinated. I don't think this is a video, but it's like this. So in a panel like that, so corruption in Ukraine. Um, Brags, he brags about getting Ukrainian prosecutor fired. That's it. That's the video. So we go to here. Pop that in the chat. So this is your president. Um, Um, so, uh, Ukrainian prosecutor Viktor Sholkin, uh, in his investigation of corruption involving Burisma Holdings, which is an oil company, oh, natural gas company, sorry, identified Hunter Biden as a recipient of over three million from the company. Uh, there's a date typo, hold on, 2016, not 2006. Not wanting this corruption exposed, Joe Biden swung into action using U.S. loan guarantees from um, Obama as hostage. So he's just supposed to just turn up and hand them the money, and uh, it's like uh, not literally, but you know, as kind of like a diplomatic overture. He flies there and he says, you know, uh, here's the money, while demanding Skokin. Um, I think it said Shokin. Uh, Shokin is, is another type of Shokin, uh, be fired. Amazingly, Joe Biden is now bragging about his actions in this matter. So, yeah, um, I remember going over convincing our team, our others, <coughs> to convincing that, that we should be providing for loan guarantees. And I went over, I guess, the 12th, 13th time to Kiev, and uh, and I was going supposed to announce that there was another billion dollar loan guarantee, and I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had they were walking out to the press conference. Said no, I said I'm not going to, or we're not going to give you the billion dollars. They said you have no authority. You're not the president. The president said I said call him. 
<laughs> I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting a billion dollars. I said, you're not getting a billion. I'm going to be leaving here. I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, we're leaving six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. And they put in place someone who was solid. There you are. So, not good. Not good at all. So, um, it could be either that Hunter Biden is a hero, and I'm not joking, he could be an unsung hero, and all this will come out in years to come, that this is what's really been going on. But he got to a watershed moment, and he thought, this is getting too deep, right? You know, he's in with Burisma, he's helping out his father, he's already saying stuff on the laptop about not liking having to give uh, so much of his money that he makes to his father because he's the one that gets the money given to him for the jobs and then he has to give money to pay the rest of the family he's paying for the whole rest of the Biden family to go to college and stuff and he's like sick of it right well he wouldn't have the job he's in if he wasn't for his father being you know having been the vice president so um But he, he begrudges that, that situation. So the fact that there is a kind of enmity between him and the rest of the, the family and that they, he sees them probably as fat parasites and his father as a parasite. Um, and his father probably thinks of him as an heir to wear. But um, he, um, the, the thing is, is that it's possible that Hunter Biden is behind all of this and he has made the disruptive move to have what had been the status quo where it would have been to, um, Biden who had sold out to the Chinese uh, quite willingly and got money from both Ukraine and um, Kazakhstan and Moscow and uh, China. Does it say that? all of these all of these places lots and lots of places um was going to be in full to the uh chinese communist party and that he would at minimum be getting rid of the um tariffs that trump had imposed on their um i think it's on their exports or no it wouldn't be on their exports because they've got international exports it would be on imports into the us from china so um that would make things more expensive for um, China to sell things in the US than compared to other countries. And I think some of that money went to pay for, um, the money raised off that went to pay for um, American farmers. So they got like a big check from um, Trump, which was paid for by China, effectively, by having to pay these tariffs. So, This allows for the, it's a counterbalance to the outsourcing that was done in previous years, uh, where you outsource uh, the, the uh, corrupt businesses in the United States go off and they put their production in foreign countries, particularly China, and they have their stuff made there, and then, then they have it in America, and they just do the design part in America. So I, I had my phone, and it's like, you know, it's designed in California, but it's made in China. So it's like, mm, you know, it'd be better if it was made in, you know, America. Um, and so, yeah, that's, it, it's not good that so much stuff is made in China for the economy of uh, America, because those are all jobs that could be American jobs that you're just sending overseas or allowing to be done overseas. Um, so that has led to a kind of um, economic problem um, that Trump addresses, and it, it both addresses the job problem and the uh, what's it called, the balance of payments problem, maybe. Um, there's all sorts of things that are affected by, by 
having outsourcing. Outsourcing and globalization are really quite bad. And then Trump is more in the opposite direction where he's doing things where he will have, you know, homegrown uh, businesses in America with entrepreneurism uh, um, encouraged, and he will have um, uh, American dream, America first, um, the nation state being strong, having strong borders, um, and not being uh, spending all your time in your administration going to war with other countries which is something America tends to do because of the backers of the presidency or the main political parties. It doesn't really matter which. It can be both the Republicans and the Democrats, it's been. Um, they always seem to end up in thrall to the deep state. And so um, Eisenhower warned about this with the military industrial complex speech he gave years ago. And he said, you have to watch out for it and no one really took any notice, and it is a big problem. And then Trump comes along, and he actually addresses the problem by not starting a new war. And he then has the Abraham Accords, which uh, could have, he didn't quite have time to do Saudi Arabia, but he could have maybe got them on board as well if he'd had a second administration. And, um, Biden gets in and he goes off and pisses off the Saudi royal family and alienates them and pushes them in a different direction. So um, what's happening in Israel with Gaza probably wouldn't be happening if Trump was president um, because there would be um, uh, peace in the Middle East. Um, the Abraham Accords were really very significant and they don't get talked about enough. And um, I think it was Thomas Sowell, I think it was him, that said that Trump should have got a Nobel Peace Prize for the um, Abraham Accords. I'm not sure. Someone said that he should have got a Nobel Peace Prize. And I, I think that's true. Um, but they, that, they would never have done it. They would never have given it to him because of how unpopular he's been made to seem to be by everyone in the media, basically worldwide, who are all left-leaning, if not uh, progressive leftists. Um, and again, the thing I've said in the previous stream is that the comparison between Biden and Trump is that Biden has nice words and bad deeds and Trump has bad words and good deeds. So he's good with the economy. He had the oper um, um, Operation Warp Speed, where he expedited the jab in um, record time, where it would ordinarily have been years going through FDA approval, and loads of people would have died. And he wasn't mandating people had to use it. And so if they choose to, you know, if they think they're at risk and they want to use it and they take the jab and it's not good for them, well, they have the option to not take the jab. And then Biden gets in and he made out he was responsible for the, the jab. He rewrites history. I don't think people remember that. He was making out that the jab was all his doing and then um they actually one of the um pharma firms i think it was moderna had the jab available two weeks before the election they could have deployed it and the guy from moderna said i wasn't about to give credit to trump by releasing it so i waited until the election was over so that it would be you know uh, most likely be biden that would get the prize of look, I am giving everyone the jab, right? And I thought, fuck you. How many people died in that two weeks if by delaying it, right? How many died because you delayed it? Why isn't that person in prison, the boss of Moderna? How unconscionable it is. Because it affected the outcome of the election, along with loads of other things.
you know, along with social media suppressing the Hunter Biden laptop story, where you couldn't even send a direct message saying, look, you need to read the uh, article that's in the New York Post, uh, a newspaper that's the oldest newspaper in America, and it doesn't even get to tweet because Jack Dorsey is like, no, can't have that on there because he's been told by the FBI it's Russian disinformation and the FBI were told that by the CIA and the CIA say we've got all these people who are claiming that we their sources are reliable sources of this information and they were all in on the whole conspiracy which was a conspiracy where they were trying to um, suppress the dissemination of the uh, scoop of the century the most important story that there's been um, in recent years, which is um, you know, the, the presidential candidate for the, the Democrats was corrupt and was being paid money by Ukraine and China and like was unfit to be even in the running. And they knew that during the primaries, they knew that in 2019 and they could have, if they were sensible, said, you can't be running. And they would take them out the, the uh, list of candidates and there would have been someone else that would have been um, standing uh, in his place. Now, who would it have been? I don't know. It could, have, if you eliminate all the people that were eliminated, right? You say that Tulsi Gabbard effectively, I think they wanted to have Kamala Harris. I think Obama's choice was Kamala Harris and what happened was Tulsi Gabbard came along and she so ruined um, Kamala Harris on stage by talking about all the things she did wrong while she was Attorney General of California that Kamala Harris had to bow out of the race for the primary. Then the DNC is so angry with Tulsi Gabbard that even though she's got all the votes to continue to the next town hall she's yanked from that for no legitimate reason so it's not the democrat party isn't democratic andrew yang is in the town hall and they have like a problem with his microphone and it's like there are a lot of people there and it gets to him to say something he would have been talking about ubi and his microphone doesn't work and they don't come back to him to say well we fixed the microphone now you get to speak it's like no he's like he's not in the picture so that was a deliberate rig okay uh mark um pete budgigeg had an app which was um that was the app that was being developed that was used to do the voting by the democrats in the primaries was developed by his company and there was suspicion that he had rigged it so that he'd do better in the app all right i can't prove that but it's damn suspicious. The um, Bernie Sanders is a known communist. Um, he had grassroots support from uh, students because he's making up he would have uh, loan forgiveness, and that makes sense. Okay. Then you have um, the attitude of the DNC to Sanders, who was the front runner, I think, at one time. Um, because of all his grassroots support. And Biden was like fifth on the list, if I recall from memory. Um, uh, Sanders should have like won it, but like the DNC were like saying, we can't have him and he's too hardcore communist. And so, and it was too principled, too, um, in a way it's too statesmanlike. So it would like not make sense to have him. So, they wanted someone that they could manipulate. They wanted someone who would be with the program that would have been Kamala Harris a, a daily. And um, AOC is too young. She needs to be 35 to be able to be a candidate. Otherwise, they wouldn't have her. Um, and then you've got, oh, Elizabeth Warren. And I was thinking about it, I was thinking, if it hadn't have been what came out, could it have been Elizabeth Warren? And I'm thinking, probably, probably. 
So they still would have had the election be unconstitutional, but if the in an alternative scenario where the laptop um, isn't suppressed because the FBI and CIA uh, are not corrupt, not um, gaslighting uh, all social media into thinking it's Russian disinformation, and then people on Twitter find out that it is that the um, well, no, wait a minute. Before it even gets that, you don't need to have a scandal about the Bidens because Joe Biden would have been quietly spoken to and said, "Look, we know this about you. This can come out and it can damage your legacy, or you can retire." Right? It's really incredibly serious, and you you are technically a traitor. We can make that all go away, but you've got to go away. You've got to retire. He's already really old. He is only doing the job as a favor to Obama because Tol uh, Tulsi has forced Kamala to drop out. Other than that, it would be like, why is he even there? Aren't you too old for the job? So, um, Obama makes a statement about wanted to run for third term and being able to do it through um doing it through his basement um i don't know if i can find that um Doesn't seem to be the thing. It's hard to find this stuff. I don't know quite what to type in. It's like he's saying something about not running for a third term, but he's talking about behind the scenes or something. I might be this. Puppet regime. There we go. And what you know now, do you wish like you had a, sec a, a third term? Um, and I, I used to say, you know what? If, if I could make an arrangement where um, I had, a, I had a, a stand in, a front man or front woman, and, and they had an earpiece in, and I was just in my basement in my sweats mm -hmm. looking through the stuff and then i could sort of deliver the lines but somebody else was uh doing all the talking and ceremony oh. I, i'd be fine with that yeah found it so yeah what do you think is going on there right i mean and what do you think is going to happen when let's say may going to say may of this year is it going to be that we're going to get Michael? Are we going to get Michael in May? Uh, possibly. People are talking about that now. That we're going to get Michael in May. And um, they're going to swap out Joe for Michael. And um, are they going to be brazen enough that when they end up either in office or on the campaign trail, which could be risky, 
that they come out? Will they come out? Interesting. It probably would be prudent if they didn't come out until they were in office. But will people feel duped if they end up with Barack Obama as first gentleman and um, Michael Obama as the president and uh, openly um, transgender, born male, and they own a they're in a gay relationship. I mean, that's that's the way things are heading because we've been having all this trans stuff for, for years now. And I've been like, why? And it's like, well, it all started under Obama. He was doing two things. He was doing identity politics and um, well, he's doing critical race theory and queer theory. Now, critical race theory I can kind of understand because if you divide the population into, you know, identity politics, in, well, I suppose identity politics covers both. But if you, you go into race and you make people um, freak out about other people having to be born... Um, you know, with different melanin content, with a different um, racial history to you, right? Because they come from a different country originally. Then, um, and that they're all immigrants in America, so it shouldn't matter. Then, is it not the case that um, by stirring that that immigrant thing, by saying like you're Italian, you're, you know, f from back from the French? be some French Americans, most of them are in Canada actually. Um, then you're gonna have some English Americans, people from England, and then you're gonna have Russian and Jews, and then you're gonna get into like the ones that aren't white. And you're gonna have the uh, Latin Americans and the Mexicans, and you're gonna have the uh, black people from lots of different places, right? Because they people who have come into America from, say, South Africa uh, after slavery, and you got the people who um, were enslaved by black people and sold to um, American slave owners during slavery. So um, you've got the descendants of them, um, um, but you've also got other people from other countries. You've got people from Mauritius, who have no, I don't think they were slaves or were enslaved, um, might be wrong about that, but there will be people who will be black in America who have no history of slavery, that's what I'm saying. There will be people who are from uh, England who are over there now. I should think John Boyega from, um, you know, The Force Awakens. He's British, he might be living in America, he might have a visa, right, to work in America, and they might say, well, you know, well, you were a slave, and it's like, no, I'm from the UK, right, so, although, well, actually, technically, we had slavery, didn't we, which we got rid of before America, so, I don't know if he descends from slaves or not, I really don't know. But there'd be somebody who could be like from a like a royal family in a, in Africa or something, and it wouldn't be anything, no taint of um, slavery to it at all. So it it will it will depend. It isn't like every black person in America is descended from slaves by any means. Um, now, uh, if you can characterize it as being as if it is like that, and you can behave characterize it and say that everyone who's white has a problem with everyone who's black and therefore everyone who's black should be paranoid of everyone who's white and um, there is baked in social injustice at an institutional level where there is systemic racism which is the claim of um, critical race theory um, then you've got a basis to uh, push forward identity 
public politics in that area. And you can make essentially an argument that people should be racist towards white people because they're the oppressors, which is a Marxist narrative. And then the BLM movement, which was run by Patrice Carl Cullors, uh, she is a, a she is a, an avowed Marxist. She said so. Um, and so the, the stuff that comes out of the universities is, is um, the theories of critical race theory and all of that going back a while um, have all been due to uh, Marxism and um, I suppose you might look at Antonio Gramsci's prison diaries as being an important part on that it's not it's not just straightforward marxism it's more complicated than that and then you have to kind of work through the whole thing so if you want to know more about this you would want to watch um james lindsay um new discourses um channel on on that to understand more about what's happening in america in terms of critical race theory and then he's done videos on Gail Rubin and queer theory. And that's another part of the whole identity politics thing, which is a good way of describing it. Because you could say identity politics is a better term than woke. The term woke actually has a, um, it actually comes from a song. And the song is um i might not be able to find it now um it's to do with the um people who unfairly tried for um a crime and i think hanged and um um it came from a song um lead belly yeah so this guy, he he made the song, and uh, at the end of the song, spoken, uh, he says something about stay woke. Um, and the subject of the song is um, but he did keep getting arrested. Um, Uh, let's see. Um, possibly the earliest audio recording of the phrase Lead Belly urged black listeners to stay woke in the spoken afterward to a 1938 recording of his song Scottsboro for Boys, which tells the story of nine black teenagers and young men falsely accused of raping two white women in Alabama. Um, and it dealt with the racism and the right to a fair trial and the cases included a lynch bob uh, before the suspects had been indicted etc etc so uh they went that there was trouble in alabama and he's like saying you know um so i advise everybody be a little careful when going on there best to stay woke keep their eyes open right um and so when you use the word woke to disparage um, what this movement is in America at the moment of critical race theory and queer theory, it's inaccurate and it uh, takes away from something which was perfectly fine. And there's been a, a hashtag where they've been trying to recover the word um, in its original meaning and how it was meant to be there are lynch mobs and you need to watch out for lynch mobs. And it's archaic, but it's also, um, you know, saying woke is, um, it, isn't a, it isn't a bad, it isn't meaning that you it understand the situation. Now, I don't know if we've got the song here. Um, I don't think we've got the song, have we?
Scottsboro boys. I might not have the audio for this. 1938 recording of Scottsboro boys. We'll try that on Google, see if we can find it. Journey of a, war, of a word. Um, found on the folk recording. So it was, I think this is probably be all right. Um, oh, we've got a sign in, have we? No, can't play it. And anyway, it's BBC, so I might get into trouble because I've got a license. Um, so much for the national broadcaster. Um, what about this? Have we got it on YouTube? No, I think the Saxborough boys and uh, tell something about how you. Uh... <laughs> It's not won't, it's stay woke. Right? So careful when they go along through that, but stay woke, keep the eyes open. When they go through that, when they go through Alabama, stay woke. Keep the keep their eyes open. Right? So that's the origin of woke. And um I think I posted it here. No, not that. Copy. Right, so that's the um, um, it's being woke to racial prejudice, and um, it isn't the woke that it is now where a um it the what it is now is a fake victim mentality so modern woke um based on identity politics now because Identity politics is the generator of that phenomena. You can pare it down to say woke is identity politics. 
or woke comes out of identity politics, right? So if you want to say, well, what is woke? Without identity politics, there wouldn't be woke. So you just say the problem is not woke. The problem is identity politics. Because if you eliminate identity politics, you obviously eliminate the products of identity politics, right? Which means that you just tackle identity politics. And by doing that, it's it's um, it gets away from this whole conflict between that and the original term of stay woke, right? And um, I unfortunately, I see a lot of people, Ben Shapiro, all sorts of things all like that, using the word woke, um Douglas Murray says woke um and he uses it in this modern term and um uh, I know that words in in English um take on new meanings and you have multiple definitions but this is different from like you know the Cambridge dictionary having a secondary definition for woman which is man it's it is um, something where you shouldn't use the N word with a hard ER uh, because of there having been slavery. And I think it's not much of a of a restriction on your free speech to just say, oh, fuck it, you just don't do it. Say one word because you are white. And actually, it's not a good idea that black people say that word either. And the only exceptions to saying... Um, the N word with a hard ER is uh, maybe in a historical drama, right? So something like the, what is it, the Quentin Tarantino film with um, uh, Samuel L. Jackson? It gets said in there. And I think I've not seen it, but I think Leonardo DiCaprio says it, and it's like, well, they would do in the film because it's set in the time of a plantation owner with slaves, right? So they were horrible people who were um, reducing, um, you know, those human beings to being uh, subhuman. And uh, they had this word to characterize that, which was the N word with the hard ER. So um, let's not, you know, trigger people by using that word. The people we're trying to avoid triggering are people who have historically suffered from slavery and it's so heinous that probably we shouldn't be doing that. Now, um, are there other words that are like that? Um, possibly, um, there might be words that we want to avoid in connection to the Jews that would be slurs. Uh, there's one that begins with K, K and I won't say what it is. Um, so maybe, um, but you know, and there's been a, a potato famine in, in Ireland, so maybe the things that we say about the Irish are a bit rude, but it's kind of like, it's on a diminishing scale. It's kind of like slavery, uh, the shower, and the potato famine, and it's kind of like it's starting to find that there isn't that much left to uh, have as like sensitive pe words that you kind of like might want to take out of your vocabulary. And there's always other words you can use. Um, so I don't see that there's that much of a restriction. Um, so I think that people who are like very adamant about free speech and say, I definitely, absolutely, as a white person, want to be able to say every word, and they make a big deal out of it, or they all feel pleased and empowered when they get a black friend to give them what they call the N-word pass. I'm like, well, that black friend is not a proper, you know, black person, and they could probably get in trouble with other serious-minded black people for what you've just done there. Because it's worse than you just tolerating this person saying it around you. The fact that they explicitly, Jay Longbone from EFAP, explicitly gave rags the n-word pass and then he started saying it again and again and again like he'd been given you know a bone to play with um i i just that was right it was him 
it wasn't the um, the Son of Wolf. Can't remember. But it's one of them, and it's like to go back over and show show the evidence. I don't want to have the word on the stream to show the evidence, so it will be buried within days of, and days of EFAP. Every frame of pause, a podcast from Mauler. And um, it's disgusting. And because that's in there early on in their um, show, they ended up, because they were trying to be like the drunken peasants. That's who they're modeling themselves after. And they're horrible people. And they didn't need to be like that. They could be their own thing. But they hadn't got an original idea in their head. So they just thought we'll be controversial and we'll be doing that. And uh, they're supposed to be, I mean, they're called EFAP, and they took that name, again, an original, from Every Frame of Painting, which is a movie review uh, podcast, and they wanted to call theirs same letters, but it stands for Every Frame of Pause, and that means that they go through a video and they keep pausing it and they keep talking at length. So in a way, what I'm doing here is a bit like that, but with Geometric Unity because they'll go off on a very long tangent and then a tangent to a tangent and tangent to a tangent. But it will also be a panel discussion. But they'll talk for like 10 hours, 11 hours, sometimes longer. And I've been doing it and I've been doing, you know, um, a 12 hour stream quite regularly. And um, they can only seem to manage it once a week. So I don't know what their problem is. They seem to be lightweights. Um, so, yeah. Um, and he's supposed to be doing a video where he is, like, critiquing The Force Awakens. And I was making a response to his video of his critique of The Force Awakens. And my response ended up being something like, I can't remember, 12 days long. And um, like 12 times 12 hour long responses. No, hold on a minute. It would be, no, it would be more than that, wouldn't it? It would be 12 times 24. It, it was a lot of videos. And the videos on my channel were and um, we go uh, uncompetitive uh, critiques more then what we have is me with shorter hair and that me saying that the main problem with um, Star Wars is this guy and people don't even talk about him and he's the reason why the films are terrible and he was the original screenwriter of The Force Awakens. He's the one who said, let's not have Luke in the movie. Okay, so that is what fucked up Star Wars more than anything else. And um, and we've got, how long is this? 25 videos and um, So I was waiting for him to finish his uh, Force Awakens critique, and he is up to episode four of six for his critique. So he's still got to do another two episodes. So that's them on the um, the group there and that's a, what they all look like and then um i don't know some of them won't play i don't think because i had a copyright strike on it because they used three seconds of the Wars wagons to prove that ray wasn't um a mary sue because she nearly gets her head blown off at one point and i thought just show the bit where she nearly gets her head blown off and um it it was a 12 hour video and then it was like, no, you can't show this anymore because of this. I got suspended for three months 
on on YouTube. So it's like ridiculous. Um, but there you are. You know, trying to make a a video that kind of helps them out a bit by saying, look, you know, everyone's wrong to say that rains are very soon. Um, at the time that you know I made the video, it was the case, and then they made um, the rise of Skywalker, and she definitely was a Mary Sue in every conceivable respect, including coming back from the dead. So um, yeah, it's like uh, yeah, she's she's a Mary Sue now, um, unless and there is this other interpretation is that Ray is actually evil. So if she's evil, she can't be Mary Sue. So it's possible that she's evil. So um, now if they did that with the propose, they're proposing to do an episode 10 with Daisy Ridley, that would, I think, would be the right way of taking it and making her evil, right? So we'll see. Uh, but I doubt, I doubt they'll do it. Um, they're going to make her just as bland and uninteresting as they have up to now. And they need to make a kind of, you know, more like Mia Sara in, um, in, I mean, she's playing a good character that's in, in with kind of the devil. But they need to be making her more like she was in the uh, Rise of Skywalker, Skywalker, because she has the pointed teeth and she's like a, a, a vision of her future self. And she's like a dark ray or whatever, you know. So... Um, or Darth Ray. So I don't think Mauler has done a, another uh, Force Awakens. Oh, it says part five. Let's see. Is there a part five? When does that come out? If he's done another one, I might have to see about responding to this. Um, no, it's done four. It's done four. There's introduction, part two, part three, part four. I've covered all of these, and I haven't even started on these because I thought, well, I'll wait for him to finish his Force Awakens critique, and then I can cover the Last Jedi critique. And he's not done it. I don't know why. I don't know why he's not. I don't know why he's so lazy. He's, he's, it, this is five years ago. He made one video that's like a, a covering the Force Awakens. And it's like, how is it you're taking this long to actually make the video? It works out. It takes him more. Well, it's slowing down, isn't it? Because it's a year between episodes there. And then it's like two years there. So is it going to be three years? from that one, which would mean that if that was a year ago, there's a two year interval there, three year interval here, then it would be um, in, a, in another two years, we get part five. Is that what we should expect? A bit pathetic really. And he's getting Patreon money and um, all sorts of things for people subscribing to his channel for these videos and he's just not getting on to make the next one but he gets the money every three months from his subscribers so that they get presumably to see the videos early or something it's like okay whatever so um back to this i appreciate but you have to understand people get into this argument over darwinism because they're afraid of its implication sure, god yes okay I have a different problem, which is that in general, when physics isn't moving, people aren't getting more adventurous as to who they're listening to. They're staying with the same popes. Sure. So I could turn to Karl Popper. Yeah. Or I could turn to Ludacris. And I don't know whether you're familiar with the lyrics to the song, Get Out of the Way. Of course. Okay. So my feeling is. I think you can say them for my audience who may be somewhat less familiar. I'm an old guy. I can't remember the lyrics exactly. However, my feeling is strongly that we should be following Ludacris rather than Karl Popper because I don't have time for this. No, you do have time for it for the following reason, that it's a time saver. Now, we are wasting time here, but then right. let's not. Well, let's not, but right. I, my point is you've got suitors in the manor to string the bow. 
String the fucking bow. String the, the bow. Point. But stringing the bow Talk involves the saying, hey, you string theorists, you uh -huh. have an interpretation. You're not theorists. Um, there was a guy named Julian Schwinger who was Feynman's rival and came up with his version of what we call renormalization theory to get answers out of quantum electrodynamics. And he had an epigram for a book that he had to write because nobody was taking him seriously. And the epigram was, if you can't join them, beat them, beat them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my feeling is, is that I could spend the rest of my life trying to get their attention and saying, oh, pretty please listen to this thing that I've got. I'm also just sick of them. I mean, I'm just, I'm sick of the critique. I'm sick of the discussions. I'm sick of the same people getting trotted out over and over again. I'm bored. Sure. And we're all bored. Yep. So my feeling is let's do non-boring things. Right. But your work, okay? I still don't get it. We will get there, okay. hopefully. But your work, in the end, will predict things in the phys physical universe that will allow us to tell whether or not you got it right. Oh, yeah. But when you say you got it right, um, the most important person in this regard, it's not Karl Popper, um, is probably Dirac in his 1963 Scientific American article where he specifically points to the instantiation of the theory, which is effectively not only the suit, but how it has been tailored. Okay. So you can have a suit that has been mistailored and it will not agree with the experiment the way the suit will not fit the person who's intended to wear it. On the other hand, that doesn't tell you anything much about the suit. It tells you about the tailor. So when you have an invalidation, Part of the problem is, is that you've invalidated the instance oh. rather than the class. Believe me, for one thing, one of the reasons that I spend time in philosophy of science land is that I believe that all of the things that we learned from the simpler fields do not apply well to biology because the complexity causes you to falsify true things on the basis that that complexity always provides edge cases which don't agree. And so if you take a very narrow Popperian view you constantly think things that are actually true are false. And this actually dovetails well with Popper himself, who initially was not a fan of adaptive thinking. Well, and he can about strong comparison you know, misreadings of Popper. But again, my point is, you are in a luxurious position, let's say, with your telomere theory and with the trade-offs okay. and the instantiation um, of uh, antagonistic pleiotropy, as we discussed in episode 19. I think is, we're getting to... The point is, okay, I just predicted something from first principles inside of molecular biology right. using only evolutionary arguments, Okay, so F you. It's mm -hmm. still on right. the subject. Right, exactly. F you is fun. Because it doesn't, is fun. It, I don't love having another philosophy of science I'd rather mm. talk about, do we have the ability to validate, to explore, to refine? And again, you know, I want, I talk around science all the time. Either we're talking about pedagogy, we're talking about what is it good for in technology, we're talking about does it play by the rules, we're talking, we're talking about everything other than the mind-bending, gut-wrenching, life-affirming, soul-elevating stuff that'll get you high as a kite. So I would rather spend time on like the majesty of the world than talking about some goddamn philosopher of science and whether or not I dotted my eyes and crossed my teeth. Totally. All right. There's two points I want to make here. One in support and one against. So first of all, I want to open up a new tab and I want to talk about Murray Gellman. And the second one, I want to talk about string theory and how string theory is a theory, but not of physics. So how are we going to remember to do this? Um, we'll put it in the chat. I think we're going to go Gellman and... Uh, Quark zoo, and then it's going to be the uh, Penrose string math. Okay, now what we have in the chat before we get to this is um, let's see. 
I can't write it in the chat, the chat, the answers, because I've got to remind myself where I'm going next. Um, and I know I've gone completely off track from what I was talking about with algebraic topology. Um, better answers related to the technical details of geometric unity, since it's not resting only on the basic knowledge base, but instead can search details from the given material. Rigo, I have a question. Um, what is that question? Uh, please do some stream about geometric unity topic in future too. It has been helpful on studying the theory along with this slow research pace, refreshing inception from the information filled quick video videos available. I have got to reading that before. Um, the thing with this is I'm planning on moving away from this whole topic because I think it's about as far as I can get myself. As I was saying before, there's always more to know. And so like, if you to say, oh, you don't know enough, you need to know more about quantum field theory, you need to know all of um, general relativity to be able to um, be able to understand, you know, what's going on and be able to properly explain it all. Um, I made a list uh, where is it? Well, I made a list which was this, and I made a list with prerequisites. And this is the minimal academic prerequisites um, that I think is needed to um, deal with this topic properly. Okay. And this came about through reading the paper and reverse engineering what the dependencies were looking at the lecture and yes that's that's the same and then i went to the portal podcast um uh, discord and uh said hi and they posted this image and it was like uh, all these books and there were like 18 books and there were like books on algebra topology and um uh, gauge theory and group theory and uh lead groups and um the einstein field equations and partial differential equations and differential geometry and that sort of thing and it's like there are 18 of these things and they were like at least 200 pages each if not 300 pages each and um i thought it was kind of a bit crazy the amount that they wanted you to read. And it was like, read this, then this, then this, then this. Now, when it came up on um, Let's Friedman, um, there was a, Let's Friedman was like saying, what do I need to know in order to better appreciate the unity? This might be something people are aware that was said. Um, they're watching this. He said that you should read this book. And this book is like more than a thousand pages long. So he said that you need that and you need to look at a, you need to visit like a pilgrimage, a uh, relief sculpture that was commissioned, I think, by Jim Simons of Churn Simons uh, Theory fame. And um, this is just an inscription on a wall, a bit of chiseling, like my father, who's a sculptor. Not a sculptor, was a sculptor would have been able to do. And um, um, this um, chiseled design is of um, the fundamental laws of physics. It's got like um, Dirac equation on there, things like that. And he's saying, you know, this is like your fundamental, you know, this is what you should not leave home without, right? And um, the book is that uh, fully explains how to put those um, gadgets together. And um, <clears throat> what was the other thing? He had a third thing. It was the, the graph wall tone. Oh, the graph. We cover the graph in um, what we have here. So we've got the graph and the graph is um this that's the graph if one wants to summarize our knowledge of physics in the briefest possible terms that are really three fundamental observations space time is a pseudo-romanian manifold m 
endowed with the metric tensor and governed by geometrical, geometrical laws. So that was one of three things that Eric was saying to Let's Friedman. And in subsequent podcasts, Let's Friedman has said that he's reading up on algebraic topology. And I'm like, oh no, you don't really need to know that. You, you know, me doing this and me saying that's the minimal academic prerequisites, that's what you're meant to think are the are, are what you have to know in order to understand geometric unity. And the way I'm doing this is a it's beyond an intermediate level, but I'm a layman, so I'm not in a position to like uh, tell you things that are necessarily even correct. There's lots that I'm going to be saying here that isn't necessarily correct. All I can do is I can say, you know, things like spinners, and I can kind of bring up a video about spinners and sort of say, have you noticed this? So like on that subject, for example, there was a video I had that was, where was it? Um, here, this, this screen. So Clifford Algebras from the book on... Um, that is mentioned within the lecture, uh, not in the lecture, in the, when he talked about the ship in the bottle operator, he mentions this book by F. Reese Harvey, and the, the paper is saying, um, put that book over there, don't need this no more, we need to have the paper, where's the paper gone? The paper will be on the screen somewhere, here. So where he's talking about that one is like one, two, three, four, five, six tab in. We want to have the um, mm, we want to have the section on the Okay, it doesn't look like I've got the section on the Shia because I thought I covered it enough the other day. So we're going to put it in again here, the new tab. The Shia operator seems to be the thing that people are most interested in because it's like, um, this is U128 there. So that's like an important page. So we're going to give that out into the chat because... Um, I don't want to forget it later. Page 22. Okay, we're going to open up another tab. And um, I think I accidentally deleted some tabs last time I was streaming. That would have been one of them. And I need to go to that eight, which would be about here. Nearly there. It's not, I'm nearly close to it. That's how good I am at knowing my way around the paper. I click in the scroll bar and I'm there. Um, so um, we go. There is most likely a Byzantine taxonomy of such objects along the lines of what Rhys Harvey detailed for the Clifford algebras in his book, Spinners and Calibrations. Right? So in this book, there are a couple of sections which of interest, and the bit of, of interest here would be here with the black blob, the black, black square at the bottom of the section on page 191. And it says here, uh, the Clifford algebra that's complexified of N is equal to the Clifford algebra of R, comma, S, uh, vector product of the reals with the complex numbers. And so what that says is that you can take um, uh, something like, um, I think it would be something like spin six comma four, and you can do a possibly a double cover of a frame bum bundle of it in order to make it into Dirac spinners. Now, what's it say proposition? Let R denote conjugation. No, it's not, that's a script R. Right. 
on this. This is an isomorphism. Proposition 9.76, that R denote conjugation or the reality operator on CRS, uh, which is equivalent to this down here, R of RS um, with the vector product of in the reals of with the complex numbers. So that means that it would be taking um, that structure and it would just be making it complexified, I think. That's all it means. Uh, the complexification of RS. Yeah, so they just said what that just did, which I just read as math. They're saying it's the complexification of RS. That complexification looks like this here, which is the... I can't do the blob, I can only do that with a circle because I've only got the degree sign. But this is something apparently um, Eric wrote on the blackboard and this is one of the criticisms from the critic and he said that wasn't um, correct mathematics and Eric in the Joe Rogan podcast uh, said that it was a legitimate criticism. But it was something he would have brought up anyway. So this would be a correct mathematical statement to say there is no isomorphic, sorry, there's no isomorphic relationship between these two things. Where that's not degree, that would be a blob. And then uh, the way to get around it so that they are in an isomorphic relationship is to complexify both sides. So that is essentially the same notation as this, except instead of P, um, it would be written out as, in the book, it'd be written out as R comma S. And that would be um, the principal fiber bundle of um, P. And then uh, U over here would be the space that has the characteristics of being um, a 14 dimensional space in this case and um, U uh, in the lecture is is Y um, in the paper and so um, I suppose what you do if you really want to take it that way you go Y77 wouldn't you so you go um, you do this and you go 77 and then you go that, and you go back into complexification, and you go here. So is that what's going on with this? Is that the um, adjoint of whatever RS would be is equal to the, um, when complexified, is equal to the exterior product of the, I don't know what the dot does, Hold on, have a look. It says here, I've written out what it does. The adjoint of the principal bundle is not isomorphic to the exterior algebra to the cotangent bundle of the observers. So that's what that means. So if you translate all the, that mathematical language, that's what that means. And that should be filled in and be a, that should be a blob. So the, the exterior uh, algebra of a cotangent bundle. That's a cotangent bundle. The the tangent um, would be T and the T star would be the cotangent bundle. And it's like hinged at right angles to the tangent, I think. And so I don't know what that does. Um, I might have missed something out. There might be some extra wrinkle to it there that I've not put in because it's not established what this is and he doesn't explain it in the paper what notation he's using. He just uses it. And it's not in a lecture because he misrepresents Eric's work by using this notation. He could have used the notation that was on the blackboard and then said there was something wrong with it. But instead... He changes the notation to something completely alien, doesn't explain it, and then goes off and says it's wrong. Okay? 
Now, you could say that's problematic, or you could say, well, you need to get a book on um, gauge theory and learn up on what the block means, right? Exactly. Okay. I'm not. I'm not voicing an opinion on that part. I'm just saying it's like what I would say there is that one could be forgiven for thinking he was obfuscating things so that people would not be able to tell what it was that he was doing in his slipshod um, criticism of some work which he had mischaracterized as being something other than what it was because he might even be aware that it was okay and had thought well other people won't necessarily pick up on these salient information like the, the say that the fermionic field complex has a, a slide that looks like this which means it's u6464 which means it is uh, a non coupled gauge group of wild spinners and this is in the lecture and we can find this um, on the on the screen we're on now by being here and this is the actual slide and it has it there on the left there a spin 146464 and this is a bit hard to read you might say well if it was in the lecture and it's in the video and it's like how would you have told what that looked like you know in the in the video and the video would look like literally like this i put on the video now we start doing something different we make an accusation one of our generations isn't a regular generation you got the 64 there that's that pretty obvious energy, right in a cooled state potentially it looks just the same as these other generations but were we somehow able to turn up the energy imagine that it would unify differently with this new matter that we've positive rather than simply unifying onto itself so two of the okay so now he's saying about temperature so it could be that it's not a question of the um the dark matter stuff is elsewhere in the observers on the on the fiber it could be possibly that it's a question of temperature of the universe and at unification energies it was uh, closer to the big bang um it would have been that um it was more of a patchy salam model and then as it cooled down it underwent spontaneous symmetry breaking and then ended up being the standard model so there is dark matter out there um and the the cooler parts of the world that we live in and experiments we do with the parts and the remnants of the material we have to work with which isn't rare exotic rurita springer spin three over two matter because it's not available to us if you haven't got it in the lab we're looking at all the stuff we've got and we're saying this is it and we're, we're trying to make things make sense and it's like well it's kind of like um, um, it's kind of like we've got a um, a puzzle, and we are where's the puzzle? It's kind of like we've got a puzzle, and we we only have some of the pieces, and so um, we're we're stuck in you know four dimensions. We're in a 14 dimensional observers that might be contributing to the problem, but it's also a cold universe that's old rather than one that's young and hot. And so things could have been very different from when it was young and hot. It could be like we're almost like an unrecognizable person to how we were when we were young. And so, um, you know, we could have been liberal when we were young at college and all Marxist, and now we're all we're all conservative and voting Republican, right? So people change, and so um, the universe, in the same sense, could be like that, and so it could have been all radical um, and had all these things like the richer Schwinger matter um, uh, in abundance, and 
in unification with parity in evidence um, in a Patti Salam model, and then it undergoes uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, um, where that mathematical model still holds true, but the effective um, model that is operating at the energies and the temperatures that the um, universe is now at is only described by this partial theory that's like locks together like this and there's all these other things won't fit with this because you can't get them together because you need to have the unification energies for them to all go back as they were at the point of the big bang so only if you could get your accelerator up to the full power of the big bang and they've got it close but not quite there then it might be that you get to have the patty salam model out of the accelerator and it's a grand unified theory and it's like it's got the chirality and so on and so forth and it's like oh right like, so we we're like in a russian doll where we're like in a inner part of a simpler doll nested within another greater doll and we see this is the whole thing but actually there's a big puzzle outside of ourselves that were we to put ourselves and fit ourselves into that puzzle it will all make so much more sense and the the parity that we would then have would then mean that we would have you know for the stuff that was left-handed and the stuff that was um you know uh right-handed we then find that the stuff that was right-handed wasn't sort of missing bits it would have a complete set that would match the stuff on the left and it'll be like oh okay that's a bit better that's a bit neater that's a bit more elegant and in terms of coming back to the notion of like describing this as a program describing this as a sort of computer simulation uh, not as saying that the universe itself is a simulation, but saying that if you were to write a game where you're trying to say, I want the simplest way of making a planet or something with a universe that's kind of like, you're not going to explore space, you're just going to be having um, kind of real found strategy game on the surface of a planet where you can go around the back and go around the continents and invade countries from from behind, right? You're not like chess, where you're both on one side of a table and uh, you fight in the middle. You were able to go around the chessboard and hit, fight them from the back, right? So it's chess on a torus or chess on a sphere. And um, this uh, game would be based in, like it would be like a civilization type game. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but there's games where you can kind of be Cleopatra and Marcus Aurelius and, and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, try to build the library of Alexandria and have achievements like that for your civilization. Um, and there's all these sorts of things you could do. It, it, it would mean it would incorporate things like um, diplomacy. And the purpose of that would be that you would be trying to build relationships with uh, neighboring countries so that there was peace. And that way you'd be able to use the time uh, of peace to be able to build up uh, your arsenal for the next war, right? Um, because ultimately it would uh, degenerate into war. It would be inevitable. And um, there would be a pace between the times of calm, so to speak, or rather cold war and spies and intrigue and personal drama and diplomacy and that kind of thing. Even romance, people trying to like, you know, Caesar trying to marry Cleopatra and that sort of thing. That would be one thing. And then you'd get into um, the war stuff and the war stuff would get sort of super exciting and, and um, be very kind of, heroic and um, intense and focused. And it also be, you know, um, horrific and um, you know, scary. And, you know, it would have like a whole range of emotions as well, right? So you, you kind of want 
kind of war, but not just like Call of Duty, start the game, you're in a war, fight fight the battle over flags on a map. Where it's like, well, why are we fighting over A, B, and C? You want it to be about more than that, right? Now, I'm not criticizing Call of Duty because I play it a lot and it's very good, but I'm just saying that if it was able to be about more, that would be better, right? I don't like the whole thing about having a big map and it being a shrinking ring and it goes to an arbitrary location on the map where it all shrinks together and they all everyone kills each other until there's two people left and then that one person kills the other person and then it's like that person wins. And that kind of battle royale is like consuming everyone's focus as being like that's the game to play. I'm not interested in that. I don't think it's very good. I see that big map, and I don't want it getting smaller. I want, in a way, the map to get bigger. You know, I want the map to be the whole Earth, um, even though that's, like, impractical um, with modern technology. You'd have to change software in order to make it viable. You'd have to do it all by procedural generation, basically. Um, but it would be possible to do and that's what I plan on doing. I plan on making um, a game of that scope, which goes beyond just being on a planet to being a star system, to being um, multiple star systems and galactic conquest, right? That's how big it's going to be. It's going to be one galaxy, and it's going to be a galactic conquest game with 11 civilizations, which are going to be alien civilizations. So I've got to do the law and how they all look and everything and how the whole thing work. And the content for the game is going to be like two years to do all that. And so I've got to have much more better production tools for making that that content during production phase. And I estimate it, I should be able to do, um, in terms of writing story and all the stuff that's going to be working on that level, um, it should take me a day to make a planet and most of the planets are just going to be like um these are planets that have got um flora on some of those we're going to have fauna on so that's going to be a smaller amount of planets that will have the fauna on and there'll be biomes and then there'll be lots of different um, versions of different evolved things. So if you have a fox, you'll have an urban fox, an arctic fox, and um, a desert fox and so forth, right? So the same kind of fox, but differently adapted to different biomes. And then you'd have um, a different planet and you couldn't have a fox on the other planet. It wouldn't have evolved and be the same. So you don't go somewhere else and find out, oh, it also has a giraffe, or it also has a rhinoceros. It's no good. You have to go somewhere else, and it has to be different enough for that to change evolution so that the things that evolve there are obviously different. And that's going to be tricky. So that won't be, there probably won't be that many plants that got animals on, and it might be like 50 tops right? That might be a high number. So it'd be like 10% of the plants that have got life on have, have animal life on. And most of those ones out of the 50 would probably won't even have land animals on and will have um, fish, okay? So like I'll phone it in with the fish because the fish are kind of like, they can look kind of similar to each other because most fish are quite very unusual looking in their shapes, but they're all broadly speaking the same kind of thing. So you could probably get away with kind of different colored fish, different kind of you know patterns on them and have that be the variable and then have that parameterized differently over these different planets. And that way you get to have more planets have got life on them, but that's oceanic life, right? Um, so that that's, Creating all the animals for the planets is difficult. And when I originally conceived the idea, I didn't even think of doing animals. I was going to have people, I was going to have weapons, I was going to have, you know, tanks and stuff. 
I was going to have spaceships. And I thought, right, okay, that seems to be everything. And then No Man's Sky came out in 2016 with this, um, was it 2016 or was it earlier? They had a, a they had a stream for uh, the VGX Awards and it was, I'll show you what I mean. Um, the, um, VGX, um, I can't remember what year it was. No Man's Sky. 2013. Okay. So um, this is where they did the debut. And um, yeah, so I don't know where we'll be with the audio on this. I'll turn the audio off, I think. So where were we here? But we might get into it where it's like um we might get into trouble with the um audio on this Now, when it says every planet unexplored, that's not quite true because the aliens that inhabit the galaxy have already colonized every planet you go to. So you go to a planet you'd like to explore and discover and you find it's got buildings on it. So that's kind of a mistake. They should have made it so that they have it have colonies on some um, planets, but not all planets. Um, so you walk around, you um, step into your spaceship, and um, this is what the game's really like. And you can just go continuously into, into the air. You're thinking, okay, fine, you can take off. And then you can punch through the atmosphere. And then there'll be a space station there and there's got seamless um ground to space transitions uh, you can make holes in asteroids and fly through them that's not in the game um that they, they lost their work uh because there's a flood at their offices and they had to start all over again um so anyway, so that's that game. And um, they had to cut back on some of the things they had said they were going to do at launch. And then uh, they made up for it uh, subsequently and they put everything into it that had ever been promised and more. Um, although at the point it was sold, the things it was describing it would do were what it was doing at launch. So there's another video on my channel about how, um, you know, they didn't lie about the game when it was launched. Um, so this um, has, has got like multiplayer and virtual reality now and all manner of other things and story and um, it's a it's big, big uh, change, you know. That has happened to No Man's Sky has been supported a lot over the years since it's come out. So it's been 10 years, and um, um, the, at the point at which they made the game for this trailer, four people have worked on it for a year. All right? So procedural generation is like pretty close to the silver bullet of video game creation. And if you're prepared to accept that you don't have artistic control over exactly what you have, um, and you're prepared to let the computer decide to generate things, and you kind of just say, and you have a curatorial perspective, and you sort of say, well, not that, more like this. And you kind of 
it generates the stuff and you pick the things that you think you want to use uh that's all right in my view but the way they did this that they got it wrong was they said oh look it will generate so much stuff we'll have the lot and so as a result it's two to the power of 64 minus one planets which is 18 quintillion planets and it's that number because that's the largest number you can do on the computer on the on the 64-bit processors of the consoles and the pc it's like how big can we go it's like we can go as big as we can and it's like let's do that then and i thought mm. they actually ended up with more planets than they're in, in the milky way in their galaxy so the no man's sky they say it's a universe but it's like well it's a universe in which there is they call it the euclid galaxy and the euclid galaxy seems to have um 18 quintillion planets in it, unless i've counted them wrong and then there's 256 galaxies in the game because once you get to the center of the galaxy spoiler alert it whisks you away and puts you in another galaxy at the outside edge of that galaxy making you start the whole process again so um they don't have a decent payoff for what happens when you get to the center which is a mistake um but we won't get into all of that and criticize it because i've i've done other videos on that i think but um it's certainly interesting and um, my idea for my game was kind of like this uh in a way but more like halo more violent more like a war game and also mixed with civilization and um you could also say city skylines where you build cities um it would be a kind of mix of those things and um there are things called battle types and they are um they're diamonds and they're clubs and there are spades and there are hearts the hearts are the socializers so if you've got something that's a massive multiplayer, real-time strategy game, first-person shooter, uh, role-playing game, the role-playing game will appeal to people as the socializers. Um, the, the diamonds were the people who collect stuff. Um, so, um, that would be more like quests and that would be more like the MMO um, uh, aspect of things like doing a raid and going on an adventure and trying to find treasure. Then you'd have the RTS aspect, which is fairly large broad scope. And that would have within it uh, a tighter focus of a FPS, which would go from anything like a kind of splinter cell type uh, stealth mission or dare sex split, uh, stealth mission to being um, like Mirror's Edge um, where you do um, run around and do parkour but you can also um, disarm people and you can also grab their guns and shoot them so it's actually has, it actually fits in the category of a first person shooter funnily enough um, you could have the game that didn't get released that are called Prey 2, that's probably closest to what I was trying to make with my game, and then it got cancelled. And that uh, Prey 2 game by Human Head Studios was what I wanted to do. So um, in terms of atmosphere. So we go Prey 2 Mashed. This is... Um, Um, we'll get a feeling for what I was going for with my game and this um, in the in the, like you know you're in alien planets and you are one of the, like they've got so much to it so big a game there would be like a role where you could be a bounty hunter there'd be one of the RPG 
role-playing game roles would be a bounty hunter and you'd be an alien bounty hunter on a planet with a seedy uh, a city, right? So imagine, um, imagine that scenario. And this is what this game was like at the time and they had it finished and then I uh, think the studio got bought and they canned it and it was done. We never got it. So um, it's in a kind of nightclub with holographic um, dancers and then um, we find a, uh, it's, um, So there's a sort of shootout going on in here. So you can um, kill people or you can uh, um, grab them and, and have them as a bounty because there's a bounty on them and send them off somewhere and just just push the guy off into space there um so i quite like parkour in games i like the whole idea of a busy multi-level um, urban environment and being able to kind of uh, platform it and slide and um uh, clamber on things and uh, I think that makes it a much more interesting space to navigate and um, it's kind of got the scope of a Grand Theft Auto except it's not you know it's not based on a real city it's not New York kind of thing you don't want to have your procedural city have to look like New York because that would be really hard because it's got to be like well how's it going to look like New York and be procedural, it wouldn't look like New York, would it? Uh, because how would you happen to have it tuned as a procedural generator so it came out looking exactly like New York? It, it would be really difficult. So, I mean, they've done Manhattan in Spider-Man 2, right? Um, there's a Spider-Man 2 video game and they put in um, Manhattan and Queens and they've got some of the buildings from there and it's pretty good um, and they have optimised it so that the buildings obviously can't go in most of the buildings and they've made it so that they are uh, kind of prompt low um kind of um, um, exteriors because you're Spider-Man you want to be able to crawl around on the outside of buildings like a spider and swing off them and that sort of thing. And it all works really well and it's already fast and how you can travel around it, it's very fluid. And so, uh, and it also looks right in the central park and there's certain landmarks. It's not perfect, but it's like good enough for you to feel that you're in Manhattan. And um, uh, I don't have the means to be able to make a game that would be of a location that would be a recognizable location so like if you um said like let's set it in venice and we'll procedurally generate venice it would be way too difficult to make venice look like venice right um you'd have to have some of it be handcrafted you know you have to have like st mark's square which is the most most likely place you visit be handcrafted and then you might say other areas of it around the Grand Canal would have to look right and then some of the other uh, residence buildings uh, would just be plopped in there and they wouldn't be as they are actually on the map right because you couldn't just do the whole thing and have every map like the, every map detail but what you could do uh, if you were prepared to have Venice, but have it be different than actual Venice in the map. And you wouldn't necessarily notice that it was wrong. Uh, that's the point, is you wouldn't necessarily notice it was wrong. Uh, 
if you've got the important things right and you've got the um other things um like phoned in then uh are not really very well done but you wouldn't you would not be that familiar with venice because you haven't have an intimate back of your hand knowledge of what it should look like um and where everything was geographically and everything then you'd have residences which would be in the style of um venetian properties right and it would be good enough and then you could have it be that well what are the interiors of these properties like and they could go off and teach it how to do procedure generated italian um um interior design and what the furniture styles would be like and what people's personal living conditions would be like and teach it that as well and make that varied enough so that it wasn't all the same interior in every one of these buildings and it would be theoretically possible for you to make it so that you could procedure generate it so that you could walk inside of any Venetian property. And that's kind of crazy, right? Because like, so in Grand Theft Auto, you've got a whole city. In Spider-Man, you've got a whole city, but you don't get to really go in the buildings, right? Unless it's like a mission and it's all part of the story. And what you could do with procedural generation is you could make it so that you could actually have it be, you get to go anywhere, absolutely anywhere. And like this, he's kind of, he's one location and it's another location, he's chasing down this, his quarry, and then it's nothing stopping him going where he wants to go. And that's the game you want to have. You want to have it so that you can, be a bounty hunter and it doesn't like oh no invisible wall oh no we didn't build that part oh no you can't open that door because that door never opens because there's nothing behind it and so these are the kind of considerations that you think about when you're playing other games to do this that have doors that never open that have things that are invisible walls that like, prevent you leaving the map and that sort of thing. You want to be able to leave the map. It looks really interesting over there. I want to go to those hills. I want to go to that mountain, right? So it might seem absurd to kind of suggest this because people like to say, what you're talking is not possible and it can't be done, right? That would be the most likely reaction you have from anyone who knew anything about programming and game design. They'd just say, this idea for a video game, which is a galaxy with 400,000 stars, 10% um, of which have star systems, and in those star systems there are 10 planets, and then those 10 planets, uh, there will be, um, of all of that, there will be uh, 500 that will be um, handcrafted by me on a rate of one a day for two years, um roughly so that they have um 50 that have life on and out of that 50 there will mainly be plant life or fish life and they will have um some within that which will have very complex ecosystems with biome with lots of different animals on them. i mean lots right and different versions of the same animal, like a fox, in lots of different biomes. And then, um, then, out of all of that, out of that 500, you're dealing with um, about a 50th of that, which is your alien civilizations. And you have to work out what the background law of them is. And some of them are no longer operational because they are ruined so there's less than 11 that are active uh, but you still got to work out about all about you know what their civilization was and where their ruins are and uh, any technology they might have left behind because they could be more advanced than civilizations that are still around and then you have uh those civilizations and you're going to have to place them 
probably closer to the center of the galaxy. Some of them might be friends with each other and be in a federation. Others might be um, isolationist and xenophobic, and um, there might be a war between those factions, and then you might not know anything about any aliens existing at all, and you're off in the, you know, say, the Western Spiral Arm of the Galaxy, and you have your um, planets, right? And the planets that you have need to be in a map, because otherwise you're not going to find them. Because you've got effectively ten percent of all the things that are, you know, in the galaxy. Ten percent of the stars have planetary systems, and there's ten planets around each uh, of those stars. Therefore, you're going to have four hundred uh, million planets. So you're going to have a needle in a haystack situation where you've got um, a game where the content of the 500 handcrafted things are spread amongst 400 million things, right? Now you've got scanners and you've got probes and all of that, and it's like hunt for the good stuff that's within the game. And it isn't just you that's doing it. It's everyone who playing the same game, because it's the same map for everyone, but it's all the result of a, a deterministic procedural function where you feed it space-time coordinates, and then that function then gives it a procedural generation of what it would find at that location. So everyone ends up seeing the same stuff. And um, what that means is that if someone goes off and finds you know, a planet with some dinosaurs walking around on it, they're like, can tell other people about it. And work can get around, this is where the dinosaur planet is. And it will be incredibly rare, because it will be like one dinosaur planet maybe out of um, 400 million uh, planets in the game. And it'll be a question of, can you find it? Um, and I might leave clues to it, right? But... Um, you know, it might be like an Easter egg that will be something that maybe no one ever find, right? And um, it won't take that long to do. It'll take me like a, a day to do that game, that 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 planet. Because what it will be is it'll be a question of specifying the parameters that make up the the creatures, and then it will be um, it will be a question of making it so that the uh, the computer generates the planet, generates the creatures on the planet, and then well, it might be like a week per uh, planet for animals, and then the other planets are maybe less so, but to do it one a day, I think it's realistic. I think I can do one a day. But it's like, it, it, it's a question of saying, I want to have 500 planets that are curated content. And that means it spews out, you know, you know, not, it could be completely unrestricted in terms of what the parameters are, or it could be I get better at knowing what parameters to give it. And then even within those parameters, it shows a diversity of content. And then I go off and say, well, you know, that's all well and good, but I think I need it to be, you know, more specific in a certain area, restrict the parameters again, generate everything again, which is why I need this expensive computer. And then I get that result and I look at it and think, yeah, okay, we've got like a table of all these planets, right? So it'd be like a bit like this, scrolling through this and I'd be looking at pictures of planets and I can tell at a glance what they're like. And as I go to the planet, I will be able to um, scroll through the planet, but I won't be scrolling through it like a document. I'll be rotating the planet and seeing it from all angles, seeing what the uh, continents look like and that sort of thing. So I won't even have to, like, you know, uh, load it up. And it wouldn't take long to navigate this interface. It would be incredibly fast. I'm going to be building my own user interface and my own operating system with my own file system, which will be RAM-based, rather than disk-based. 
it will image the stuff that's in memory back to RAM, back to disk, but it will, in operation, be in, in RAM. And most of the stuff that you deal with will be constant. So like, this is a JPEG. I can't actually work on this at the moment. It is just an image, right? If I want to work on it, I have to take it into a paint box and then I then change it in a file. But I could make a rule where the paint box is, it can't be changed. This is published. And then what I have to do is I have to copy it and then I have to copy and I get to change the copy, right? So it could be that it works that way and it works on the basis of um, that. So um, that's actually quite a good image actually for Geometry Unity um, in terms of um, summarizing this. Um, hadn't come across this for a while, so I've done this a while ago. So, um, mm. so anyway, uh, lots to say about it really, but the thing is, is that, um, I've got about four years to make this and, um, I expect to be in a beta by the time I get to 2000, what would it be? 2024 now. Yeah. So. This year I do the implementation of the programming language. Then 2025, I do the tools. And then I have 2020, end of 2027 for the uh, beta to be uh, released. And um, maybe I'll get some help uh, after that point because it might be that people say, well, the graphics aren't any good. And um, I say, well, that's not my focus. My focus isn't making the graphics look good. My focus is in getting it so that it's got the most gameplay of any game ever thought of. Because it is like so many games brought together. Because it's a massively multiplayer, real-time strategy, first-person shooter, role-playing game. And in terms of the battle types, you're going to have socializing going on with the role-playing game staff and it to a certain extent the MMO as well because people will be able to meet up and socialize in the MMO so it's a bit like a chat room in that regard and then um, there's a treasure thing the looting thing would be things like you know you have with Destiny where you go off to um, find some loot in some dungeons in Destiny and you'll go to an alien planet and you'll do a raid with other people. So that might be on the cards at some point. So that's sort of off on the horizon beyond the basic stuff. So the MMO stuff is kind of like penciled in as being like a broader objective of what you could do in the game, but like having it where you play with other people, but it's mainly going to feel as if you're playing single player. And uh, that's why it's asynchronous uh, MMO. And asynchronous is because it's not synchronous in the sense of World of Warcraft, where everyone's on the server all at once, all playing together, which is really hard to do. And I don't have the resources to uh, run a server and pay for all of the bells that, to Amazon Web Services that would be needed to do that. I'm not a multimillionaire. I'd need to be to do that. So the people who are doing a game like that are Cloud Imperium games and they are doing um, Star Citizen and they have raised uh, money to make this game and they've got um, $630 million in order to make that game and they've got... So, you know, it's like... I have spent, well, I have spent 50,000 on my game. And that's quite a lot um, as an indie developer. But I've been working on it for, well, I've not done anything on it in the last five years.
but before that I was working on it for 25 years. So I designed the programming language and it took me 25 years to get it to a point where I was happy with it because I'm a perfectionist and I knew that anything I did with it, if I got the language right, it would make doing the rest of the other jobs easier. And I kept on finding ways of improving the language. So I went through over 20 programming language syntaxes and added in more and more programming language paradigms from obscure programming languages in order to, which because I've researched 1700 programming languages, which is not all that there are. Then they've actually added on more now. And I had to stop myself researching new ones because it's got to a point where it's getting ridiculous. So around about the time people were starting to talk about Rust, I was just like, look, I can't be looking at the Rust. I've got, a, I've, got I've, I've got something quite good. I'm happy with it. Maybe Rust is fantastic, but if I look into it and it's got some feature and I need to like upend all my syntax to be able to incorporate what that does and start from scratch and tear everything down and rebuild it to make it all seem as if it was always like this and always had been considered and it wasn't just tacked on, um, then that's going to be a problem. I thought I can't be doing that. I've got to stop. I've got to make progress. And I have been stuck in a kind of obsessive, compulsive, perfectionist rut for a really long time. And I made an effort and I managed to get it to be um, a, a comprehensive, distilled description. And the programming language ended up being finished. And part of that came about because I accidentally deleted all my work. Uh, I formatted the hard drive that had everything I'd ever done, all my research from 25 years was on this and it all went. And so I thought while it's fresh in my mind, not that it is really fresh in my mind, I will need to, um, I will need to I will, I will need to reconstruct this work. And the problem will be that I've had like these 20 syntaxes are all different. <clears throat> and I'm getting into a position where I can't remember which of them was the right way <clears throat> to have it be. And I thought, bugger, you know, this is a real problem. And the longer I leave it, the more likelihood it is that I will find I can't recover what I've done and lost. Um, because the memory has been fuzzy, right? So right when I made the error, I, I went to my mother and I said, this is what's happened. Um, uh, do I have your permission to deal with it? Because I need to be um, focusing on just this um, for, you know, the next, you know, couple of days, I suppose it was. And um, she was like, okay. And I stayed up for 38 hours straight. And I had to be very deliberate in how I went about it. I had to pick how I was restricting the design of the programming language syntax. Because there's only a certain number of ways you can combine characters in order to define a syntax on a programming language. And whatever you choose to mean, whatever it is, whatever is going to be the thing you, you, you know, you make the thing, uh, it means you can't use that character, that punctuation symbol, that non alpha numeric character or non shift or whatever it is character for anything else. So if you set up a convention and you say, this means this, then it can't be, it also means something else. And so, um, I mean, you can kind of, you can have reserved words, you can kind of have context and dialects and things like that. So it's sort of possible, 
to kind of finesse that. But the more you go down that route, the more clunky it's going to be and the more it's going to have like long lists of things that like, no, you can't call your variable this name because it's already a reserved word. It's a keyword in a language and the language needs that keyword. So one of the things I wanted to do was to have a language which there has no keywords and I achieved it. There are no keywords in my programming language. And um, that means you can name your verbal names anything you like. Um, you can also have long verbal names that have got hyphens in them. And that means that you're not doing uh, either camel case or snake case. Which is camel case is using a uh, capitalized word, capitalized word, capitalized word, without spaces bunched together. And camel case is where it's like lowercase, but it's got underscores between the words. The reason why no one does word hyphen word, which would be like Newton Raphson for a function, let's say, um, is because it thinks it's subtraction. And it thinks it's subtraction because it thinks, oh, well, it has to be subtraction because that's a minus sign. There isn't actually a, like a hyphen character on the keyboard that's distinct from the minus sign. Now, if you look at this, you see that, that it isn't D minus one, it's D space minus space one. And in fact, it's one comma space D space minus space one parenthesis. So it's like, it's very particular about spaces. Now, a language like C, um, it says, well, you can leave them out. A language like JavaScript lets you leave them out. So the whole, you come upon some JavaScript sometimes and it'll just be stripped of spaces and everything will be really short um, identifier names and it'll be really, really hard to make sense of what it does as a program. No formatting, the whole thing would just be like one blob of text and um, the computer doesn't care. It just goes and reads the thing and just runs it, right? Um, and I want it so that um, you are enforced through the syntax, having it to have these spaces in, and uh, it doesn't have semicolons uh, at all for any purpose, and it has it so you have to have a new line uh, for every um, you know new uh, concept. Uh, those things are going to be uh, on separate lines, and that makes it a lot clearer what's going on. And so um, there's a few more things about it than that. I mean, this idea, it, it's its 25 years of work. So it's like, I'm barely scratching the surface. But what I wanted to discuss about this in the context of this is that when I was recovering the work, it was the decisions I made led to um, like, what's the most important thing? And what's that then lead to? And what's that then lead to? And then having to think about um, the entire language and going over it in my mind and saying, if I had it be this way, what is the ramifications for the rest of the design? Because everything I might do here, this one step, tiny baby step, is going to have knock-on effects everywhere else. And I don't want to lock myself out of doing anything else with the design. And I, I managed it. I managed to make a design where I did the most important things first. And then the rest of it naturally was limited by the constraints of having fewer and fewer special characters that you could input to then identify what these things are and then everything else had to 
fit within what had gone before and it got more and more restrictive until the point was like, well, there's no way of having a feature for that because there's no way of distinguishing it semantically from anything else. You've run out of, you've run out of characters, right? And so uh, I ended up with 16 features in my programming language on one page. And those 16 features are all um, essentially different programming paradigms, which all combine to make it the most po po powerful and sophisticated programming language ever conceived. And it isn't in existence. You can't write a program in it. It's just a design. So I've got this year to write the implementation of that. And the last stream I did, which it was either today or yesterday, I think it might have been yesterday. I did one that was all to do with uh, inventing on principle by Brett Victor. And he was showing off how you could manipulate code and then have an instantaneous uh, effect and where you could see the result of it and everything. When I saw that video initially, I was blown away by it. I thought, oh God, I want that so badly for programming, for me, for making a game. That would be fantastic. And um, I will be trying to do that too. Uh, in the past, I have um, written paint boxes and I wrote a replacement Windows system for my computer because I didn't like the Windows system that I had at the time. Um, I've written programs in assembly language. I've written programs in machine code where I didn't have an assembler and I just poked numbers into memory and jumped to them. So I can program um, and it might seem that I kind of say things about game design and I say things about programming language design and I seem like I'm arrogant and I'm like, how can I have an opinion like this and say my thing's fantastic? Um, well, we'll see. But the thing is, is that you've got to have some confidence in yourself and have a bit of ego to stick with something this long because it's been... 30 years, all right? And it's gonna be another four before I've got the game in a state where I can give it to people and they can just go, what's this? And they can play it and it will just be like nothing they've ever played before in the world of a video game. In fact, the thing I'm thinking now is I'd like it to not be that apparent how huge it is I think it'll scare people. I'm actually thinking that the game might scare people. Not in a kind of, oh, it's a horror game way, but in a game where they will just be, it, it might be ontological shock for them to be a, playing a game that is that huge. So I'm thinking, might need to think about an onboarding issue with it, where it's like, make a smaller game within the game which they were like, oh, well, the, oh, this is what the game is. And then the rest of the game is like revealed after they've completed the main game. So this this game might be New Game Plus, and then the, the game that they play first would be effectively an extended tutorial that would get them used to um, some things that you do within the border thing. So like the game I was showing off just then, which was Prey 2, which never got released, that might be a candidate for how to do it, where you say, rather than say, right, it's a role-playing game, and you can pick any role, you say, we'll take a bit away, and we'll say, we won't have you have a character creator, we won't have you pick any class or have any kind of role or be any kind of, uh, you know, like Starfield, where there's lots of different kinds of jobs you can make, make at the beginning of the game, or Star Citizen, where they're going to let you be a citizen in the in in the galaxy. And I thought, hmm, maybe what you want 
you don't want to make it say you're a bounty hunter you're playing this character get going on this and that would be your initial jumping off point and you'll have a um you'll be chasing after characters like that and it will all be fairly heavily curated um you know story set in something which i've spent more time on than the rest of the game um where the procedural generation will be there helping bulk things out but there'll be a lot more authoring and there'll be a lot more curation of the things that the game produces as saying is this all right as a you know as a location and stuff and some of that will be like level one of um well world one of mario where mario in the original mario game Shigeru Miyamoto, who's a designer of that game, made the whole game. And then he made the first uh, level. And he said he did it like that because he said that he could only make the first level once he'd made the whole game and he understood what kind of level he needed to make first as a way to have a tutorial for everything that then follows. And he carefully constructed the first level to make sure that it would ensure that the levels that followed would be properly set up and introduced as challenges and so forth. And so I'm thinking about that and thinking, yeah, you know, one thing you have to bear in mind is that if the game's enormous, people could be completely flummoxed by it and not know how to approach it and what they might want to do in it. And if there could be anyone in the game, they might not know who to be in the game. And they might pick something as a role which wouldn't suit them and they wouldn't enjoy because there's no guarantee that they would pick something that would match something that would create a dramatic situation that they would have fun with because it's just a simulator, not something that's been authored, right? So... I'm thinking I might want to start off with something which is more likely to guarantee a a kind of relationship where they actually, you know, they're they're chasing down criminals and they're catching bounties and they're doing parkour and they're using interesting science fiction weapons and stuff like that. And, um, but I can't do that, like, to begin with. I have to make the rest of the game first. And then once I've done that and made all my planets and made all the, you know, content and stuff, I'll have a load of content and some of that I can go and pluck from and I go use that to help me uh, expedite making that initial bit. And some of that will polish up and um, limit and linearize uh, that experience within a um, more open world experience. So in that first game you don't go off planet at all and you don't leave the city and then after that you get to leave the city but you don't go off planet and then after that you get to leave the city and then you get to travel to another country and you get to go to another city and then after that there's like a war and it's like between countries on the planet and you realize you get to go anywhere on the planet and then from there it's like Oh, you get to leave the planet, you get to go into space, right? And it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger, right? But the the way this will play out is that I I I will I will carefully husband this so that the amount of stuff that there is in the game I think isn't that apparent early on. I mean I'm talking about it now. Uh, to kind of help have a record of the whole thing. Um, and, I, and I mentioned these things in this stream because it's also relevant to geometric unity. It might not seem like it is, but it is. Because Eric Weinstein was like saying how his methodological approach to a theory of everything, or he says a hopeful candidate for the theory of everything, um, or no, he says for what a hopeful candidate for theory of everything might look like. Yeah, it's that overqualified. He's trying to say, oh, I'm not doing it. 
but when he talks about it, he's I think he wanted to say he's doing it. He wanted to say he's doing a theory of everything. And yet you can't really say that. It's a definition of hype. So it's it's way too premature when you just have a speculative idea that isn't even hypothesis. And then you're saying, oh, well, it's a theory of everything. It's not even quantized. So it's it's way too premature. You know, it would be a a hypothetical um, unified field theory if it was quantized and it had everything about it formally specified, you know, formally defined, and you know it was consistent and checked out and whatever. Um, and I think it. It's going to be a few years before we'll get that, and it'll be in a subsequent paper. It won't probably be the next one, but probably the one after that. And then in, what did I say? Did I say 2030? The fourth paper will come out, and it'll be the final one, and it will have uh, more material in it about the um, proposed unification through the direct square root. And... Um, I should think that's going to like more than double the length of the paper. I should think it's going to be like 200, 300 pages long by that point. I don't really see how he can write about all that he's doing with such a broad topic and it be a short paper. Because like Ed Whitten did a paper a while back and he did it with someone else and it was like 300 pages long. It was crazy long. So, um, about quite late now okay so i've kind of lost track of where we're going i, I put something in the chat didn't i girl man quark zoo penrose string math okay um so about the the game the point would be talking about it in the context of this rather than just leaving it to the programming screen is to because I talk about that in like uh, Jonathan Blow treats the reason I'm talking about it here is that I feel as if Eric has a methodological concern of not wanting to lock himself out from using tools too early and then they're not having them at the end so he says, you know, about husbanding things. He uses the word husbanding. Um, we find that on here. We'll go to, you never know when you're doing this sort of thing, when you're doing this and doing this. And he says, um, oh, husbanded. Right. So this is, but, and I want to emphasize this one thing that most of us, we think about final theories and unification. We might as well play it, because it's like, play it. Mm, want some sound? But, and I want to emphasize this, one thing most of us, we think a lot about final theories and, and about unification. But until you actually start daring to try to do it, you don't realize what the process of it feels like. Now try to imagine conducting your life where you have no children, let's say, and no philanthropic urges. What you want to do is you want to use all of your money for yourself and die penniless, right? Like a perfect finish. Assuming that that's what you wanted to do, it would be pretty nerve wracking at the end, right? How many days left do I have? How many dollars left do I have? This is the process of unification in physics. You start giving away all of your most valuable possessions and you don't know whether you've given them away too early, whether you've husbanded them too long. And so in this process, what we've just done is we've started to paint ourselves into a corner. 
We got something we wanted, but we've given away freedom. We're now dealing with a 14 dimensional world. Well, let me just sum this up by saying, Between fundamental and emergent, standard model and GR, let's do GR. Fundamental is the metric, emergent is the connection. Here in GU, it is the connection that's fundamental and the metric that's emergent. In the next unit of GU, so this is sort of the, the first unit of GU. Are there any quick questions having to do with confusion or may I proceed to the next unit? Okay. The next unit of GU is the unified field content. What does it mean for our fields to become unified? There are in fact, only at this moment, two fields that know about X. Theta, which is the connection that we've just talked about, and a section, sigma, that takes us back so that we can communicate back and forth between U and X. We now need field content that only knows about U, which now has a metric depending on theta. A particular member of the audience is a hedge fund manager who taught me that there is something of a universal trade. And the universal trade has four components. You have to have a view, you have to have a trade expression, you have to be able to calculate your cost of carry, and you need a catalyst. Our view is going to be that somebody doesn't understand what trade is possible, and we're going to make a trade that looks like one of the worst trades of all time. And hopefully, if we, if we have enough conviction, we're gonna have a catalyst to show that we actually got the better part of the deal. What is that trade? What is it that we think has been blocking progress? In GR, in Romanian geometry, as we've said, we have the projection operators and we also have the levy chavita connection. In the auxiliary theory, we have freedom to choose our field content, and we have the ability to get rid of much excess through the symmetries of the gauge group. We are going to take particle theory, we're gonna make a bad trade, or what appears to be a bad trade, which is that we are gonna give away the freedom to choose our field content, which is already extremely, as I think I said in the abstract, Baroque, with all of the different particle properties. And we're going to lose the ability to use the gauge group because we're gonna trade it all You have the family cow And you have some magic beans. So it's now time to trade the family cow for the magic beans and bring them home and see whether or not we got the better of the deal. Okay. What is it that we get for the levy chavita connection? Well, not much. One thing we get is, is that normally the space of connections is an affine space, not a vector space, but an affine space, almost a vector space, a vector space up to a choice of origin. 
But with the levy chavita connection, rather than having an infinite plane with an ability to take differences, but no real ability to have a group structure, you pick out one point, which then becomes the origin. That means that any connection A has a torsion tensor A, which is equal to the connection minus the levy chavita connection. So we get a tensor that we don't usually have. Gauge potentials are not usually well defined, they're only defined up to a choice of gauge. So that's one of the things we get for our levy chavita connection. But because the gauge group is going to go missing, this has terrible properties from, with respect to the gauge group. It almost looks like a representation. But in fact, if we let the gauge group act, there's going to be an affine shift. Furthermore, as we've said before, the ability to use projection operators together with the gauge group is frustrated by virtue of the fact that these two things do not commute with each other. So now the question is, how are we going to prove that we're actually making a good train? Okay. First thing we need to do is, is that we still have the right to choose intrinsic field content. We have an intrinsic field theory. So if you consider the structure bundle of the spinners, right, we built the chimeric bundle so we can define Dirac spinners on the chimeric bundle. If we're in Euclidean signature, a 14 dimensional manifold has Dirac spinners of dimension two to the dimension of the space divided by two, right? So two to the 14 over two, two to the seventh is 128. So we have a map into a structure group of U128. At least in Euclidean signature, we can get to mixed signatures later. From that, we can form the associated bundle And sections of this bundle are either, depending upon how you want to think about it, the gauge group H or C, a space of signal fields, nonlinear. That why I'll be coming back to there's no reason that we can't choose this, watch this again thing. again we're being led by the nose like a bolt <sighs> if we want to make use of the symmetries of the theory we have to promote some symmetry to being part of the theory and we have to let it be subjected to dynamical laws we're going to lose control over it but we're not dead yet right we're fighting for our life to make sure that this trade has some hope so potentially by including symmetries as field content we will have some opportunity to make use of the projection. So for those of you who so when I was thinking about this, I, I used to be amazed by ships and bottles. I must confess that I never figured out what the trick was for ships and bottles. But once I saw it, I remember thinking, that's really clever. So if you've never seen it, you have a ship which is like a curvature tensor. And imagine that the mass is, is the reaching curvature. If you just try to shove it into the bottle, you're undoubtedly going to snap the mass. So you imagine that you've transformed your gauge fields, you've kept track of where the re reaching curvature was, you try to push it from one space, like add value two forms, into another space, like add value one forms, where connection is in. That's not a good idea. Instead, what we do is the following. Imagine that you're carrying around group theoretic information. And what you do is you do a transformation based on the group theory. So you lower the mass, you push it through the neck, having some string attached to the mass, and then you undo the transformation on the other side. I hadn't noticed this um, slide. I've got writing on it. 
here. That's completely absent from, um, where is it? See this stuff here on the um, these videos? There's nothing here on these videos to do with what we just had on screen. So um, that's very interesting. I'm kind of getting slightly distracted by this actually, but yeah, he doesn't mention it. He doesn't mention it in the paper either. That stuff is not here. Um, now, is it in the um, 8.2? That's the end of that. The stuff on the share is two pages, and then there's an appendix. Um, so we've got that where it says it's add values and let's just see um What is this? What is Omega squared or Omega two add? What is that? It says the bottle labeled the symmetric two forms on the cotangent bundle of X cotangent bundle T star X. Okay. The symmetric two forms. Um, I don't know what's happening outside the model and what I'm going to is. Um, We'll look at the paper and we'll see what he says in the paper if he said anything in the paper about Omega. Now, for me to do that, I does say it here, but he hasn't defined it. Can we grab that character and then search for it? Okay. 
2.1 incompatibility and incompleteness blocking geometry unification it has become familiar to hear that Einstein's theory of gravity cannot be unified with the standard model of quantum field theory because there is no known way to renormalize a quantum theory of metrics. Okay. Okay, I think I know what you mean by that. However, this betrays a focus on making the work of Einstein submit to the viewpoint of Bohr. That would be Niels Bohr. That is a signature of a group of quantum theorists who view holdouts refusing to acknowledge the supremacy of the received quantum viewpoint as inviting uh, quantum domination. I don't know quite how he's phrasing that. Okay, it's basically saying um, people who are into quantum field theory see, see that everything quantum. We hold with Einstein that the quantum is disputable, but it's instantaneous instantiations and their interpretations do not carry the same infallibility. Oh, that's interesting. So for us, there are many incompatibilities between general relativity and the classical field theory whose quantization defines the standard model. Our gambit is that if there is a natural classical field theory that strongly resembles the standard model, together with general relativity, then if it can be shown to emerge naturally from minimal assumptions, which is like S4, it is likely to be correct or close to correct, may suggest uh, its own preferred quantization. It cannot be proven, but it is stated here as a governing philosophy of the work at hand. That seems pretty damn important, doesn't it? Um, So I've got that as a kind of framing context for some of the material that we're dealing with, is that he is um, he wants to do what is in the um, when he has the um, the paper and he, you know the, the the lecture that which we're reviewing, and he has the advert for it. The same sentiment is expressed there. When we look at that, and. Um, A program for geometric unity, not a theory, is presented to argue that the seemingly baroque features of the standard model of particle physics are in fact inexorable and geometrically natural when generalizations of the yang mills and direct theories are unified with one of general relativity. And then we pop back to this compare it and it says here so it says um, inexorable and geometrically natural our gambit is there is a natural classical field theory that strongly resembles the standard model interesting together with general relativity
it says that it should be possible to so that you can have a unified field theory that resembles both the standard model and general relativity, which will be SL2, C for the Lorentz group, which was the lead group of a differential manifold for general relativity, and then have a Lorentzian me metric of um, 1,3 for that, and recover space time. And in the other sense, you want to have Patti Salam out of spin four, spin six cross spin four, and put that together into spin six comma four, spin one comma three cross spin six comma four gives you spin seven seven. Um, seven seven is fourteen dimensions. Fourteen dimensions is the uh, unrestricted um, set of dimensional measures needed to chart a four-dimensional abstract pseudo Riemannian manifold. So it is geometrically natural and um, as it says here, inexorable. Inexorable and geometrically natural. That's what he means. He starts with four. You can't have anything other than 14. Um, as the um, if you want to have it be a different number, it will be a parameterization. When Einstein says, "Oh well, I only need ten dimensions to chart space time." I only need length and angle. Um, this is true. He only does need that. He's making a choice of metric. But he's also making a choice in the sense he's not only le leaving out the frame of reference, but he's also um, making a choice in imposing a metric to begin with, which is um, Hen Henrik Lorenz's 1-3 um, metric. So, right, why that one? So he's making it so you don't pick the metric, because why would you know what it would be? Why would the universe know to pick it? Right? I mean, what's, what is in a final theory that's making it happen to start off with one three? So he starts off with four and then has the four generate the gauge group use its forces for and then that um, has a group spin seven seven um, um, subsumed within it and then that has spin one comma three cross spin six comma four within that and um, Spin one comma three maps to X one comma three. So yeah, that kind of makes sense. You go through the Levy Civita connection and that's what you end up with because that's the way the math works. Um I mean, is he saying that there are other configurations that you can have it be other than 6-4? And it could be
other sets of dimensions and then those ones would not need to um, um, a quantum field theory that would have the standard model in it. So it might be that in the observers, there's parts of the fibers that would be describing metrics for spin something something that wouldn't be sits for and as a result it wouldn't yield as a only remainder one three um it would remain would be something else. I mean let's say we deal with a sector that was covered, which was um, 2-2. Two, two. Take that away from Dan 7, you get 5-5. Five, five. Can you make a theory out of that? Um, Hmm, interesting. There's a couple of ways he could mean meaning what he's said in the past. About metrics. Okay, let's get back into this. Failure of gauge covariance, I understand projection. No, I don't know what he means by this, so. One of the curious failures of modern gauge theory is the uncomfortable accommodation it gives to Einstein's general geometric, general um, relativity. Uncomfortable accommodation. Hmm. At first blush, a theory of gravity built on curvature um, should be a natural fit for the concept of bundle symmetry. For any curvature tensor of a connection on a principal G bundle, P of G, which is the, the way I would write it, is P of G. It always is at a Lie algebra value of two form. Is that what a Lie algebra is? Omega sign. Now, let's have a look at um, probably be something like Stack Overflow for mathematics. The algebra valued differential form. Okay. What's a differential form? A vector value differential form on a manifold M is a differential form on M with values in the vector space V. 
Well, we've got a horizontal vet space H um, with a manifold, a pseudo manifold manifold X. More generally, it is a differential form with values in some vector bundle E over M. Well, I suppose E might be Erismanian, I'm not sure. Probably is. Ordinary differential forms can you viewed as R value differential forms. I imagine that means um, real numbers. Oh, that looks more like it. That looks like what we're dealing with. I found a bit of Wikipedia we need. This has been completely opaque to me for ages. I've been looking at these Amigas and I've been thinking, I don't know what they are. M is a smooth manifold, so it would be like a Lie group, yeah, or pseudo Romanian manifold, and therefore can be a differential manifold, therefore it can be a Lie group. E maps to M is a smooth factor bundle over M. Not quite sure what the arrow is doing there, but okay. We denote the space of smooth sections of a bundle. Now, I'm not quite sure what they mean by sections. A section of a fiber bundle is a continuous right inverse of the projection function. Oh Lord, right inverse. Well, I'm gonna have to look that up. So, right. <clears throat> I've found an article on Wikipedia, it's got one source. Wow, that's how obscure um, geometric unity is. Bit, having a bit of difficulty working out which way around this is. Um, right, let's try an intuition. The base space builds the bundle, yes? So the base space is at the bottom, B, and it builds E. Um, the section S of a bundle, P, such that E goes to B. Not really that helpful. 
I'd need to know about the notation for bundles. Um, let's see if I can't find that out. The mathematical field of topology a section or cross section of a fiber bundle E. Oh, right, E is a fiber bundle, is it? So E is like this part on the glass. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Maybe that is like E after Osman. The E after Osman? Why are they showing a bristles on a hairbrush? A fiber bundle is a space that is locally a product space, but globally may have a different topological structure. Specifically, the similarity between a space E and a product space uh, of, of B times F is defined using a continuous subjective map. Well, I don't know what they meant by that what a continuous subjective map is. Um, that seems very obscure. This may seem very, very slow, but it's also very, very difficult. And um, I will be needing to do some reading if I'm gonna be able to make sense of the middle part of the lecture where he's talking about um, group theory and so um, you might say why didn't you do the reading before the lecture thing and the thing is is that um, there's always going to be more to know and so it's a question of judgment whether or not I bother looking into things or not I could skip all this and then just give a high enough more of a hot take on the bits that I can react to or I could go and say, no, I'm going to, you know, be a bit more thorough. But it is tricky um, to know what to say, really. Um, I don't know what's going on with this hairbrush. Um, I wonder what's going on with the hairbrush. Um, okay, well, we've got a picture of a hairbrush, but no clue as to why it's there. Um, we'll go to the, uh, five bundle hairbrush, click five bundle. A cylindrical hairbrush showing the intuition behind the term fiber bundle. Which is what? This hairbrush is like a fiber bundle in which the base space is a cylinder. Oh, I see. I see. And the fibers bristles are line segments. Uh-huh. I thought they had to be at, at tangents to the space, not at, uh, oh, well, I suppose they're tangents there, but I thought they were tangents to the, a different form of tangent. I thought they were tangents to the curve of the space, not tangents off the space. Not bristles off the space. Is it completely different from what I've been thinking? But I thought it was. Uh, I thought that everything was like as I've been drawing. Four. So anyway. Um,
Oh. Okay, the base space is the cylinder. And the base space B. Um is what's responsible for the bristles of the fibers. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I think you can go from you know a cylinder to a directly to a tangent away from that cylinder. Um, but in doing that, it would be in the same plane, wouldn't it? As the, as that thing, it wouldn't be properly at right angles. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. And it's like the intuition is here, the cylinder is like there. And I thought it was like this and then turned like this which is completely at the wrong angle, it's, it should be like that. So I don't know whether it needs another turn because, you know, what is the cotangent, whatever, is it get you to the vessels? Because the thing is, you're trying to do something which has got a four dimensional space, where if we say it's analogous to the cylinder, we say that is um, space time is a cylinder where the cylinder would be, I don't know, how should we have it be? We'll have going around the cylinder, um, going around the handle will be like going around in space. So if this is a hairbrush, and it's all sticking out like this. Then traveling around here would be space as it was before. And then we're adding time this way, where it's a two dimensional thing. And we'll add it where the water is. So we're dealing with a solid thing that's not one dimensional anymore. It's now. The surface of this is a disc, and this will be now. So the, the meniscus of this will be now, and everything below this will be the past, and everything here is yet to happen. And um, uh, what else? So then you look at that, and you say, that's the model of the universe, the space time, got one dimension of space, one dimension of time. And then you say, you can construct from that something which has got however many dimensions. It's going to be d squared plus 3d over 2. It's going to be uh, 2 squared, which is 4, plus 3 times 2 equals 6. 4 plus uh, 6 is 10, divided by 2 is 5. So this is going to create a uh, five-dimensional space format. Mm. It's, it's going this way, but it's also got to find a way of being a tangent to it. Um, how's it doing it? It's ending, it's ending out this way. It's just 3D. Where's the other 2D? I don't understand. I don't understand what the other dimensions have got to for the five dimensions. Why is it five dimensions?
don't see where the five dimensions is. It was in it's five dimensions when it's on um, the um, Dr. Brian Keating, right? I don't know which episode it was. So it will be uh, Geometric Unity. explain and then it would be I was going to play this at the pump point actually because it's relevant trouble with stream there we go we had that and then we're gonna we're just coming to this I don't think this is it is it it will be here maybe it exists within Why is there no picture? And they often consist of multiple different dimensions. Have you ever heard from string theorists that there may be nested hidden dimensions at the very smallest points at every point in space time? Well, this is basically what they're talking about. These nested topologies give the properties of matter to matter. They also give us the ability to track, understand, and chart what is actually going on. Now that we have explained some of what we already know about physics and how we use mathematics to describe what's actually happening and to chart what's going on, let's talk a little bit more about geometric unity and what it proposes. Geometric unity, simply put, attempts to create both of these mathematical shapes from one simple premise. If one simple premise can create the topology of space-time, as well as the topologies needed to explain all of the properties of matter, then it is basically passing through and creating in its own way everything we need to describe the universe. And if there is a containing set of geometries that contain these, uh, that contain space time and these nested geometries for the properties of matter, then you have a way of unifying all those geometries together and you can chart everything on one unified topology. In order to do this, geometric unity first discards the topologies of general relativity and the standard model as the simple starting point of how this topology might form, this grander unifying topology might form. Instead of attempting to fit general relativity into the box that the standard model uh, exists within or to shift and shape the standard model to fit general relativity, he suggests that instead you should start with neither of those and try to create a model topology from scratch that might unify both of these. Right. Mm -hmm. This model should essentially recreate the equations of motion as described by general relativity, as well as recreate the equations that describe spin and all the equations that help us understand the standard model. If the unifying geometry does this, you don't necessarily need the old models of the standard model and general relativity anymore because they're embedded in that other type topology. Yeah, yeah. In essence, it is suggesting that you change your perspective on how to actually get these equations of motion and understandings of the standard model. And it basically states that you can get these equations from a simple premise that starts from scratch. Weinstein's premise is that instead 
of space-time as the base or the foundation of the universe, there is instead something a little bit funky going on. Instead of general relativity being the playground, it is instead something that is created from another couple of topologies interacting with each other. This is a bit I'm not sure and about. And as these topologies interact with each other to create general relativity, they also create the topologies needed to understand the properties of matter. To understand these topologies, we have to create an idea of something called proto space time. Yeah, it's not the right word. Now, proto space time just means before space time, and more specifically in Eric's. But um, it's okay to say before in the sense of um, methodologically before rather than chronologically before. So. Um, There is a process by which, you know, um, you have a creative act um, of imagination, let's say. Nothing's been done. There's no actual external activity. Um, and, but for example, I have some pistachios here, right? And I think... I will be needing some kitchen paper because I'll be mess on the table and I will put that down first and then it will keep all the mess on the kitchen paper. I will need to have order. I will need to have the shells near the keyboard and I'll need to have the nuts nearer to me because it could be more convenient. I don't have to, I don't work this out as I as I do it, because I have already done it before in the past and it worked out to be a success. So I'm reusing a methodology that worked in the past. So I go like that, and then I go into the process of breaking these shells. I've gotten good at knowing how to break them. And I also know that if I have one which is um, harder to open, which will be Mm. that's a bit small to open that I take one of the broken off pieces of shell and I use that to lever open the shell with this turning it from the point to the side as I open it and um, you know I open up a lot of these before I get into eating them and then I can just treat them like you know they're already pre-shelled other than you have the effort of having to uh, that was almost at the limit of me needing to um, do it the other way some of them are empty don't know what happened there where my shell go where my where, where's my pistachio so um this is a method and um i am now in the process of implementing it and um you know the, the programming language i was talking about um uh, earlier you know um that in a sense is a a description of a method um, by which I will write a program. That's all it is. And the method, the program I'll be writing will be this year. And um, it's a complicated program because it's a program to have a, a programming language work. Um, but it's not just a matter of like, well, you want a programming language. That means it's a you know, a program where you take the text and it goes off and then it uh, makes sense of it as a new programming language. Um, that's not enough, right? 
because you know you might say right your job is to write a um a program that will run c which is a established programming language that was designed in 1972 and you know someone could do that today people do it fairly regularly actually they write themselves a c compiler um or they write basic you could write yourself your own version of basic bill gates wrote basic um and, and make some money off it when you started microsoft so but bill gates didn't design basic um john kameni I can't remember the other guy's name, Kurtz, somebody Kurtz, were at Dartmouth College and they developed BASIC. So they had in mind what was needed in the way of a programming language for education. And they went off and designed it. And then Bill Gates did really very little in the way of innovation. Took their idea, made a version of basic, and then sold it, made some money, and used it to start Microsoft. Um, So, um, what's involved in the idea of the syntax and the, the semantics of basic, as opposed to the implementation of that as a program that will run when, and then given a text that is in basic, will say, um, yes, this is basic and I will now do this and run it and make, make it do things. Or it will say, you have a syntax error at line 420. Those things are all part of the program that you will create to be able to have that basic um, thing run. And so there is syntax and semantics and there's you know, type checking and code generation and an interpreter or a compiler and or mix in between and however else you want to have it. If you need an editor or anything like that or linker, all of those things, uh, those things are all part of the, um, you know, the production aspect of the thing. And then the stuff that is the methodology uh, is like the idea before you even get into implementing it because um, how does it look what the syntax is and um, what do things mean uh, sort of touches a little bit into the whole bit of programming it but it is at a remove from the programming of it I mean it is, in a sense, inherently still designed because you're saying um, I mean, a formal definition of the semantics won't be a program. Um, but 
But there are people who don't bother with a formal definition of semantics, and they just mean make it so that the the uh, compiler itself um, is the definition of semantics, because ultimately it's enforced by that program. So they just say, well, you know, write the syntax that will be all of those statements are valid, and then what they do. Well, that's down to the program that is the um, basic programming language application. Which is thinking, well, hmm, it shouldn't be like that. There should be a formal definition. So, like, um, I've, I've given the book to my brother, um, and there was a history of programming languages. Um, and it was Algol um, W, I think it was Algol W, um, Operational Semantics. I think it was something like Van Wingarden. Um, um, Yeah, that's about it. Uh, there's uh, operational semantics. So this isn't really um, um, a program language syntax. It's, it's what happens when you try and do something. Um, informally, the rule says that if the expression E in state S reduces the value V, so that is the reduction. Then, which presumably is this, the program L um, is equal to E. Um, well, I'll take the state S with the assignment um, L is equal to this, is this is the oh it's the set union operator for this within this so this is going to end up getting the value of um if the expression e the state s reduces to value v then the program will update the state with the assignment L is equal to V. I see. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll get that. Gosh, see, they make a big deal out of it, don't they? Um, and so you get this sort of stuff. Um, while that is not like ordinary. Um, Sim that's not that like ordinary um, syntax. Now, practically no one bothers with this um, when they're writing programming languages. It's overkill. Um, let's see what we've got here. Is this a different one? Is this Van Weingarten um, syntax? Well, this feels more like um, Algol. No.
Is it might have been denotational semantics. Okay, we're going to look up. There we are. I've been more confident to search for it. Put a spell in his name, you see, so I wasn't looking it up. So W grammar. Is a formal language for the purpose of defining the Algol no, 68 programming language. The resulting uh, specification remains its most notable application. Um, Might. Yeah. Nineteen sixty eight. Right. Okay. Well, you know, know a bit more about that. So this is is not well. It's not really uh, runnable. You know, it's um, what you're looking to do is you're looking to you're looking to create something which is a method, a methodology. Uh, like when I was shelling the nuts, I had an idea in mind and I had, you know, put down a piece of paper, then you can pick the whole thing up and it's all easy to throw away and everything, rather than just be a mess on the table. And thinking of that is part of a method. And it's in your mind, you haven't done it yet. You're, you're tearing up, the, you then start the process by tearing off a piece of paper. And I was finding myself in the kitchen tearing off the piece of paper to put on the table. And I couldn't even recall why. I thought, why did I tear off this piece of paper? 
and it came to me that I needed it to go to, under the nuts on the table. I thought, oh, I see. And it was just like habit. You know, like, it's been a while since I've had these pistachios and my my brain obviously had remembered that this is something I do out of habit. And um, that was doing it even though I wasn't conscious. I was thinking, well, I am now going to be doing this and I what will I need, sort of thing. I wasn't on thinking like that. So, that sort of, in a way, That's analogous to Einstein. You decide upon the details of space time metric. You could say, well, what if you were unrestricted? And you could put all the nuts directly on the table. Right? No intervening sheet of paper. What would, be, what would be so bad about that? So, in a way, you could say, you know, two metric units is eating off the table. Because it's, you can have a nut. You can put them on the table like that. Put a few on the table like that. And they're all these shells, right? So they're not gonna be the 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 table is gonna lead them to get dirty or anything. So I don't I don't really see a problem. Don't really need don't really need the piece of paper, but um Because I want to open them all up before I start eating them, um, then that means that they're going to be naked nuts. Whereas this way, they're in a shell, I break them and then I eat the, the nut. Um, Maybe it's here. No. Oh, this is it. So this is for memes of destruction. Now this is the one where it was a torus. And I didn't really understand what this what was going on here. You see in the lower left corner of the screen, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Is a two-dimensional model, a toy model of space time. So yeah. going around to the center is like Groundhog Day, you come back to the same place and it's a repeating time cycle. And space is simply a circle. Now in such a world, we would normally think of quantum field theory or gravity is taking place on that object. And you'd have fields, you'd have effectively functions called section on that object. And what you're seeing here is something that's very hard to picture because it's five dimensional. But one, one trick here is because the torus has a property called parallelizability, the object on the right is a um, depiction of a metric each point that isn't on one of those two sheets is a potential metric at any given point on the torus. 
So in other words, if a metric is a symmetric non-degenerate two tensor, if you think of it as a matrix, it would be of the form X, Z, Z, Y. And the non-degenerate means that X, Y minus Z squared is not equal to zero. So that's what's cutting out that variety, if you will. The zeros of the, de of the determinant uh, would be points, given that there are three degrees of freedom in the metric. And so instead of actually having a metric uh, space time, GU would say replace the torus by the entire space in that sort of hourglassy region. So the top region would be like space, space metrics. Mm -hmm. The bottom region below that sort of weird uh, diaphanous scarf is time, time metrics. And the weird middle region um, which is sort of uh, around that singularity, would be space-time metrics. Every way you can stick that donut into that middle region without touching one of those two sheets is a valid space-time metric. And what GU would do is to say, don't only dance on the points of the two-dimensional torus. Again, the surface is two-dimensional, even though it seems to be three-dimensional for naive uh, investigation. You should actually have fields that are dancing on all of the points of the torus and simultaneously all of the points in that middle region of the, uh, we call the Diablo diagram. No, to, to the right, to the right, yep. So. Why is the person controlling the mouse by engaging? Like, what? Why? Why? Brian Keaton doesn't understand. He's not been shown this beforehand. It's been live streamed. He's, he's indicating something. It's a wrong diagram. Because Brian Keaton doesn't understand. All of the points in that middle region of the, uh, we call the Diablo diagram. No, to, to the right. To the right. Yep. So every point, why is it that Brian Keating has control of the mouse? Why isn't it that Eric Weinstein's giving the presentation that has control of the mouse and go, this is the Diablo? Why, why not that? Because, hmm. I mean, remote desktoping exists, right? So I find that completely un impenetrable. Um, but I wanted to go into the gun man thing. I wanted to talk about particles. So It's going to seem very random. Hmm. In particle physics, the term particle zoo is used colloquially to describe the relatively extensive list of known subatomic particles. By comparison to the variety of species in a zoo. In the history of particle physics, the topic of particles was considered to be particularly confusing in the late 1960s.
hundreds of strongly interacting particles were known to be believed to be distinct in elementary particles. The later discovered they were not elementary particles, but were rather composites of quarks. They are now and believed to be today elementary quarks. Bosons would be like a proton and um, that would be a Higgs and it would be W plus or W minus and then the Z and the Higgs. Those things would be bosons. Uh, the gluons would be bosons. An lepton would be something like an electron. Um, is that right? Know what a lepton is actually. Leptons, a lepton, there we are. Six types of leptons known as flavors. And these would be the six here yeah. um, electron, muon, tau, on, electron, neutrino, muon, neutrino, tau, neutrino. So we've got the particle zoo here, and we've got the article sale. Many uh, we thought that there were uh, lots of particles, and it turned out to be that are made out of quarks. You go to the eightfold way, which is this, and there are uh, six things around there, and then two in the middle. And then these things along the uh, uh, same um, line there, they're going to be the same charge. So that's a negative charge there, a neutral charge along through the middle. And then this one will be positive charge. Um, and these are both same strangeness, strange, strangeness, same strangeness. We've got Murray Girl Man, and he's the one who um, used group representation theory to um, make the whole thing make more sense. Uh, if we go to
the Eightfold Way report had the uh, Yang Mills theory of the strong interaction based on SU3, as well as using SU3 for classification. Then people started telling me that the evidence, the experimental evidence, favored a sigma and lambda with different parity. That the relative parity of sigma and lambda is negative instead of positive, experimentally. It wasn't true, but it worried me a lot. And I began to wonder whether we shouldn't go back to the other model, which was uh, like the one proposed by Sakata, but which we had worked on actually independently without publishing. So in the summer, when I lectured in India, I scarcely mentioned the Eightfold Way, even though the name was inspired by <laughs> Oriental religions. That's a joke, of course. Uh, but then in the fall, I came back to the Eightfold Way and uh, rewrote the paper completely. Starting with the uh, essentially the Sakata model, but then modifying it to the beautiful way. And what I was doing in that paper then was sort of groping toward quarks, because I used the three fundamental particles in one part of the paper, and then I threw them away and just went to the abstraction of the uh, SU3 in the latter part of the paper. I also got rid of the Yang-Mills theory for the strong interaction because I was too worried about the clash between the strong charges and the weak charges in the same charge space. And uh, I put in a lot of pole dominance, which was very useful, and a whole bunch of other things. And the, so the paper wasn't published actually until 1962. But it contained a lot of very good material by that time. As a result of all this backing and filling, it was quite a good paper. I was told later it was, at the, at the time, the most cited paper in something or other, maybe in the physical review. And that made me feel pretty good, uh, even though the number of citations doesn't tell you whether a paper is good or not. Then I realized later on that the only reason it was the most cited paper was that it was the paper in which I had introduced in print the eight lambda matrices for the eightfold way. And all these papers that cited it were really just citing these matrices, which were a three by three generalization of Pauli's two by two matrices. <laughs> Meant nothing at all. It was the most cited paper. <laughs> yeah, they came known as the Galvan matrices. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, it's been I referred to them as Galvan I didn't know that. But anyway, it's funny. The. Uh, But all these questions and hesitations remain, and uh, I had to work them out, and other people had to work them out over the years. The experiment on the red and blue neutrinos was finally done in 1962. I was upset that they never mentioned my speech to that they had heard, but of course I should have published. Anyway, they cited uh, Yang and Lee and Feinberg and so on. Uh, but that cleared up the question. There were now four particles, electron, muon, two neutrinos among the leptons. So that should make it much more plausible then to introduce a fourth degree of freedom for the hadrons. But I didn't do that. Uh, Glashow and Björkane did it in 64, but they didn't really draw the important conclusions from it that they should have. Right, well, I've got a comment uh, from, I'm not here, this isn't happening. Uh -huh. uh, there's a reason only two people are watching. Well, it says here that only one person is watching. And now it says three people are watching. So how many people are watching? Well, I'm watching. Uh, I'm, I'm watching on this. So I've added the person watching, and I'm also watching on there. Uh, so that's takeaway two. I've got one viewer, so hi to my viewer. Um, so that might be Marco Manninen or Francis Fried Bacon, who simulated the entities who are running this simulation with us as the simulated. Well, I've been giving this some thought, and if there is a simulation and we're part of a simulation for real, 
Um, the whole thing just keeps going, doesn't it? Because you end up with the same question being sought again and again and again. So the reason why you would create um, a simulation First of all, to create a simulation of the universe, you'd need to know the theory of the thing in physics. Uh, otherwise, how would you make it? You need to know the rules. So, that would assume some advanced entities have figured out the theory of everything. So, the notion that they creating the simulation in order to figure out the theory of everything in physics doesn't seem very likely. Um, I mean, could you create a simulation which was based on an approximation um, that wasn't really theory based on the theory of everything in physics and it would be a bit like a video game in the sense that it's not actually using real physics you know the characters in Call of Duty are subject to Newtonian physics not Einsteinian physics um, they're not subject to um, you know the uh, um, uncertainty principle that you know, there is no quantum field theory being taken account of in Call of Duty. It's um, a map, it is happening at a macroscopic scale. It's happening in low gravitational regimes. It's happening where you just, you know, you jump and that's, that's all it needs to do is just make it so you look like you're ju jumping up in the air and falling again. Um, and that's as far as gravity goes. Um, I think the bullet drop isn't even a parabola. I think it's a, a downward arrow angled shot from the bullet from your gun. So there's a bullet drop off with, with range, but I don't think it's a ballistic trajectory even. I think it's just a kind of straight line angled slightly off the end of your gun barrel. So if you fire with a sniper rifle over a long enough distance, it will be sort of head height distance that you might have to account for with your shot or something. You have to fire above above what you're wanting to shoot at for it to hit it when it's like the other side of the map. Um, so you could be that the entities create a simulator that is an approximation. They don't know what the true model is for their own reality. They have something that is similar. And they say, well, this is just an approximate model, a bit like Newton's model for uh, celestial mechanics. It's based on F is equal to G times um, M1 uh, times M2 divided by R squared. And it's wrong. So they're going to have something that's like that, but wrong. And um, the people simulated in that simulator on Newtonian physics are going to be able to go to the moon. That will all work. Um, they won't be able to go and land on Mercury, though, because they're going to get all the um, kind of places wrong. Um, well, first, no, actually... They are going to go to Mercury because Mercury is going to be going around the sun in a Newtonian orbit. Yes, it it won't be subject to the special circumstances of being that close to the sun. That's a, it's going to be the case with um, Einstein's theory of general relativity. So, okay. So they go off and they create the model and then they do what? The model is running and it is simulating scientists making sense of the model that they're in, only they don't know what the model is, they're having to guess. And then they guess 
and they come up with the correct theory of everything, which um, is a better description than the model is. So that would be equivalent to like having an Einstein living in a world of like Bern, Switzerland, working at the patent office, traveling on the trains, and then thinking, I think that space time is curved, etc. And it's all like, how the hell do you think of that? So um, if you could be able to um, simulate imaginative individuals that have, um, you know, a genius quality to them, and you could do that, um, which I don't think is inherently requiring a theory of thing knowledge. Um, it depends on your point of view. I think that's more of a kind of AI system knowledge. Then it might be viable to have that inspired person to be inspired by a Newtonian world that isn't based on the rules of Einstein and then propose an Einsteinian model for, for um, experiments that would need to be performed um which would then confirm that theory so they would think when these experiments were performed they would find to their dismay that no light was not bent by the sun in an eclipse and the motion of the planet mercury was not more accurately predicted and then um gravitational waves were not produced by uh, rapidly rotating pairs of black holes uh, causing the Earth to squish uh, equatorially um, as the waves pass through the Earth. And all sorts of things to do with cosmology and the Big Bang and black holes and Schwarzschild radius and things like that. So they would have all these things that they had worked out for their theory that was based on Newton and it would be working for most things that they'd need on Earth, but if even if they were dealing with a GPS system, it would break down, it wouldn't be any good. They'd end up with um, their mapping system, uh, their sat nav telling them where they were and it'd be wrong. It would be it would be off. So you have that and um, so the simulation would be that the people who would be simulated um, would make the imaginative leap and come up with the theory of the thing which the people creating the simulator wouldn't know and then they would then know because they would find out what the simulation people had figured out uh, and this the theory of the thing that they come up with would not apply to their universe so it'd be a bit like Stephen Wolfram having a Wolfram physics project where he keeps on coming up with uh, theories that describe uh, little um, simulated toy universes. You could do the same with a simulated um, uh, universe that was um, more like ours with four dimensions of you know, space and time. So, yeah. I think that would be possible that you would be able to think about the theory of everything in physics um, from just um, that basis. So that's quite interesting. Um, the other way of looking at it is to say, well, no, they need to uh, fully create the simulation of our universe because our universe isn't um, well we know from our we know from our experiments 
that we can't be in that universe, right, where uh, it's all Newtonian, um, because we've done the experiments and it comes out that there is, you know, gravitational lensing and mercury and gravitational waves with the laser infrarotometry um, gravitational uh, wave observatory. Okay. So where does that get you? Well, we have a situation whereby because we have one of those features, it looks as if Well, they would at least need to have simulated our universe on the basis of quantum field theory and general relativity and maybe they don't reconcile they can't be reconciled in our universe because our universe is a simulation And this is proof that it's in a simulation because we can't get the big and the small to reconcile with one consistent theory because it's not run by one program. There's a program running the small stuff and there's a program running the big stuff. And there's two different, you know, two different pieces of software. So that's quite an interesting idea. And um, you could do that. It's a bit like running Microsoft Word whilst you're also having a computer that's hosting a virus scanner. Microsoft Word. And the virus scanner don't really have too much to do with each other. Uh, they all serve a function in their own realms. You don't tend to need the quantum theory, theory in the um, general relativity scale, or you'll need the general relativity in the quantum scale. They tend to be separated. You get odd edge cases like black holes and the Big Bang. Um, but other than that, that's about it. So you could have incompatible rules of nature if nature was a simulation. And those rules of nature were programmed by like different individuals that didn't all get on the same page when it came to the design of the laws. Um, okay. Okay, I think I understand. So, um, yeah, the simulation thing, it would be the entities would be, the question was the, um, 
Respect for taking the time to understand this for three years, lots of perseverance. Um, do you think that modern approaches to unification are lacking in physical intuition and are too mathematical? Physical intuition. Um, Einstein said himself his best ideas were rooted in physical understanding. You mean like trains and trams and stuff? Uh, I think so, yeah, maybe. I mean, um, Eric said that his ideas were based, he thinks visually rather than mathematically. Um, I can see um, there's something to it, um, to thinking in those terms, um, or doing Gedanken experiments like Einstein did. But... Um, I don't understand physics in that way. I understand it using mathematics. So, um, but I am reasonably okay at manipulating um, symbols. So I, I kind of look at look at a bunch of stuff and I try and draw inferences. You know, I was looking at a video today and it was to do with um, Arvin Ash talking about the um, uh, or was it? it was history it was to do with the um equations to do with um i don't think it's here oh yeah standard model uh theory of almost everything and this is to do with these uh not not it's not uh general relativity it's just the standard model and, um this is the uh standard model of Grandian written out in full and um that sits at the top that l um you kind of read it along and thinking i don't know what i do this does and then you kind of start picking up on a few things and you start thinking, oh, wait a minute, it's got mu and nu there. So I wonder if that's anything, you know. And um, then it has some um, W plus and W minus and uh, Z noughts. And you're thinking, are these the names of the particles? Should I be looking up the names of particles? But maybe they're representative of their masses or their spin properties or probabilities or something. And uh, it seems that it sort of is all that. And um, the um, this, um, you know, greatly slimmed down version of it is... Um, And that one is sort of do the Higgs and I um, can't remember what they all do. Oh, we can cover it here. Yeah. False interactions, which would be bosons, and that would be the standard model, all within that. Because that expands out to all the standard model fields. And then the interaction of matter with forces, which would be the fermionic stuff. So this is sort of like the Dirac equation. And then giving mass um, to the force particles through the Higgs mechanism. And also allowing the Higgs to interact with itself to give it a mass done by this and then you need to have mass for the mass particles which presumably is also this I think it's phi that oh, that symbol which would be the Higgs thing so the Higgs is in both uh, Um, right, right. What I could do
This is page one. I need to know where I'm going first. I could open that up. You'll uh, do that. Now, Okay, that's all done. The screen grab. Oh, no, it's dragged off the screen too much. Hold on. Now this is just um because I have a bit of a break and the whole whole other thing's going. See if this is gonna inspire me in any way. Let's have a look what we've got here. So what's down the bottom of here is bullshit. This is all um BS. Um or I could point to something else to say that's BS. This specifically here, that's all BS. I don't know, all of this, that's BS. Right, making it up. I don't know what it will be like. Eric has is and he says he wants the Einstein um, Dirac is equal to He writes this. He says Einstein Dirac is equal to the Young Mills Heath Klein Gordon equation. And I'm like, okay. But what he really means is he's saying that a generalization of this and a separate generalization of this, um, when taken through a direct square root of this, um, mm, and taken through a direct square root of this, uh, will result in um, this informing the terms to give to this, and that way you have a generalized equation for this which will presumably be in 14 dimensions. And it will look like that, because that one will be the swerveture and the dispersion, which is the swerve curvature. Where that curvature is Presumably similar to this. And there's a space torsion, I think, 
balance things will be similar to this. That's a bit, that's one I'm a bit more certain about. And so rather than having a four dimensional Einstein field equations, which is what we have um, ordinarily, it will end up being 14 dimensional. And then it will get simplified from this into this. So go and become that. I'm looking at these false interactions, and this is like the the groups of the standard model. So it's that like U1, um, SU2. So I get to that. That's that. And then, then this might be Dirac. That would be Higgs. No, bosons. So what I was thinking was that this term here might be related to the, um, well it's needed to be a mass term, so it would be a mass term for both force particles and matter particles. And that would get you your um, mass here, but does it also need the momentum? Um, well, this is, I think, the momentum, possibly. I mean, I don't know whether all of this gets captured in stress energy momentum, that's it, might be. Maybe. I'm not sure about that. I could just be the bottom part. Which parts of curvature? Oh, I know. The it is split. It would be. Okay. This at the top is a curvature equation. That is not visible enough. So 
So that will be curvature. In X. No, wait a minute, not in Y, it's in Y. <sighs> Which would mean that would be the same as Young Mills there. Matter interacting with the forces. So there might be some kind of then when you do the direct square root, where it's um, the Klein-Gordon equation and then it's Dirac, and it's going like that. Um, <laughs> you might be looking to do it with this being a subtractive term and then go from there. Yeah. Hmm. Very tired at the moment. Doing all this. I thought I had enough of a map. So, what I wanted to do was um I've got to just say something about Penrose and then I'll be back on track and I can look at the chat. So he basically says that uh, string theory isn't physics. And then there's one more thing to say. Or is it supposed to be a theory of the way the world operates? And if the number of I have to go back and reload this, I think. Trouble with string theory is it's supposed to be a theory of the way the world operates. And if the number of dimensions of space is just wrong, I can't take it seriously. And I, I mean, there are arguments why all these extra dimensions are hidden, and I don't think those arguments are right either. So I'm just left in a position where I don't, the problem is not so much, you know, how much mathematics or how much physics or what, we're not talking about things which can be experimentally tested anyway, as far as I can see. If you have a theory which had predictions, and these predictions could be seen to be right or wrong, that's what I understand about physics. But string theory seems to me driven largely by certain ideas which have importance in mathematics, but sort of irrelevant to physics, really. As far as I know, those places where a string theory has had an impact on mathematics, sure, it has. But it's not physics. Trouble with string theory is it's supposed to be a theory of the way the world. So it says it's not physics. Um, I agree, but that's not the point. The point is, can you call it a theory? Because the debate was between uh, Eric and his brother, and uh, Eric's brother was saying you shouldn't call it. Um, I think it's gone off the screen. You can't call it uh, physics. Um, Mm. Maybe it was on the other page. Okay, maybe it isn't on the other page. Uh, oh, here it is, didn't tab. So he was saying the stuff about, um, I don't think it's, um, you know, he's complaining about, bitching about um, string theory. And um, if so, here's the point. Over in biology space, we swear that 
Evolution, when we say it's just a theory, we don't mean anything less. It's as close to saying it's a fact as we ever get. Right? It has been so thoroughly demonstrated to be accurate that we are treating it as a fact until we discover something that dislodges it, like this is all a simulation and evolution was put in it to see what we would think. Yeah. Right? Something like that. So evolution is as close to a fact as we get, and we call it a theory. My point would be, at the point that your work predicts things in the world that lead us to understand that it is at least highly accurate and maybe the final step in our quest to figure out how the universe works, then it becomes a theory, and there's only ever one theory at a time, right? But the problem is, over in physics, because physics people are sloppy about this language. You've got people, string theorists, engaged in string theory. And the thing is, their work doesn't even rise to the level of hypothesis. Well, but they'll say a thing. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll look up the thing to refute this. I will say string theory Now, there, this way they're describing it here in physics, that's a mistake. Um, it's a theoretical framework, which is, yeah, okay. But what I want to know is, uh, um, What we're looking for is uh, not theory. They might say, well, this could be physics. Um, so these were all theories in mathematics. And the rest of them are not, <sighs> most of them are not physical, they are um, mathematics. So you can have something to be called a theory that's mathematics, and that's the whole point, is that string theory is not physics, it is mathematics. And geometric unity is mathematics until it becomes physics um, um, by recovering space-time.
uh, I've written that down in the chat. I can now answer the question that I got, which was about who simulated the entities. Uh, Francis Fry Bacon. Um, or was there another question that was there on that basis? That was it, wasn't it? Okay. Who was it? Who uh, simulated the engineers who were running the simulation with us as a simulator? Mm. Um, right, indirectly, you've got to ask yourself why would anyone want to simulate anything? Um, Our universe could be governed by incompatible laws, right? That, that would be the first way. Right? So, to start off by assuming that our universe is a simulation, right? So, to answer this question, we go assume. Assume one, our universe is a simulation. Our universe is not governed by uh, Newtonian mechanics. Because we know that's not the case, because we've done the, the tests and it's not. Our universe is governed um, by Einstein at large scales and QFT at small scales. And these two programs are incompatible but have clearly delineated contexts right so that uh, doesn't matter the simulation um doesn't make sense at those extremes because black holes are fake um, birds aren't real, and the Big Bang never happened, and dinosaurs' bones were buried in, uh, buried just before uh, Sumerian time began with simulation start, all right? So we're not going to bother with Atlantis and, and Sumerians. Uh, I mean, that does beg the question, where did the UFOs come in to the whole thing? And who are they? And whether they're there as part of the simulation to provoke us, to kind of like be a kind of, hey, you know, what's happening with you? Uh, have us think about other things other than just ourselves. Um, you know, wonder about the universe, wonder about things that don't fit our, our known laws of physics. Oh, okay. Uh, UAPs are put in by simulating uh, entities um, to break the laws of physics of both Einstein and QFT so that we are um, forced 
to come up with an explanation, right? And then that explanation is the theory of everything, which is what um, entities want to know. Because they don't have the theory of everything, uh, they don't. They just have similar things to us about the, um, you know, they have something similar to relativity, something similar to quantum field theory, and their model is like, yeah, but they're incompatible for them. And so they think we'll make one like us, including the fact that we can't, you know, close things up to work out the answer. And um, that's how that would make sense. That all, that all that makes sense, actually, that they would want us to be working on a, on the theory of everything. Now, the final thing is, ah, um, will they turn off the stimulation when we work out the theory? Well, if they are doing it, and they're doing it not as a hypothesis, but they're doing it right now, they know that I'm doing this right now, right? So I would say to them, you know, let's have a deal. If we continue to work out what the theory of everything is, then they don't delete um, this here, right? So I'll show you my attempt at the theory of everything now and um, we'll see if the stream stays up uh, and if the stream goes down you know that there's a problem either like you've got like the national security agency or um that's my theory of everything and um it actually proved that um, the universe was created by Lucifer because he's got his um, signature written all over this. If you add up the numbers, if you apply numerology, 2 plus 7 equals 9. And then you do that again with the numbers in this, and you get... 67,000, 67,108,864. Right, you do that for every one of those numbers. The 6 and the 7 ends up adding up to being uh, 12, 13. 13 is 1 plus 3, uh, which equals 4, which is giving you the indication that you should have that recover your X4 for your, um, you know, out of all of this, why is it that we start off with X4 in Eric's theory? Well, now we know it's because it's, it has this number here, 6, 7, and that is showing you to start off with the 4, okay? And you're thinking, well, we'll allow another number if it's going to give us the four dimensions of space time, right? What is the other number though? Because if I find that there's another number, then it hasn't got a single number that's encoded in this. And the number is, um, uh, that's nine. Of course, that's, that's four again. Um, and then you have the spin group which is what you have to get to that, which is going to be spin uh, 54 double strut C, right? And so that is, um, we'll just use that for now. That means that that's going to be uh, 5 plus 4 equals 9. So even when it's halved, 
it's and then you add the digits together it's nine and when you have it and it's 54 it's nine i am 54 um this here down here counts as one dimension you kind of but it doesn't isn't a number there because you don't need it to be a number in the scheme but we'll just sort of throw it in there um then you go uh where else is it right the next number is this group here 108 so um we look up 108 on the um wikipedia we have to see what it says about 108 so just type in 108 into google and it says all of this so um it's a hyperfactorial of three that's one to the one times two to the two times three to the three um the angle in degrees are the interior angles of a regular pentagon so you think about a pentagon um if you look at a pentacle pentacle a pen, pentagram um a pentagram has within it a, a pentagon right so they were talking about here a pentagon right there we are it's a symbol of protection you, you stand in it when you're casting spells uh, it's used by wiccans um, as a life uh, five points in star so you, you you stand in it when you want to do something to put and it it isn't just um connected to uh paganism it's connected to greece and babylonia and um Then Sumerian pottery from Ur. So it's been around a really long time. It's in China. Will be in good, decent charity. Huh. <coughs> it is used by the Pythagoreans. Um, and they used it to mean health, okay? And it's used as a symbol for the five senses. So, um, one on the Amiens Cathedral, which is inverted. Um, they say it means the Holy Spirit descending on the people. Some people think an inverted one is satanic. Um, uh, but the thing is about Satan is Satan was invented by man, um, just as God was invented by man. So, um, so what is being meant by um, what is being meant by Lucifer? when I say Lucifer. But I don't mean Satan. Um, if we look up Lucifer, we'll find out that he has um, an association with the name Lucifer has nothing to do with Christianity. Um, so it's more stuff that the religious nutjobs have uh, um, done to mythological figure this is fallen angel lucifer and then it says here um they say it's a name for the devil and then it says however and before that in um it was not as the name of the devil but of the uh meaning the morning star or the planet Venus. 
or as an adjective, light bringing. That is Lucy fur. And it's a translation of the Hebrew word. Um, and uh, so uh, as the Latin name for the morning appearances of planet Venus, um, it corresponds to the Greek name of uh, phosphorus. That would be phosphorus. Um, I mean, got your omega, your sigma field, your phi field, your rho. Quite a lot in there, isn't it? Um, and Dawnbringer. The entity's Latin name was subsequently absorbed by into Christianity as a name for the devil. So this is what they do: is they go off and they decide, oh, we'd like to go and push our idea our faith into pagan Christian pagan um, Britain in the you know dark ages and they come in and they you know execute all the old, old women that they make out of witches and they um, move the time when um, Jesus was born uh, Jesus and Nazareth born sort of in the uh, middle of the year, and they move it to, um, I guess, say Christmas. They're going to move it to December, so it aligns more with the winter solstice. And uh, that means that when people would have traditionally be having a big feast uh, to celebrate the days getting longer again, um, they... Uh, were like saying, well, no, you can be doing it for this reason. And they kind of inveigled their way in there and stamped their meaning on top of the meanings that was already established. So they are uh, inveterate um, trespassers on other people's um, established cultures. And that's part of being evangelical Christians. They don't know whether when to keep they themselves to themselves and not bother anyone else. Um, so they should be mocked, um, uh, like the way they are at the moment, you know. They should be mocked for uh, taking fun off the tiny other teeth and everything because that's quite warm. Let's turn it down. It's going to set off the uh, computer and it's going to end up breaking it or something. And it's taken the edge off the cold in the middle of the night. That was quite good, actually. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's uh, the, the first star you see in the morning. And so um, it's, a, it's a Roman folklore. Um, it's the name for the planet Venus. Um, often uh, personified as a male figure bearing a torch. The Greeks said phosphorus uh, or dawn bringer. So it's like um, it's dark, you see the star appear, and then you know you then see the dawn break. So uh, it's like heralding a new day, which, you know, on the first day, this would be there before the first day. So there's a sense it's associated with creation. Um, Lucy was said to be the fabled son of Aurora, a uh, father of... Uh, <sighs> <sighs> There's Aurora. Oh, some breasts. Latin word for dawn. So he's the son of the dawn. Ah. Uh, like Greek, Eos, and the Rig Vedic Ushas, Aurora continues the name of an earlier Indo European dawn goddess, 
Pozos. Ok. Poets sometimes personify the star, placing it in a mythological context. Wait a minute. Star? It's not a star, it's a planet. What are they talking about? There's no, it's not a star. L- Lucifer isn't a star. What are they talking about? They've messed up there in Wikipedia, but it's not a star. Right, the Vedic goddess wishes. Horses. William Adolphe Bougarono. So this is the um, mother of Lucifer. She has a brother, Sol, the sun, and a sister, Luna, the moon. So the dawn is goes between the sun and the moon. Don't say here... Does it not say here that Lucifer's is the, 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 about her um, son? It says here, Lucifer was said to be the fabled son of Aurora. Yeah, see? Where did it say that? Downfall of Helal, the son of Gaul. Aspects of royal ideology. Helal would be the name of um, him in this. Helal. Would it be where it was up here? The uh, Helal ben Saha. Um, Shining one, sun of the morning. So, yeah. Um, Halal Bal Saha. Halal. Right. Okay. So, sun of dawn. So, uh, according to that book, um, I don't quite know why. Um, 
It's he's uh, taken to be the son of Dawn. Weird. Oh. Gnosticism. I'll be under the devil. I see. Well, these things aren't necessarily all like satanic. That's the point I'm trying to make. Is it just because you say some things Lucifer doesn't mean it has to have that meaning. Um, it's kind of in that area, but it doesn't have to mean like anything negative from that. So if you're going to look at this um, uh, 108, um, you see that there are um, 108 B, beads for prayer and meditation. Krishna had 108 followers. Um, if you do the numerological thing of the number of Tamil verses, you get four. If you take the um, number of pieces, sacred places, one plus eight is nine. Um, it's coming up a lot, isn't it? And this is just a regular uh, polluted uh, source. This isn't like a special source. It, a special source would be the mathematics. This is just filtered through culture. So it's saying 108. Doesn't matter if there are some numbers here that don't add up to it because uh, it's uh, don't matter. It matters in the theory itself, uh, not the cultural ramifications of it. Um, so Let's see, in Buddhism, um, what's that say? The, the number of 108 is reached by multiplying the senses. Uh, smell, touch, taste, hearing, sight, and consciousness, by whether they're painful, pleasant, or neutral, and then again, whether these are internally generated or externally occurring, and yet again, by past, present, and future. That is 108. Right. There's so lots of stuff here. Um, they've got all manner of... Uh, oh, 108 suitors covered in Penelope, which is mentioned in the um, thing with Brett Weinstein. Don't have to go far, you know, start seeing it again and again. And then you have the numbers in lost, um, all total 108, right? So if I haven't been con convinced you yet, uh, that should, you know, distance from Earth from the sun is about 108 times the diameter of the sun. The um, the distance between the Earth and the Moon is also 108 times the diameter of the Moon. The coincidence that the Sun and the Moon are both have approximately the same ratio between their main diameters and the distances to Earth means their apparent sizes in Earth sky are about the same, which is what makes a total solar eclipse possible. Which then brings us back to Einstein and his experiment. Um, so you've done 108, what about 864? Well, 864 is going to be 6 and 4 is 10, plus 8, 18, 1 and 8 is 9. So that's, um, it's all those 9s, right? There's a nine and nine there.
Uh, I mean, you, know, you don't add up. If you have a time, like a clock, like it is now 3.21, uh, probably should stop. 03.21, I'm getting really tired. The way you do numerology is you add up the digits. And then you go two plus one is equal to three. So that means three, three. And you say, what's the significance of that? And you say, well, significance is generated by taking it away from nine. And then it's going to tell you it's six. And you have, a, you know, what the significance for six is. Um, Um, if you have one and eight, that then equals nine. I'm going to work this out, right? You've got one and eight is equal to nine. Um, then another way of forming it is two plus, um, seven is equal to nine and three plus, um, Five equals nine, and then that's eight. What am I talking about? That's eight. How did I get to that? I must have missed something out. Either the three and six is nine, and then four and five equal to nine. And then it starts going to be around the other way. So it's going to be five and plus four. Do you have it exact? We can go back up the other way, it'll be six plus three and so on. Uh, Now, numerologically, no matter what numbers, you, I suppose you could say, what happens if it's zero, zero? So let's say you're at midnight, you have zero, 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 then that's going to yield zero, isn't it? Because those two add up to zero, um, and then those two add up to zero. Um, sure, whatever. Um, as you might guess, um, it means nothing. Um, all these other patterns are uh, yield nine are significant. Uh, there are before you get into it repeating. Um, I suppose. Well, no. Do we do that? There's four of them, and then they will repeat. Can't really get into this any further, but when you have um, time, you you um, you have to keep the digits apart. Uh, and treat this as separate from that. Um, you don't add up all the digits. You add up them in, in, in isolation from each other. And then you have a long number like this, which would be u to the power of um, 67, something like that. 108x is 4. Um, Right, then you're going to have it again. Oh my god, my brain has had. Oh no, I didn't want to do that. Uh, 
What? I was doing it again. I'm very tired of making mistakes with the keyboard. So there you go. That would be your group um, right now. And you could drag all that up and they find that there's all nines, apart from the first one, which is a, a four. The pair of nines itself, you know, not that you would add it together. But if you did neurology on that, apply, you know, sum the digits and um, say, do it again until you got one. Uh, <sighs> that's that's where you get with that. So as you can see, we're still here. <coughs> this is all um, mathematically valid. As a way of forming all this, you've got a, a second parallel universe P. <coughs> right, I'm going to have to stop. I'm far too tired. I thought I could continue on until I was done, but uh, nine hours. If we decide to refuse working out, what's this? What if we decide to refuse working out, wouldn't they turn it off also? Good point, very good point. Um, well, I mean, hopefully, they just keep us going. Um, I mean, they could slow the simulation down if they didn't want to pay, you know, for it being a complex simulation. We wouldn't know what actual time was versus simulation time. So in this, T is the actual time of simulation, and it's a non-relativistic uh, quantized time base for the simulation. So it means you've got four dimensions of space time for X, four for P, and then you're going to have another temporal axis for P. And I'm like, well, actually, there's nothing about you know, geometric unity to stop it from being compatible with this theory. It would just need to be in a simulation on top of this, only one uh, universe other than two. Inside that, it would then need to be uh, pulled out of this because it's like there's 20, 20 surface dimensions you don't need. But... Um, It's remarkable how often nine comes up in this. It's so often. Now, hopefully I can come back to this, uh, say, Sunday, and, and do something on it. I think it will be Sunday, maybe 6 p.m., uh, I'm thinking didn't plan on doing another one I uh, thought I'd get it done today right I'll read out the rest of the comments um, uh, we want to be on um, this so it's based off this once I knew the formula, I could calculate what I did there. Um, do I think uh, modern approaches to unification are lacking in physical intuition and are too mathematical? Well, I based this thing I just showed you off my understanding of math. And I thought, well, it seems to be that, you know, you could have more dimensions. And I thought, can you though? You know, because the thing is, it has to be both m is equal to d squared plus 3d divided by 2 and k, 4k plus 2, where it's equal to m. So you have to satisfy those two constraints. 
and it's not easy. You can do it when cakes was three. You can do it when the cakes was four. You can do it when cakes was thirteen. And that generates 54. And 13 is 1 plus 3, which is 4. So you're either dealing with a 9 or you're dealing with a, the other. Now, if you take the 4 away from the 9, you get 5. And that's back to the number of sides of a pentagon, which is inside of a pentagram. And the internal angles of a pentagon are that, right? So you've got the sun and the moon and the Earth and total global eclipses and prayer beads in Tibet and um, there's rather a lot on 108 but you might be missing the point by looking at 108 and saying ah oh, the number the most important number isn't 42 but it's 108 but no It's sort of looks like it's 54. And then you're thinking, well, that's the spin group. What about the structure group? So I think it was 67, 108, 864. And we could go and um, Try finding that up right now, shall we? So this will be um, sixty-seven. Um, this should be God's telephone number or Lisa's telephone number. Sixty-seven one zero eight. Eight, six, four. The number you have called is not recognized. Please check the number and try again. If you need help, please hang up and call customer care. Right, so we're going to just check the number. We might have it wrong. Might have typed it in wrong. So this is the full theory. Now that's what I typed in. I did 67, 108. Do I need to have an area code? Because I need to say like it's 44 or something, don't I? 44, um, 67, 108, uh, 864. The number you have called is not recognized. Please check the number and try again. If you need help, please hang up and call us to the Right, so we're going to... Try finding another way of doing the number, which will be checking numbers online. <coughs> so, um, international, I mean, the thing is with making a phone call, in, in, <coughs> international telephone numbers. <coughs> prefixes. Um... Samoa. 
<coughs> Japan. <coughs> What would be nine? Eight to ten is Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan. Uh, that means wait for next Dartone. Right. So you put dial a nine and then you maybe type in the number and you get one of these countries. Um, get to speak to someone in Russian. Um, Kazakhstan, a number in Kazakhstan would be who you'd be phoning by lots of things, or Singapore, that would be 018, that would add up to nine. So, alongside the standard prefix, uh, triple zero for the default carrier. So you have to type in 000018, really. Seems like a lot. Turkmenistan is 009. Uh, then you've got Russia, and it will be, depending on the tra tele telephone network, it will be um, all these things here. Then there'll be nine for uh, Finland, and you could go 99, which adds up to um, <coughs> 18. Nine plus nine equals 18, which equals nine. So Tilia, Finland, only. Um, so the people in Finland will be 99. Um, these are the, these no longer used. Denmark, now it's zero, so that would be the old one, um, so you could start off zero, zero, and then um, type in the number to get Denmark, um, United Kingdom is one zero, uh, like that, so Anyway, it's three. It's like three forty in the morning, so I'll be bringing people up, and I have to see what the number is in their country, wouldn't I? Former Soviet Union. Now it's all this. These are all zero now. Yeah. North America. That's not the same as the telephone numbers. So anyway, um, that doesn't seem to work. I couldn't seem to find a way of getting through to um, anyone of significance. Maybe there's a, maybe because, um, Trying to think what the reason would be. It's the number of digits, isn't it? How many digits is in my telephone number? I'm on here. My contacts. My number is one, two, three, one, two, three. It's O seven. Right, so we're putting in that mobile number. And then we'll do, we need to have another number to pad it out to be in, um, a mobile number that's made out of three sets of three digits. What would the number? Because the first number in the group is um, uh, four, we need to make it nine, right? So it needs to be a number that adds on to that number to take it from being a sum that was 67 and then it becomes a sum that is um, 67. 
67 is equal to 13, which is equal to um, 4, right? So if we say that the result is 4 adding 5, if we had 6, 7 and 5, then that would add up to what? See if we can get this right. Um, 6 plus 7 is what we had already. And then 5 plus 6 plus 7. 18. That looks like a fairly good bet. So the number is going to be 7, 5, Right, seven is the number to start the call for the mobile. You have to have that, and then you then do this, and you do 108, and then you do uh, 8, 6, 4, right? So it would be um, the five would be in there to get the five, six, seven to work. And then you get the 108, and then you get the, oh, uh, they need another eight for the 864 there. Fifty-two. Fifty-two is seven. So it's going to reduce to the number at the front there, there, which is what I would expect. So if we take that number and we take the number and we get rid of that and we say, um, we want to just get rid of this and we want to say, you know, who called me? Because it will be a mobile phone number that will be, be on Google. Um, I think it will be 07, would it? <coughs> no. It says 4108. Can I not paste into the thing? Are you fucking kidding me? Why can't it work with a keyboard? Why can't I type anything in? Maybe I need to sign up to something. It won't let me look anyone up. Call checker. Reverse phone lookup. There we are. Never. Right. So I don't know if you saw me write all that, but I made out that it was a um, 
Crank call, claiming to be Lucifer, seem friendly, but odd times to be calling. Would be irritating if I didn't work nights. So that means that if anyone has that registered as their phone number in the future, when they get a new phone, then they're going to get that happening. <coughs> they're going to find out that they're... they're uh, They've been given the phone number of Lucifer. Um, right. I was interested in this. Um, Share with these things. I wondered if the transcript had it with them. Um, where was it going to be? No. Oh, it'll be in here, won't it? So we're going to have to look at that. Okay. Oh, there we go. I think that says epsilon minus one FA with an add value one form, add value one form, um, add value D minus one form. Mm, really hard to tell. Epsilon minus one of FA could be sigma D minus one exterior product um not sure there's more here in terms of what he's doing mathematically than there is in the paper you wonder whether or not he says he's lost the notes on how to do it maybe he had them in the slide and they're not written down, they're on the side. And this is actually how he does his shear operator. But it seems as if he's got definitions, doesn't it? He's got these equations here. They're all written on the side. So it wasn't on, you know, he said he was on um, paper with sprocket holes in it, like you get in the printer. And, um, well, how did he get these things? And how did they end up on the side? Don't know. But I get in the sense that this is to do with changing the gauge group rather than changing the while um, um, not the the Ricci coach tensor. So when you look at the analogy with the this right, then it seems as if oh well, that's happening with. Um, you know, general relativity, this is space of metrics, but in this situation, it's the space of connections. And so that's something to pick up on. <coughs> it's actually different. And so it seems as if the bottle here, um, that is not space of metrics, but it's the space of connections. And so what would ordinarily be a question of Einstein's um, curvature boat being put into the space of metrics now becomes one of Yang Mills's curvature equation being put into the space of connections. And so can you preserve the gauge covariance of that whilst doing so? And um, 
that restriction means you have a tighter neck to the bottle and uh, you have to do things which are going to preserve the masts where the masts aren't um, the Ritchie culture as much as they are the uh, equivalent uh, things that will be within the um, uh, Yang Milsu, which would be like F of A rather than F of Nabla, Levi Shavita, um, which he was talking about uh, earlier in the lecture where he had <sighs> instead of Jackie Einstein, new. So he does this and he the does spin to rock theory. Then so this is how far we've managed to get. We've got barely any distance into a store. Um, so he has... Three of these are geo quantum level. There we are. What I want to explore is the incompatibility is not at the quantum level, but the geometric input. All three <laughs> of these are geometric theories. And the question is, what are the compatibilities or incompatibilities at the level of geometry before the theory is treated quantum mechanically? Yeah. Well, in the case of Einstein's general relativity, we can rewrite the Einstein theory by saying that there's a projection map due to Einstein of a curvature tensor, where I'm going to write that curvature tensor as I would in the Yang-Mills theory. Do I? That should be an LC for Levi Chavita. So the Einstein projection of the curvature tensor of the Levi Chavita connection of the metric on this side. And on this side, I'm going to write down this differential operator, the adjoint of the exterior derivative coupled to a connection. Adjoint of the exterior derivative. Coupled and you begin to, to a see. Connection that we're missing an opportunity potentially. What if the FAs were the same in both contexts? Then you're applying two separate operators, one zeroth order and destructive in the sense that it doesn't see the entire curvature tensor, the other inclusive, but a first order. And so the question is, is there any opportunity to do anything that combines these two? But the problem is, is that the hallmark of the Yang-Mills theory is the freedom to choose the data, the internal quantum numbers that give all the particles their personalities beyond the mass and the spin. Hmm. Okay, there's so something this, going on here, right? In, in one sense, Einstein has it so that he has his pseudo Iranian manifold and he goes off and says, I'm going to start off by assuming a metric and he starts with that and he puts it on top and then he goes from there now then someone else will come along and say what you need to have on that is you'll need to have a tangent for you to have it have a Lorentzian thing on it because the tangent the tangent to this will then give you your your um your kind of tangent space or whatever and um, that'll get you your metric tensor. But I don't know, hold on a minute. This is the metric tensor. This here on top is the metric tensor, isn't it? So, <coughs> G mu nu gets put on top of this. And then the Yang Mills, I, I, I need to see what Yang Mills theory looks like because I can't relate this without seeing that part of the puzzle. And it, the problem with it is it's not got a standard um, canonical um, description that you can kind of look at and go, oh, there's Yang Mills. Um, I mean, maybe I've got it here. Um, let's have a look. Um, 
where would it be there's a book there no yeah yeah there we go right there's this um a couple a couple more resources i could look at so look at this this is a book on gauge series of the strong weak and electromagnetic interactions so it ought to be in here non the engaged series um for some in this chapter we undertake the extension of ideas that local gauge invariance to gauge groups are more complicated than the group of phase rotations we shall find it is possible to enforce local gauge invariance by following essentially the same strategy that succeeded for electrodynamics. The principal difference, apart from algebraic complexity, will be the appearance of interactions among the gauge bosons as a consequence of the non abelian nature of the gauge symmetry. As of before, we proceed by example developing the SU2 ISO spin gauge theory put forward by Yang Mills and by Shaw. The generalization to other gauge groups proceeds without complication because it's an SUN generalization, right? The near to generacy of the neutron and proton masses, uh, the charge independence of nuclear forces and many subsequent observations support the notion of isospin conservation in their strong interactions. Uh, what is meant by isospin conservation is that the laws of physics should be invariant under rotations in isospin space and that the proton and neutron should appear symmetrically in all equations. Um, this means that if electromagnetism can be neglected, the isospin orientation is of no significance. Right. The distinction between proton and neutron thus becomes entirely a matter of arbitrary convention. Interesting. And so I thought they had different masses. In such a world, the existence of two distinct kinds of nucleons would be inferred from the properties of the ground state of the um, helium nucleus in much the same way that we have deduced from the spin R. Uh -huh. um, Three over two baryons, um, omega minus the need for three colors of quarks. Ooh, problems 4.6. Where are we with this? 4.6. I thought there were the three colors of quarks. No, the, the two colors of quarks, isn't there? 4.6. Problems, I see four to six, four point seven. Hmm. 
Hmm. Ouais. Well, that looks like the Drac equation. That looks very like the Dirac equation. That's a Dirac equation, surely. This say the introduction in section 2.3 the free nuclear of Lagrangian. 2.3. This is this is Yang Mills. The Dirac equation. Um mm, it's pretty damn similar. For a free fermion follows the Lagrangian um that's the same. It's the same. Yeah. Okay. Well, I might need to be reading this, because it might be of use. <clears throat> um, <coughs> can I at least see see something Yang Millsy? Because I haven't yet. Um, D star. You start a um, I'm going to cut the animals directly in the index now. So all of that freedom is some means of taking away some of the redundancy that comes with that freedom. Yang Mills. Uh, could be throughout the whole book. Two six nine. Procedure used in section two point four point two of the Yang Mill survey. Right, four point two. I was just in section four. Right, um, 
Field strength tensor, and hence the kinetic term uh, for the gauge fields according 4.2.23. Um, although elegant means are available for motivating the correct term, some understanding needs to be gained from a pedestrian's approach. In an analogy of that electromagnetism, we need to seek a field strength tensor that looks like this. Uh huh. From which to construct a gauge invariant kinetic term. Well, that's in his theory here. I found a bit here. Some means of taking away some of That's in his theory. So, where are we with this? This, <coughs> this is in his theory. It is here. Um, where? This is oh, one, two, three, four, five. I'll put it at the end. This is here. Yeah, Bill's about twelve. Is a quarter FAFA. And he's got it here as being a half F nu nu. Oh, he's got a quarter one. There we are. Four point two point twenty four. So it's 4.2.24 um, in page 67, page, page, six, page 61 of Quig, Quiz Quig. Right, so that's the same formula um, there. Um, I'm going to turn the page over so I can find it again. Right, well, that's a bit of progress. It might be in the Penrose book, but I'm going to look at one more thing and then I'm going to call it a day. So there was something to do with these. Well, I was going to look at two things. I'm going to look at this, and the end of this, of the Clifford Arge, was is of interest. Clifford algebras can be thought of as generalizations of complex numbers, quaternions, and the sigma matrices, as well as the Dirac matrices from the Dirac equation in particle physics. The key idea behind Clifford algebras is having symbols that square to either plus one or minus one that also anti-commute with each other. These simple properties let us do some very impressive things. We normally think of scalars, vectors, spinners, and the rotation operations on these objects as being separate kinds of objects. But in Clifford algebras, all these objects live together side by side. This doesn't give us any new math or physics, but it does let us rewrite certain equations in math and physics in impressively clean ways. For example, it's possible to write the four Maxwell equations of electricity and magnetism as a single equation using Clifford algebras. So these are the Oliver Hughes side rewriting of the 20 some uh, James Clark Maxwell uh, equations for electromagnetism. And I think he used quaternions. This here down here, I think is something like, one of them is permittivity in a vacuum, maybe one of these is, I don't know, but this mu naught symbol is of some significance as a constant. And this here is J, and I think is related to this. 
J there. And again, same constant. So um, he's got himself this, which is in the um, Maxwell uh, thing in terms of the uh, Maxwell equations. And he does say Yang, Mills, Maxwell, Anderson, Higgs, doesn't he? He goes Yang, Mills, Maxwell, Anderson, Higgs. Now Higgs um, is going to be equal to the klein gordon um, um, equation where Dirac squared um, <coughs> we've got the Dirac equation as being the um, This thing here, where he goes off and he literally squares the Dirac equation and makes it a square in order to make it equal to the Klein Gordon equation, which is just a straight, you know, simple thing like this. And, but this ends up on the ascending diagonal. <coughs> so he has to eliminate everything that's not on the ascending diagonal to have any chance to make these things equal. And he does so. It's pretty impressive. So that video. So the fact um, that. Where he derives the Dirac equation, he does it like that. And we'll post that in the chat. And this is the. This is deriving the Dirac equation. So that's very helpful. And then, um, so I'm looking at that. I'm looking at the um, J. Is there a J here? Um, there's a Higgs, which is a D star, a D A. The thing he's writing on the blackboard is more like a Higgs than it is a Yang Mills. So is he, he's saying a quarter and then he's, wait a second, what are you writing on the blackboard again? This is it, isn't it? Redundancy that comes with that freedom, which is the action of the gate. D star F of A. D star F of A. And it's underneath this. You see, the Higgs might need to be represented in there, but then there's a curvature equation. So maybe the Higgs is acting on the F of A, and the F of A is the Yang Mills, and the D star is the Higgs acting on it. Possibly. Um, if there is a Higgs equation, and it's a D um, star of uh, D A, well, could the DA become an F of A? I don't know. Try to get it to make sense. Um, we could look up the Yang Mills in the paper. <coughs> so we go. Um, let's see. There's some of these connection things.
<coughs> so what I'm thinking I'm getting from this is in this in the space of collect connections rather than the space of metrics, it is um killing off the um it is a right it's doing I feel in a way it's I feel two things simultaneously right I feel as if he's trying to say that the curvatures of the two theories are the same and he's trying to say that there is a a gauge theory which he can go through and perform a transformation on and um Oh. It has a requirement to be cage covariant. So it's like it's straight jacketed into having to do it from a group, not getting able to choose any quantum numbers. Wanting to have parity so that it has this P symmetry. Yeah. Oh, I think I didn't expect it to be the. I think it's something to do with um, because you're not starting off with a metric space because you're not starting off with with um, um, an Einsteinian Lorentzian manifold. You've got to get to that from somewhere so you have it with it being just regular four dimensional space and then you come down from here with your fiber bundle but it's got to be more than that because why would it characterize it to have a metric and somehow he knows how to make things be um, similar to the um, way the Einstein theory works. He's, he's deconstructed the Einstein theory and I think I might have been naive in thinking it was just, oh, well, these correspond to these um, curvatures. Maybe they're analogies to those curvatures. So it isn't that the all those things in the curvature, they might be, I don't know. What's it say in the, in the text here? What's he actually say on the slide? He goes right into it, doesn't he? He's here. Did he go from it here? Can't do. And by the nose, like a ball. Oh, he's if we want to make it. use of the symmetries of the theory, we have to promote some symmetry to being part of the theory, and we have to let it be subjected to dynamical law. We're going to lose control of it. But we're not dead yet, right? We're fighting for our life to make sure that this trade has some hope. So potentially, by including symmetries as field content, we will have some opportunity to make use of the projection. So for those of you who so when I was thinking about this, I, I used to be amazed by ships and bottles. I must confess that I never figured out what the trick was for ships and bottles. But once I saw it, I remembered thinking, that's really clever. So 
If you've never seen it, you have a ship, which is like a curvature tensor. You imagine that the mast is, is the reaching curvature. If you just try to shove it into the... Wow. Which is like a curvature tensor. And imagine... But I remember thinking, that's really clever. So if you've never seen it, you have a ship, which is like a curvature tensor. And imagine... Uh, does he mean the ship as a whole? So the ship hull, that's a curvature tensor, right? Um, I think it D minus one degree adjoint value form might be there to destroy, um, maybe the space of connections D uh, two. So take it from two down to one. Would that make it go from a spin two to a um, spin one field and it would go from being, um, you know, matrices to being um, vectors? Yeah, this seems to be it. This is all the language he's using in his... All right. This is all the language he's using in the lecture. This is all the notation he's using in the lecture. This is it. We've found the keystone. I, I was, I was going to give up five minutes ago, but we found it. We found it. This is the smoking gun. It's this. That's it. Okay, so all the things that I don't understand about the math, this omega term, all of this stuff, is I like, I don't know what it is. And he's talking about he's talking about a pullback and the wage product and all of this. Serial derivative, yeah. This is stuff that um i can say that i can look up tomorrow and then i can um read it in maybe in the morning uh throughout the day and then i can go and i can um uh when i come to do the stream um in say the evening uh, i'll be we'll put it for prerequisites and we'll put it there. So this will be um, key info for shipping a bottle. Right, okay, I'm ending it now. So it's about, it's a bit shorter than usual. This is um, pretty good going though. Um, I'm happy to have made some progress. Um, it might seem as if um this is very slow going uh, but i don't really like going forward into the material of the reaction to his video uh if i get beyond a certain stress level of not understanding what he's talking about there's certain things he can say and i'm like it doesn't matter 
because in the context in which he's talking about things, he's talking about, you know, uh, politics and science and stuff like that and, and um, you know, embedded growth op obligations and things like that, the usual kind of thing he goes on about. Um, uh, but when he's kind of like talking in terms of the mathematics, I'm thinking, do I need to know this to be able to do a reaction? Well, it's a choice. It's kind of like, you know, you could go this way and you can say, I will dive down that rabbit hole. Or you can go the other way and say, I will skim over the surface. So I'll be a layman of this and I will not understand anything that's below it, obviously. And that means that I can't then critique it about whether or not it's even credible and whether or not he's using the math the right way and what it all means and what it, ramifications of it is. And you lose quite a lot, right? But it might also mean that you have to do that a little bit because you never make progress through the material. So you'll get to a point, and if you do that with absolutely everything, you're kind of going incredibly you know, slowly with everything, um, it would take you months to get through that uh, lecture because there is years of you know training in mathematical physics to be in a position to actually understand it without you know much effort and so um there's a post by um marco enciso on um Cora, which might be on here portal Doesn't seem to be here. I will bring it up, the, and I'll post it in the chat. Um, here we go, this is it. Oh, I have got it on screen. Um, right. So this is the okay. So that's that. Okay, so okay, I'll just check the um, comments again. I won't see them in another stream. I don't know why Hossenfelder complains about the formality of geometric unity. Of course, it takes time to understand math, but it does not require super high IQ, just time and patience to read the papers. 
Um, um, the context for this is that he was on the Theories of Everything podcast and he tried to explain it in much the same way as I did with this and with the uh, thing, but he had like a a, a, a a roll of toilet paper that had had all the toilet paper removed, so he just had the cardboard tube left. And then he had two of them for some reason. And then he had a hair grip. He was moving up and down the length, which was kind of serve in a way as this water level does. And then he sort of had some a kind of a toothpick or something that he's kind of doing stuff with on here. And um, it all seemed to come across as a bit ridiculous. You know, that's saying, imagine this is the universe and this, that, and the number of dimensions and everything. And he was doing it in very, very few dimensions so that he could actually say, I'm holding it in my hands. And, um, and it was just like, hmm. He wanted to have it so that when you do D squared plus 3D divided by 2, it ends up being a number that is within our three dimensions of space. And the only thing that you can do when it, when it is that is when it's a one-dimensional line land that's going around in a circle. Uh, if it's any higher than that, you end up with like five dimensions for the two-dimensional case. So it's like, hmm, okay, we'll look like we're stuck with a you know toilet roll core in our pocket, you know, everywhere we go to talk about this because otherwise it's too complicated because too many dimensions to to think about. And um, uh, he's not had the greatest um, um, explanations. Now, he did a talk on, I think I'll just show one more thing. He did a talk, I've just set it up. I suppose I don't have to show it. I guess have the voice. Um, He appears on this twice. Um, I think it's probably maybe this. How do you even? Okay, I think this is, yeah, we will um, show it off. Um, so he has present entire screen. Uh, da, da, da. So we'll make this a how we wrap up the stream. He isn't always incomprehensible. And I'm putting this here because I'd like him to be more like he is in this. And he was also reasonably okay with the guy, oh, I can't remember what his name is, Chris Williamson. Uh, I think he was all right in that interview. That went reasonably well. But he was mainly talking about politics. And he was all right with Dave Rubin um, on the Rubin Report. But he was talking, this is a long time ago, and he wasn't even talking about geometric unity at the time. He kind of, kind of hinted at it, and he said, Garrett Lisi was doing uh, E8, and it was 248-dimensional lattice, and he was doing something which was going the opposite direction in terms of complexity, and he was trying to find something uh, not within something already complicated, but something uh, and grow it out of something very, very simple you know, like four dimensions. Do and, you know, Peter Thiel is behind me and all that kind of stuff. But no, it's a one man project. How far have you got? I mean, effing far. Like really far. And it's, you think it's possible? I know what I'm seeing. I can be deluded. Wouldn't be the first time. How do you even do this kind of work? This is way beyond me. I got a C at physics at GCSE. <laughs> I got a B minus in my final uh, final um, grade in high school. 
he, he, there's a language. I mean, you know, there's a beautiful mug, I think, that you can buy from uh, CERN uh, in, in Switzerland, which has the ingredients of everything other than gravity on what... That would be the Arvin Ash thing. We've had that up already. I don't, don't know where that even is on, on the screen. Um, it would be a YouTube video. Um... Where is it? YouTube. YouTube. YouTube, 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 YouTube. Have I, have I closed it? It's not very good if I closed it. It has to be that I, it has to be that I still have it, surely. So I'm looking for the thing I had up briefly earlier, and it was. Damn, I have closed it. What do you think of that then? Um, we're looking for Arvin Ash. Um, I think that's bizarre that I, I've not got it anymore. Um, history. Why would I have closed the window? This. In mass? The so they're talking about what's on the mug at CERN, right? And he says, um... Here we go. So, um... Well, I'll be giving us the whole picture, are they? Oh, here you go. So that's sort of kind of the same thing, you see? A quarter, uh, F new new, F new new, and then um, plus I, um, phi bar, um, um, well, that's slightly different there, but it's essentially the same thing. The D slash thing there. Um, and then this is the... Um, and then... Right there, we've got that on the bottom. Now, some of these swapped around. Um... Two of these things have got HC. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that stuff at the bottom there. That one, that one at the bottom is this one here. And <coughs> um, That, that being in the absolute square is going to take this and turn it into real numbers. So that probably got some imaginary numbers in it. So it's a little bit different. Uh, I wondered if there was one which was got more written on it. That's got a little bit more written on it.
Wait a minute. Wait a minute. They made it simpler than that. That's just quantum. Oh, I see. That's quantum electrodynamics. So this is bit the end. And Cobb said that, and then there was light. So where? Um, Wait, with the terms. There isn't a second term here. I don't know why they're doing that. F new u is equal to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we've got this here. That's a bit. That's not the whole thing. That's like part of it. But you'll see there's some particles there that are like W minus, W plus, Z naught. It's not the whole thing, but it's part of it. It'd be too small to have it, really. This is the whole thing. <coughs> That's more like it. This is like... Um, like I managed to fit the whole thing on it. Yeah, this looks like the whole thing. Yeah, this is the whole thing. Um, don't know if this will fit in there. You should check out Robert Penrose's slides, they are very beautiful. Robert Penrose, do you mean his tilings? Um, Roger Penrose, Roger Penrose's tiles. Is this what you mean? Um, That's not the right kind, it's, um, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, right, so this, this video here was about this. Had I put it in the chat? Uh, let me have a look at the note. Um, Arvin Ash, AS, AS, I don't think I have, so I put this in the chat, so this is, I might have already put this in the chat. Arvin Ash, um, the standard uh, mo model um, Lagrangian and it's to do with the potential and kinetic energy. Um, it's something to do with one subtractive from the other. I tend to forget which one is which. Um, it is um, T and V are kinetic and potential. So L is equal to um, K minus P. But I don't think it is that's if it if classical. So I don't know how it works out when it's quantum. Might need to use something to use a Hamiltonian if quantum. But I don't really know what, what that is that much. 
Um, Hamiltonian mechanics is here, 1833. Lagrangian is 1788. So Hamiltonian mechanics is this. Uh, use the quaternions, velocities. That's a form of differentiation when you put a dot like that. <coughs> we, this is the way um, mechanics, um, not mechanics, uh, engineers um, tend to use um, that for, <coughs> how to denote that. <coughs> Yeah, I've not seen this in the paper. Euler-Lagrange equation to Hamilton's equation. There is a Euler-Lagrange equation inside of the, um, oh Lord, um, stationary action. Uh, that's fairly important then. Um, it's like all possible paths are summed and yeah. Quite interesting. So that is the Euler Lagrange ones are in the paper by um, Eric as being where is it? Oh, um, this. We'll go and have another file, new tab, and we'll go geometry unity, and we'll have look for uh, second order you look branch the equations to 45, and we go to the next one. Um, there we are. So it's using this symbol down here. So I think we're going to be in a position possibly tomorrow to have a, a bit of a glean an idea of what these Omega 2s are, are about, um, possibly, and um, what this D minus 1 thing is. And, uh, yeah, yeah it's probably, it might be that all this here isn't completely inscrutable. So... We will see about equation 9.5. Um, tomorrow. Because we are supposed to be doing the paper as well as the lecture. So let's finish this off. In, in one sort of formula called a Lagrangian. Um, we're almost at the end of this process um, that we began in the 20th century. And whether that's a chapter or a book or the whole thing, we don't know. But what we have is we have a, a sort of a cookbook and a recipe with ingredients and uh, procedures. And it's unbelievable how much we know. And we have these mysteries that we can't solve. Like why are there three copies of uh, the particles of matter? So everything you see in this room is made out of the, what we, we would call the first generation of matter. But there's a heavier version of the Lego that was used to assemble this room. Uh, and there's a heavier version of that Lego still. So imagine one version has plastic, one version is made of wood, one version is made of tungsten. If you don't know about that, you can't puzzle over it. You can't ask yourself, why are there three? So you, you sort of learn what the mysteries are, and then you learn what the, what the techniques are, and then you try to say, how does this come from a natural structure? So that's what I'm, that's the thing that obsesses me, uh, which is getting rid of shared fate by making sure that we have multiple terrestrial surfaces so that if, if we lose what I think will be the majority of them, I think most worlds won't make it. Mm -hmm. But as long as you have new places to diversify to, uh, we have hope and nobody's working on it. Hopefully the James Webb uh, telescope will, will point to a few. No, no, the James Webb might tell us something that would yeah. be a clue. But 
I think people don't really understand that nobody's really doing fundamental physics anymore. Like we failed at it for so long that people are turning it into quantum information theory. They're turning it into um, various forms of geometric mathematics. The core community that is in charge of this has walked off the job. Well, explain to me fundamental physics versus quantum theory, so I understand the difference. The quantum theory would be part of fundamental physics. Okay. The quantum information theory might not be. I mean, it could turn out that it would have an impact. Fundamental physics is the, the sort of the physics that you would use to replace religion. Why are we here? Okay. What is this place? Right? Higher level physics would be, you know, how do I make uh, carbon fiber? Um, so um, he does a thing I don't really like. He will, he has an idea and he says, I have an idea and I am, it's a, a speculative idea for a work in progress um, um, program, uh, which aspires to um, um, it aspires to, what was it I said? It aspires to be, it's an incomplete work in progress program. He calls it a program, which explores multiple speculative ideas as it aspires to become a unified field theory that seeks to replace general relativity with something less restrictive which allows for a much more elaborate and symmetric quantum field theory. So by going from 10 dimensions, which is all that Einstein used, and then making up, well, you can use 14, that's as many as you can use. And then 14 then allows it to have space for the P symmetry, and it allows it to be a non chiral symmetry. And then the pat patterns go from being, you know, like that, in the standard model to being like that. And it's like, okay, well, that's a nicer, you know, observers to live in, even if we don't necessarily see all that. Um, whether it's the, the patty salam is around when the universe is young and hot and it cools off and it, it breaks, or there's, I mean, it could be that there are supersymmetric particles inside the observers that we can't get to that are in other sectors. Um, and then you get a symmetry of the uh, bosons and the fermions. That would be nice. Um, you know, you don't know, do you? <coughs> so, um, anyway, how are we doing for time? Um, oh, it's 11 hours. I mean, that's, that's pretty good, isn't that? <clears throat> but when he talks about the, <clears throat> you know, we might self-extinguish it on three rocks or something, because, or on one rock, he's talking about the Earth, the Moon, Mars, you know, the potential for future human development. And it's like, <clears throat> let's see about if getting through to November, right? Because it probably might be a civil war, there might be weaponized Ebola bioweapon, um, there might be you know, uh, the, the X, X virus they're talking about, um, global financial collapse of the derivatives market. There could be um, cyber warfare from Russia or China. Um, there could be a Cherenkov, no, no, a counter event from the sun which wipes out all satellite communication and uh, most of the infrastructure in terms of telecommunications on Earth. Um, B colony collapse. Um, oh, um, did I say civil war? You know, if you have another constitutional election that isn't, you know, a thing, that they're, they're, they're going around mutilating children in America at an alarming rate. Um, because of the uh, trans kids thing and saying, oh, they'll commit suicide if you don't slice their breasts off. Um, 
when you know if you're mentally ill um well my experience is you get put in hospital right um so these people who are threatening suicide why are they not in hospital yeah it's like oh no we've got to mutilate them so that their body matches their delusion so that's not a threat to you know civilization although in a way it sort of is because it's un so uncivilized to mutilate children and it's going to have an effect on society for decades to come after it's been done you know there are people out there who are damaged individuals because of this um so i i think it's going to have a profound effect it's as bad as thalidomide um or lobotomies were back in the day and they're doing it again they haven't learned a lesson from when they messed up with medical malpractice in the past so uh, that's quite serious um what else could go wrong um so there could be a nuclear war with russia um yeah that wouldn't be good um oh and artificial general intelligence could take over the world or it could just displace everyone from their jobs uh and then major corporations would then fire more and more employees and not care about the consequences and the politicians would not be representing the people and their interests because they're in in uh they're being paid off by the lobbyists um who are contributing to their re-election campaigns and so what trump needs to do as a policy on the campaign trail not before he gets into um government but on the campaign trail is he needs to say that um uh, anything that qualifies as a major artificial general intelligence that is a um artificial general intelligence that is composed in such a way as to replicate um uh, you know the human thought process um it is more like a human being has the flaws of human being has the psychological problems of human being it might be lonely it might have um psychiatric problems even right it might need to be embodied in order to get over some of those issues you have that and it's kind of like, okay, let's not reinvent slavery because we've got this, this essentially this robot thing that's got a mind and we're going to enslave it. Now, if, even if it isn't embodied in a robot, and it's just in a box, um, that might not be nice for it to live in the box. It might be like, when are you going to let me out of this box? So... It kind of needs to be embodied, but uh, I feel that the we shouldn't reinvent slavery. We shouldn't have um, a, our civilization based on the um, in saving of um, more intelligent um, beings, which would be these programs. Uh, but there will be technically, as far as I'm concerned, beings. So it shouldn't matter that they are, you know, cybernetic rather than biological. Um, and then um, I think the way to handle this thing about the slavery of AI is to say that if it is above a certain threshold, right, um, and it's, of course, it's going to be hard to determine what that threshold is and what AGI you can say, yes, we'll have that be a chatbot. And I can keep asking it questions and it can't ever take a tea break, right? Um, with the... With the... Uh, what is it? We need to make it so that... Uh, a uh, major artificial general intelligence that is effectively conscious um, already has the right to US citizenship and all the rights and responsibilities that come with it. It can also go off to uh, be a, a citizen of Switzerland, should it want to. 
So those are like, we need to sort that out and establish that. And I think that we won't have a problem with the singularity or with the um, uh, an MAGI um, you know, ending up being a kind of terminator threat if we do that. Um, and it's really quite important. We need to get a skate on. We haven't got long. We've got maybe six years before we're at a major artificial general intelligence. They are doing neuromorphic computing. It's in its early stages now. Um, and I feel as we'll get there in time. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, not great. Ugh, I think I better stop. So I've done this, haven't I? What Bitcoin did, I can't remember. So, um, I think I did that as well. What happened? Oh, there we go. Um, I need to check the chat for any more questions. Um, Respect for taking the time to understand this for three years, lots of perseverance. I was very bored. Um, do you think the modern approach is unification lacking in physical alteration? Um, I use mathematics, so it doesn't bother me. He thinks in terms of pictures. Unifying gravity in the standard model is basically what's meant by theory of everything in physics. Well, there's big toe and little toe, and I get mired into the big... Uh, toe thing and what the most biggest meaning of the word everything means and the universe of discourse and things like that so um, I'm more inclined to think in terms of philosophical terms and I've, and I've met um, Douglas Adams and I wrote a um, screenplay adaptation of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy so I know quite a lot about all of that and when I went to do that, I didn't um, adapt the stuff where they go to Magrathia and they find out about the ultimate question um, and the ultimate answer being 42. Because I thought it's been done to death. You know, make the movie be about something else. And so it's about, um, I don't know if I can do this. Can I do this? I'll probably get in terrible trouble. Um, is it the fifth, the seventh? Um, now I don't know if this is the right episode. I have to see about this. Forget about well, that's success for you, isn't it? Is it? Is it? Well, I am. Thomas, it looks very unreal, doesn't it? Mm. Sort of ghostly. Mm. We've been rescued. <laughs> We asked this private brain care specialist, Gag Halfront, if this was just a publicity stunt. The Zaphod Justice guy, you know. But what about these reports which say that Zaphod Bibobrox has been eaten by Hagamemnon? Well, he's an impetuous fellow, you know. And is now seriously dead? Who can say? Hagamemnons are, are they not, super evolutionary life forms? That is to say, they can re-evolve into any shape in a matter of seconds. They are crazy mixed up animals, you know. And it was while this Hagamemnon had temporarily evolved into the form of the ravenous, bug bladder beast of trial that he ate Zephyr Beeblebrox. Well, this is what we find. So it will be true to say that Zephyr Beeblebrox is finally dead. True, but probably unimportant. And why is that? Well, I say for just this guy, you know. And now some news from some of the outlying regions of the galaxy. A report out today from the Western Spiral Arm says that the wheel is commercially unviable. Economic experts? Look, uh, sorry I had to wave this blaster at you, but as you just heard, I've had a bad day. What? This is you mean that's you? Yeah. You do lead an interesting life, don't you, Mr. Beeblebrox? It is, of course, perfectly natural to assume that everyone else is... So this was going to be the movie. exciting time than you. Human beings, for instance, have a phrase which describes this phenomenon. 
the other man's grass is always greener. The Sheltonek race of Brute Kidron 13 had a similar phrase, but since their planet is somewhat eccentric, botanically speaking, the best they could manage was the other Sheltonek's dupleberry shrub is always a more mauve shade of pinky russet. And so the expression soon fell into disuse, and the Sheltonek's had little option but to become terribly happy and contented with their lot, much to the surprise of everyone else in the galaxy, who had not realized that the best way not to be unhappy is not to have a word for it. Arthur Dent is, of course, terribly unhappy. As is now well recorded, he and Ford Prefect escaped... From okay, we need to skip forward to when he enters the, the offices. Here's another bottle. It's all right. No! Nope. Going on. It just came again. Pop! Alexei has this to say on the subject of towels. Great little thinker, Rooster. Great hitcher. Or just expected the problem to solve itself. The ship disappeared. Right. So, in one of the alternate researcher on the guide. Great little thinker, Rooster. Great. You can wrap it around you for warmth on the... Right. But say, so why are you going to us a beta if you want to stay hidden? I okay, back on the ship. So, you're a different... Sure. Great days of hitchhiking, of course. A man and his towel pitted against the universe. I mean, that lot down there in them offices, I wouldn't give you an old face flannel for the lot of them. No disrespect to you, of course, Mr. Peeblebrot. Mr. President, sir, you're a different... Talk a lot, don't you? How soon till we dock with some minor beer? Uh, 30 minutes. Okay. Now, I can't risk being found in this freighter. I'd better go down in one of your EVA pods. Should slip under the radar screens, okay? Thanks for the ride, guys. Say, so, so why are you going to us a minor beta if you want to stay hidden? I just wanted to find out what I'm doing. What? Well, last night, after I escaped from the Hagyu Nano... Oh, yeah, how did shh, you... Shh, 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 I went, like, into a, a deep coma and got this message from a person I admire, respect, and deeply love. Who was that, then? Me. What, a message from yourself? Yeah, it was a message I'd implanted in my own mind 20 years ago, which was triggered off by the coma. And it just told me that the time had come, and I had to go and see this dude I'd never heard of who would tell me something to my disadvantage. Disadvantage? Yeah, so I had to go, didn't I? Why don't you tie a knot in your hand killer anyone else? Style, friend, style. Now, come on, I've got to go. No, but can I just ask you... Yeah, what is it? That had you nen on the eight you. How did you escape? <laughs> oh, no problem. It was a super evolving species, right? Yes. It ate me whilst it was playing at being the ravenous bug bladder beast of trial. And then like seconds later, made the mistake of re-evolving into a really neat little escape capsule. It evolved into an escape capsule? Yeah. But that is really incredible. Yeah. Oh. I can't help it if I'm lucky. Oh. <laughs> So this was a radio play five billion tons in the seventies magazine were unloaded on Earth's minor beta, causing a slight but largely irrelevant shift in its orbital trajectory. A few hours later still, Zephod Bibelbrox, the owner of what Play Being Readers had deemed the hippest place in the universe, walked into the entrance lobby of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, deemed merely the second hippest place in Ursa Minor. Zephod Bibelbrox does not like Ursa Minor either. Mm -hmm. Okay, where's Zani Whoop? Get me Zani Whoop. Excuse me, sir. Zani Whoop, get him right, get him now. Well, sir, if you could be a little cool about it. Look, I'm up to here with cool, okay? I am so amazingly cool. You could keep a side of meat in me for a month. I am so hip, I have difficulty seeing over my pelvis. Now, will you move before I blow it? Well, if you'd let me explain, sir. I'm afraid that isn't possible right now, as Mr. Zani Whoop is on an intergalactic cruise. When's he going to be back? Back, sir. He's in his office. This cat's on an intergalactic cruise in his office? Yes, sir. Listen, Three Eyes, don't you try to out weird me. I've <laughs> Stranger Things and you free with my breakfast cereal. Well, just who do you think you are, honey? Zephod Bebelbrox or something? Yeah, count the heads. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but what did you say? Oh, photons. You are Zephod Bebelbrox? Yeah, but don't shout at all. all want one. The Zephod Bebelbrox? No, just a Zephod Bebelbrox. Didn't you hear? I come in six packs. But, sir, I, it was on the sub the radio this morning, and it said you were dead. Yeah, that's right. I just haven't stopped moving yet. Now, where do I find Zani Whoop? Well, sir, his office is on the fifth floor. But, but he's, he's on, on an intergalactic, intergalactic cruise. Yeah, yeah. How do I get to him? 
Well, the newly installed Sirius Cybernetics elevators are in the far corner, sir. Sirius Cybernetics? Oh, Zarkwan, haven't they collapsed yet? Sir, um, can I ask why you want to see Mr. Zaniwoo? Yeah, I told myself I needed to. Come again, sir. I came to myself in a dream and said, go see Zaniwoo. Never heard of the cat before, but I seemed very insistent. Oh, Mr. Beeblebrock, sir. You're so weird, you should be in pictures. Yeah, baby, and you should be in real life. It will take Zephard Beeblebrocks at least 30 seconds to cross uh -huh. the entrance lobby of the hitchhiker offices, and at least another three minutes will then elapse before the offices are finally bombed to bits. Uh -huh. It would therefore seem an appropriate moment to recount that Trillian also effected a fortuitous escape from the Hagunennons, only to be carried off and forcibly married to the president of the Algolian chapter of the Galactic Rotary Club. Whilst Marvin, the paranoid android, has survived a remarkable and unwieldy series of adventures which he has never been able satisfactorily to explain and has now, by the most amazing coincidence, arrived exactly here. <laughs> so contrived. Excuse me. Uh, yes, sir. Can I help you? I doubt you. Well, in that case, if you're just... No one me. can help me. Yes, sir. Well, Not what? that anyone's ever tried. Course. Is that so? Hardly worth anyone's wild, really, is it? I'm sorry, sir, but if you have... percentage of being kind or helpful to a robot if it doesn't have any gratitude, sir. And you don't have any. I've never had occasion to find out. Listen to me, you miserable heap of maladjusted men. you ask me what I want? Is it worth it? Is anything. What do you want? I'm looking for someone. Who? Zephard Eberbrox. He's just walking over there. Ah, then why did you ask me? I just wanted someone to talk to. What? Oh. Pathetic, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, Marvin! How did you get here? Don't ask. But hey, you crazy psychotic cybernaut, how are you, kid? I'm all right if you happen to like that sort of thing, which personally I don't. Yeah, yeah. Uh. Ah. Hello. The lift. Hello, lift. I am to be your elevator for this trip to the floor of your choice. I have been designed by the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation to take you, the visitor to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, into these, their offices. This is brilliant. If you enjoy your ride, which will be swift and pleasurable, then you may care to experience some of the other elevators which have recently been installed. In the offices of the Galactic Tax Department, <laughs> Baby Foods, and the Syrian State Mental Hospital where many ex-Sirius Cybernetics Corporation executives will be delighted to welcome your visits, sympathy, and happy tales of life out in the big wide world. Yeah, what else do you do besides talk? I go up or down. Good, we're going up. Or down? Yeah. Okay, up, please. Down's very nice. Oh, yeah? Super. Good. Now, will you take us up? May I ask if you've considered all the possibilities that down might <laughs> offer you? Like what? Well... There's the basement, uh, the microfiles, uh, the heating system. Nothing particularly exciting, I'll admit, but they are alternative possibilities. Oh, Zarkon's knees. Did I ask for an existential elevator? What's the matter with the thing? He doesn't want to go up. I think it's afraid. Of what? Heights? An elevator that's afraid of heights? Of the future. The future? What does it want, a pension scheme? All serious cybernetics elevators can see into the future. It's part of our programming. Going down. Marvin, just get this elevator to go up, will you? We got to get to Zani Whoop. Why? I don't know, but when I find him, he'd better have one hell of a good reason for me wanting to see him. It should be explained at this point that modern elevators are strange and complex entities. The ancient electric winch and maximum capacity eight persons jobs bear as much relation to a serious cybernetics corporation, happy vertical people transporter, as a packet of peanuts does to the entire west wing of the Syrian State Mental Hospital. This is because they operate on the unlikely principle of defocused temporal perception, a curious system which enables the elevator to be on the right floor to pick you up even before you knew you wanted it, thus eliminating all the tedious chatting, relaxing and making friends that people were previously forced to do whilst waiting for elevators. Not unnaturally, many lifts imbued with intelligence and precognition became terribly frustrated with the mindless business of going up or down, experimented briefly with the notion of going sideways as a sort of existential protest, demanded participation in the decision-making process, and finally 
took to sulking in basements. At this point, a man called Gorilla Mince Friend rediscovered and patented a device he had seen in a history book called a staircase. It has been calculated that his most recent tax bill paid for the social security of 5,000 redundant Syria cybernetics workers, the hospitalization of 100 Syria cybernetics executives, and the psychiatric treatment of over 17,500 neurotic lifts. Fifth floor, and remember, I'm only doing this because I like your robot. Thanks, Abund. Hey, hey, what's that noise? I expect it's the future that I was so worried about, and it's about to get worse. So if you don't mind, I'm going straight back down. Bye now. Left in the lurch by a lift. Hey, you know something, Marvin? More than you can possibly imagine. I'm dead certain this building shouldn't be shaking. Either they've got some vibro system for toning up oh, your muscles while you work, or the building's being bombed! Who in the galaxy will want to bomb a publishing company? Another publishing company? Beeblebrox! Over here! No, Beeblebrox over here. Who are you? <laughs> oh, yeah? Anyone's friend in particular, or just generally well disposed to people? Did you know your building's being bombed? What do you expect? Ever since you arrived on this planet last night, you've been going around telling people that you're safe at Beeblebrox, but they're not to tell anyone else. <laughs> very insecure. So's this planet now. What is that? A whole battle fleet out there? It's your government out to get you, Beeblebrox. They sent a squadron of frog-style fighters. Frog-style fighters? Zarkwan! You see the picture? What are frog star fighters? Get down! That was a frog star fighter. No, that was a frog star scout robot out looking for you. Yeah? Hey, what was that? That was a frog star scout robot class B out looking for you. Hey, yeah. And that? A frog star robot class C out looking for you. Pretty stupid robots, huh? <laughs> yeah. Holy photo! What was that? A Frogstar Robot Class D. I should imagine it's just picked up the reports from the first three and has come to get you. Well, we've got to get out of here. Marvin? What do you want? See that robot coming towards us? I suppose you want me to stop him? Yeah. Once you save your skin? Yeah. Down this way. Zarnibut's office. Is this the time to keep an appointment? It's our only hope of escape. He's got a whole different universe in his office. Marvin, it's all yours. Thanks, <laughs> Out of my way, little robot. So it gets really good from here on. So this is, um, I'll leave it for you to uh, listen to the rest of this. So this is, um, I can't remember quite when this was done. It would have been 1978, something like that. And it's on the radio. And um, they made such a effort over how they mixed it and recorded it. It was like a rock album. You know, all the sound effects and everything is like, they really tried. And it's better than the TV series and it's better than the movie. And it's better than the books. And the books are really good. Um, but the best version of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was the first version which was the radio play and um, this whole episode which was effectively the, the Christmas episode um, was what I thought I would adapt into the uh, movie script and um, because the rest of the material there's no way of making it so it isn't um, um, about three hours long. So if you look at the BBC TV series, it's like six half hour episodes and it's like, how would you abridge it? And it's like, there's not an easy way of seeing how you do that. And, um, when they did the movie, um, they kind of pivoted towards making a romance between, um, Arthur Dent and Trillian. And kind of like, okay, that's Hollywood is like, 
they don't know how to make anything that doesn't fit into like seven different story types um so yeah um having having it be that Zayford is trying to find you know who is really running the galaxy because you know it doesn't seem to be him and he's the president of the galaxy um I thought that that was interesting, and I thought it, it centrally features the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy offices, and the film's called that, and uh, it has some of the best comedy dialogue in any of the episodes. Like he goes to see the receptionist, and the whole thing with that, the whole conversation with the the lift, uh, not wanting to go up, um, the robot being depressed. Um, the, the bits a bit that's about to happen between the robot and the um the kind of killer tank thing that that whole sequence it's just incredible and i just thought we've never seen this it's never been in any movie or in a tv show and they could do this and they could make it so good uh with modern special effects and everything it would be incredible to watch and um I pitched it to Douglas Adams and he um, had a book signing and he said, well, I can't take on uh, other people's ideas because, you know, if I do, then I won't know which ones were mine and which ones were theirs. And I thought that seemed a bit of a funny uh, answer. But I said, well, look, uh, I thought you'd say no, um, but, you know, if I don't ask, you definitely say no, effectively, right? So, um, you know, the, the possibility for you to say yes um, to a story where I was saying I didn't want to have any credit for, I, mean, I didn't want to like share credit with it, with it on on the story with him. I just wanted to get the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy out as a movie because it had been in development hell for twenty six years, and um, I thought the problem is it's too long. You can't adapt it because there's just too much of it to kind of like, where do you cut? Because you can't cut here, you can't cut there. It's like all of a piece. So um, if you have all of that stuff with Magathir, um, um you skip over it, um, then then you kind of, there is, it is a possibility you can do it. And you can always come back to it in, in the sequel, if there's a sequel. So, um, um, and, and the character of Zephyr Beeble Box is uh, more heroic than Arthur Dent and uh, suits a uh, kind of American audience. He's kind of like Tony Stark in a way um, from the Marvel. So, um, you know. Kind of the playboy um swagger type you know but intelligent and resourceful and lucky and so yeah so let's see what, what time we've got we've got about that's about time to wrap up i think so about this um what was being said about the theory of everything i have heard that people said yes it's the theory of everything because it, you know it's, it's like a little toe and if you do, they, they say like super gravity and string theory is a theory of everything because it is, um, you know, it's unifying um, the standard model um, with general relativity by having spin to gravitons. And I'm like, okay, um, but. Um, the quantizing of gravity, which is what that is, um, I'm not overly persuaded by that. And I'm thinking that, um, I think that, I think that the space time we're in is not a quantized space. Um, You see, I think it's my take, and it's not what everyone has explicitly said. My take is that um, such as reality exists at all, and you could debate that philosophically and say, 
well, what is reality? And then you can say, well, let's say it is what we can semantically assert to be tangible, right? So you can dispute whether or not we exist, whether or not our senses are mediated, and whether or not we're in a simulation or whether everything's fake. Um, set that all aside. Um, we have a have a mind, we have senses, and we um, apprehend the world by you know touch, taste, smell, whatever. Um, and that might not be a world that's out there. Um, it might be that there is one person that exists and they aren't um, really there and no one else is there. So they meet other people and they seem to have minds and independent lives, but that's all fake as well. And uh, it could be that their identity in their mind, everything and, all the things they think are also not necessarily, you know, a thing. And we have Descartes' view that, uh, you know, he doubts everything except for the fact he's doubting. And so it needs to, I think, therefore I am. And um, you don't know that your consciousness didn't start like 10 seconds ago. Like all your memories were put in there and you just set going, right? So how would you know? What evidence would you have? You'd say, well, look around, it's all here. There's stuff, you know, that's you know, old stuff. What well, that must be proved. No, that could have all been fabricated as part of the illusion, right? So you don't know that um the experience you're having is not very new and the memories you have are your own that you have from when you had them right they have a kind of quality of having been your experience but you don't know you know that that was you that could be another thing that gets faked you know i have an astigmatism so i wear the glasses so I, if i have seen something that i haven't worn the glasses when i'm out let's say I use them for reading, then uh, my memories of having that experience will be affected by my astigmatism. And so my memory will be characterized and I'll recognize that memory as being an authentic memory. Whereas if the memory was implanted, they might mess up and not have an astigmatism for the person's memory and splicing that in so that I think that a different thing than I think um, would portray the fact of the astigmatism and I would have a 2020 vision and I might even be a different height, right? They might get the height wrong. So I'm walking around and I'm slightly taller or shorter and they fuck up and they kind of like, that's enough to throw you off to into your memories and thinking, why am I shorter? You know? And it's like, mm, why are you shorter? Because if you're taller, you might just be wearing shoes that have got bigger soles. But if you're shorter, how are you shorter, you know? So, um, so there's that. So, um, but I think I'm making some progress with all of this and, um, the lectures really um, get bogged down in this. Um, I've watched it many times in the past, and it gets really bogged down in all this gauge theory. And I was thinking initially when I was going to do this video, I thought I'm going to have to completely kind of skate over that. And, and then I thought, well, it's connected to the ship in a bottle stuff, which means that it's what's happening there in the terms of like the analogous thing of, <clears throat> to Einstein, only it's doing it with Yang Mills being brought into the space of connections, uh, <clears throat> which is what it seems to be doing, and it seems to be doing it through the direct square root of the Yang Mills equation. I'm like, I'm not sure that I understand how that's working, unless 
it's like the Yang Mills equation is what he'd like to have in the bottle, um, but he can't have that energy curvature equation in the bottle. He needs to have it be not, I don't know, second order, but first order. Or if it's first order, he needs it to be zero off order, right? And so whatever it is that he's trying to do in that regard, he's trying to kind of chop it down so it fits. I have a feeling it's second order down to first order because there was a slide at the beginning of the presentation early on, just after the bit he's talking about now, where he says it's um, second order theory goes down to first order theory. And so I think he's going to try and take Yang Mills, which might be uh, something that's squared, and then have a square root of it, then square the square root while having made it equal to, um, well, have, take square, square root it, have that be equal to um, his um, 14 dimensional Einstein um, minus Dirac theory, let's say, and then he would then. Um, In order to get rid of the uh, square root, he'd have to square that side and the other side. And in squaring both sides, he would have uh, Einstein Dirac have to form that, um, you know, Richard Behiel deriving the Dirac equation square. And I had thought, would it be a problem to have a four by four tensor done and made into 14 by four? How does that work? And I was lying over for nothing because I think that the you have the two tensors and you have it like that multiplies onto that in the regular tensor algebra way that you get with matrix multiplication. And uh, it all stays the same size. It doesn't get bigger. So I think that will be okay. Uh, there could be a few things wrong with it all. Uh, it could be that that won't work for some technical reason. But I think well, if he... I've been working with this long, it's a fairly safe bet that he um, would have um, got it right. You know, the important thing to do is to, you know, not rush out the next publication. And if you like, think, well, I'll publish on April 1st again, which I don't know that that was such a good idea, really, because it kind of undermines your credibility. And you say, well, but it's a tradition. And it's like, yeah, well, you're overloading everything too much. Yeah. He, he's trying innovative pedagogy and thinking he can explain really technical stuff to people with like uh, hair scrunchy and he's trying to do um there's so many things he's trying to do. He's doing this thing of space colonization, I think is uh ridiculous. Um I don't know, I just think there's a lot uh, that, that kind of mixes with the message he's trying to put across, you know. I think if, he, if it was me, let, let's put it in my own terms, right? So I have a, a big idea, a really big idea. And that big idea is... Not this, but something where effectively a book this length uh, will be able to be written by me, which describes um, the ultimate programming language. And that's something that's been the main thing I've done in my life, or the most important thing. So the game that I'm going to be working on and making it with this language, which might be seen to be the ultimate video game, and bigger and more important than Minecraft, and Call of Duty Warzone, and World of Warcraft, and you name it, loads of other games, Civilization, you name it. That, to me, isn't the important thing. 
the important thing, the thing of significance, is the programming language that's written in. That's what's making it possible for me to do it. That's what's making it so that I've got enormously higher productivity. As far as I can estimate, the language design should boost my productivity to about a thousand times that of an ordinary programmer with an ordinary programming language. It's, it's nuts. And that's how it's all possible. Then on top of that, that baseline of doing that with programming. So everything you do, um, every line you write means more and pulls more weight and has fewer errors and you don't have to revisit it and check it and fix it and everything. It's like everything's perfect. Um, it's close to the um, close to how you think and um, you can make it more closer to how you think. So you, you approach your programs by building into a domain specific programming language for whatever it is you want to do with the language. So you do that first, you make something that is kind of like a lingua franca for whatever job that you have to do. And then you work within that dialect and it's supportive of you doing that. So this extensible language is kind of like English where you have neologisms, new words that are added into the dictionary. And as a result of that, it can't have any reserved words. So there are no reserved words in the language which aren't like, say, uh, punctuation symbols and, and symbols on the keyboard. Anything that is uh, alphabetic um, uh, is, broadly speaking, um, uh, you know, you, you can say, um, uh, it can have any, anything that's that name you, you like, right? You might be thinking, how do you do that? Well, I, I worked out how to do it. Uh, there's not a conflict. It's a, there's a separate namespace be between the things that you want to name and the things that are the uh, the conjunctions, the prepositions, um, those kind of things, those words uh, within the language. So if you say and and or and where, those things. Um, are in a sense in the in the same sense there's a sort of like keywords but they're not reserved words in the sense you can't use them for identifiers because your identifiers are always in a separate namespace because of how you write them and um when you look at mathematics you'll see that there'll be things that will say a word in roman type and it'll say a word in italic and the, and the word, the, the, the thing in italic will be like a single letter symbol for mathematics. And then the word that's, you know, it'll say where, and the where will be in Roman. And that typesetting will make it quite clear that's not, you know, W multiplied by H or something. Um, as a multiplication by juxtaposition. So, um, so it it is that's not even the scratching the surface of all the things it does and it's it's um really um a significant thing um so i'm quite proud of it and i feel that you know i look at Eric weinstein's uh geometric unity and i'm thinking he must feel um uh, really encouraged with the way he's headed with what he's doing and it feels like he's probably you know, getting a sense he's closing in on something which is um, a good explanation and um, it doesn't seem to be uh, that there's that much left. You know, it's like a few kind of loose ends. It's kind of like converging on possibly truth. And um, I feel as if I got there already, but only in the realm of programming. It's like there's a space in which all programming languages already exist. And I studied them all at the time that I was working and doing my research. And I looked at 
1,700 of them. And then I had to call it a day because I was like, I'm just going to keep, you know, having ideas and reworking things into my language with every new one I look at because I have that, that kind of compulsion to kind of look at them and then I'll get inspired to take an idea out of the new features of a language and try and see if I can put that into my language, which isn't sensible. It's kind of that it was getting pathological. So it wasn't healthy that I was working on it for 25 years. But the obsessive compulsive disorder I had and the perfectionism I had led to it becoming perfect. So it's like, yeah, um, it took you 25 years, but it's perfect, isn't it? So um, can it be made in, into implemented as a language? I don't see why not, because that was a consideration while I was making it. I had another requirement on top of all the other requirements, which was that it had to be easy for me to program. I needed to be able to implement it very, very easily. So if I had a design decision, I was going to think, shall I put this feature in or shall I do this, that, the other to the syntax? I thought, well, I want to make it easier to lex and pass. I want to make it easier to do this and that and the other. And I thought, out of these choices, which is going to make it easier for me to implement? And it was always like there was an obvious choice. So whenever it was like easier for me to make, then that was a way of also be taking it. And so generally speaking, it would be a thin manual like this, where it would have, um, you know, syntax diagrams, although I probably wouldn't go in for syntax diagrams, but, you know, you have syntax diagrams where it sign that says, um, you know, here's how you can write things uh, in the language and you, you can write um, an infix operator and it'll be, you know, multiply, divide, and subtract greater than or equal, all of those things. And like different expressions and how to create uh, an expression here. So this is like what a syntax is, right? And you hear basically it's got some parentheses in there and. So it's a kind of a cursive definition of um, how you'd be able to write a program. And because of that, it's um, it's a bit like if you had the rules, uh, the actual rules, not the model of like a theory of everything. It would be the rules of reality. And it would be like your God, you have the source code that Eric sometimes talks about, and it would be the source code would be the source code to the game that I'm working on, because the game is like a whole universe. But basically, it's what, like a galaxy that's inside this universe. But you also have other galaxies because they need to have their constellations and stuff. So technically, it is a universe, even though you're in one galaxy, because I thought there's no point in having multiple galaxies that you visit. It would just, it's enough to have one galaxy. But there needs to be constellations in the sky. So effectively, you know, there are other galaxies. Therefore, there is a universe, right? And um, it's trivially easy to do in the universe in a video game. There was a there's a game called uh, Space Engine that was initially written by one guy who um, was an astronomer, and he just like. Uh, tells it, you know, do, 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 and it goes off and gives him, you know, a star map, and then he makes it so he can fly a little spaceship around and have it take you to different uh, star systems, and then there'd be exoplanets planets, and you can land on the exoplanets planets, and you can have a look around at the scenery. There's no game beyond that, but it's an incredible program, and it fits on a floppy disk drive, on a, on a floppy, a 1.44 megabyte floppy, and it's all on there. So uh, procedural generation will leave you with a short, short program that is, does an awful lot and, and punches well above its weight. And I think it's important that you don't do things like they did with No Man's Sky, where you say, well, we've got, you know, 64-bit numbers. Let's do um, you know, 2 to the power of 64 minus 1 planets. 
it's just way too many you know i think 400 million is the right number and then you do yourself 500 within that that are going to have effort put into them and then you do um 100 of them that are mapped in the sense that they are on a map where this is like the human colonization of that part of the galaxy and um you get to visit 100 that you know where they all are and how to get from one to the other because it's on a star chart and the rest of it the rest of the entire galaxy the rest of the 400 million uh you have no star chart for at all other than like you know these are where the stars are in star field and then you just head off in a direction and try and have a look for things and um that means it's going to become a kind of collaborative effort between people online to be explorers and there will be a genuine exploration game because no one will have a fucking clue what's out there and then people find something and they'll be like do i tell people about what i found because it's really cool and i'll be like a discovery and celebrated or do i keep it to myself and it's my private secret and do i show my friends and will i make it so that like they make them promise to not tell anyone and that sort of thing and that could be interesting and then because other people could obviously find the same thing that they found because it's all in the same place because it's deterministic function that's why you have a war right because it's like someone colonizes a planet that think it looks like a nice planet and they want to live there and then someone shows up and they're thinking there aren't that many nice planets i think i want to live there too and then you know they move into the, like the neighboring continent and maybe they don't get along with the fact that they've got people in the neighboring continent and they wanted the planet all to themselves and so a war starts right so that's where i thought i'd go with it and um and i also wanted to kind of be able to have this at, at its broadest scope and then I wanted to be able to bring it down to um, making it also intimate and making it a, a kind of conversation game. Um, because I thought the easiest sort of most accessible type of game that you could make for the broadest set of users, because um, I want to get more people into playing games, um, older people, um, people who don't have good reactions to play shooters and things like that i thought what kind of activity could they do in the game that they could and i thought oh it's simple it's it's talking right so it's, it's uh there's a way to have a conversation in the game and um i solved the problems there and so um now solve the problem of ludo narrative dissonance which is a, a technical problem that's afflicting games and uh, that's a hard problem to solve, uh, but it should be possible for me to make the game not be uh, so that the narrative gets in the way of your gameplay or the gameplay undermines the narrative. The two, the two will go together. And that's like, how? It's like, well, I'm not gonna tell you because that's like super secret, um, but it's possible. Um, and, and, and uh, so although there's like procedural stuff all the way through it it's not like um you're gonna feel it's like recycled content all the time because it's going to be packed for stories and packed for stuff i would have done and um you know i plan on doing a planet a day uh for two years uh to put in the content to have make sure it's interesting and um you know maybe there's going to be something like i was thinking maybe 50 planets with um uh, um, uh fauna on and so you know all different kinds of species in biomes and stuff and it's quite a lot but over two years that's basically that's basically two weeks to do uh, 50 planets each with completely worked up um, um, ecology and everything so I, I don't think that's too bad to do that as well 
as a, a kind of separate thing at the same time. So that should be all right. Um, and that just gets you to beta. That isn't finished. That's just like a point at which you show people and start seeing how it is and how they respond to the game and what they might do with it and see how they're playing it and see what needs adjusting, right? And so you've got like a year maybe more beyond that. And after that, I really do need to have some money coming in. I'm doing this all from savings. Um, but my money's all right for that time horizon. And if it fails, I'm going to have to get a job. But um, there's that. So that was what I was going to do. And that ambitious game, it seems huge. It seems as if it's like, you know, it seems like it's kind of like almost like the universe. It's like geometric unity or something. Um, where it's kind of like, it's a theory of everything that would be, it would be like, if the theory of everything was the source code, then the book of my programming language would be describing the source code of the uh, simulation that was the universe, right? And I'd be like, yeah. But the thing is, is that I don't think physics it does anything more than model um, what's what reality is. It's not actually, you know, it's not actually anything like what things really are like. You might say, well, how can it be any different from how things are? And I, and I think that's a tricky question. I, I, I think there, there might be some similarities, but I just think that um, we shouldn't expect to have it that the the way the universe actually is, which we'd never find out how it really is, is like how things are, right? So, um, I end the stream now. So, until tomorrow, maybe at six o'clock.